So now it's time to start a discussion about arrays. But first, let's create a new project. I'm going to call it arrays. For the language, select Kotlin. For the build system, IntelliJ. Make sure to have the JDK selected and uh, check this little box, add sample code to have the main function auto generated for us. And click on create. All right, now let's delete the code inside the curly braces of the main function. Let's hide the project pane and let's start our discussion about arrays. And uh, so far in our videos, we've only looked at how we can store only one single value in a variable. And that is very useful, but uh, what if you have uh, a large amount of uh, values that you want to store in our variables? Let's say that you want to store 30 or 40 different uh, values in our uh, variable of a certain type. Of course, that you can uh, declare a variable for each of uh, one of those uh, v values then, and then assign it to the variables. But what happens if you have uh, 1,000 or 10, 20,000 uh, values? In that case, uh, it will not be practically possible to write each one of those variables and then assign a value to it. And uh, Kotlin help us here because it provides us arrays. And an array allows us to store more than one single element in a variable name. So it allows us to store more, more elements in one single uh, variable name. Now, to declare an array, we type val. Here we type names. Next, we need to provide a type. And the type is going to be an array. And uh, uh, IntelliJ has given us some suggestions there. So press enter to fill in uh, that for you. And now we put angle brackets. And inside the angle brackets, we're going to put what kind of data this array is going to store. So it's going to store string or uh, text or sequence of characters. Then you put equals. And here we don't uh, type a literal value. Here we have a here we type a function call. And here we type array of. And now we, we put our elements inside the the, the, the parentheses uh, of the function call separated by comma. So I'm going to put three names here. So I'm going to put John, Stephen, and Megan. Now, let's uh, let's see what we have here. So first we have the val keyword. Next we have a name for our variable and the name is names. Then we have the type and the type is an array which uh, means that we can store multiple values in our uh, variable. And next we have angle brackets and string. And this means that this array is going to store text or uh, sequence of characters. It's going to store only strings. And then we put equals. We have the function called array of. And then we put our elements of type string, which is uh, those names, separated by comma. But because uh, Kotlin has type inference, here we can delete the type. And the type is going to be inferred in the same way it was it was inferred the previously when you when you just declare a simple variable. So now the type is still inferred as an array of strings. And uh, now is a good uh, moment to introduce type hints. But uh, we need to activate the type hints from uh, settings. And to do that, you can go to File and click on Settings, or you can pr press the the shortcut that we have here for our. Uh, particular system and uh, for Windows is Control Alt S. So I'm going to press Control Alt S. And here we go to if you have something like this, you go to editor, you click on this greater arrow in front of editor. And then you go down here where it says where it says inline hints, click on, on this greater arrow in front of inline hints and from um, those options select Kotlin. And here you go to types and select select local variable types then click apply and ok now what we have here uh, on the right of our uh, variable name is a hint so it's not real text this is just there to remind us what kind of type this variable ha has and in our case is an array of string and uh, my suggestion for you is to keep those things activated because in this way you'll always see what uh, type a variable is without explicitly declaring the type. So this is not uh, this is just, this is just uh, there to help us to remind us what kind of type a variable is. Now let's say that I want to output a certain element in the array in the console. F to do that, we cannot just type here println and pass names because we need more to be more specific than that, we cannot pass the array here. 
um, and to get a specific element in the array you need to know that the elements in the array are stored at indexes and uh, the index of an array always starts at zero so the first element is stored at the index zero and to get the first element we type, we type here square brackets and we put zero and that if you press control if you press shift control p on it it's a string because that is going to return us the first value in the array which is uh, john so if you run this code we get john but let's put some text here to make it more clear that this is the first element so let's type first element now let's choose the dollar sign because this now is a placeholder and let's put the curly braces around our uh, our element and the quotation mark here now if you run this code you get first element john let's put here some so you get the first element john because uh, john is stored at the index zero and uh, in the same way john is stored at the index zero steven is stored at the index one and megan is stored at the index two so uh, our index starts at zero the index of an array always starts at zero and uh, you can replace a specific in, in uh, element in the array also using the uh, index operator so you can type here names again square brackets zero equals so now i'm gonna assign a new value to our element stored at index zero which is now put here the value Alex. So now, if you run this code, now we get first element Alex because John was John, which is at index zero, was replaced with the value Alex. So now we have Alex, Stephen, and Megan. But what you can't do is you cannot get an uh, element at an, ind at an index that doesn't exist. So we cannot get here let's say uh, an element at the index 4 because if you run this look what happens we get an error which says array index out of bound exception index 4 out of bounds bounds for length 3 that is because the index 4 doesn't exist and uh, here we try to access that value and that value and that value and that index doesn't exist and this is called the runtime error because this error is uh, is uh, called only one while our app is uh, still running so you don't have here uh, an error like we have for a, here you don't have a compile uh, error which you saw in uh, our previous videos that is because uh, the size of uh, an array is not uh, known until at compile time also it's very important to know here that the size of an array is fixed so this will always have uh, the, the size 3 and uh, the only way to add new elements to it is to put the elements directly here but there is not uh, another way to let's say that I want I, I can put another element in the array uh, down here we can only replace elements and then in the next videos you're gonna see that there are other arrays which um, are more flexible in the sense that they can grow and shrink we can add uh, or uh, remove elements from uh, uh, those arrays but for now uh, we're gonna look just at, at the at this array so let's change this back to zero to don't have that error and um, to avoid this kind of errors you can uh, check to see what is the size of the array in other words to see what is the number of elements stored in array using the size variable so let's do that so i'm going to add the println statement below of our first one so i'm going to type here println and here i'm going to put the text the size of the array is and here i'm going to put the dollar sign curly braces now i'm going to use our names array and here we're going to put dot size and this is going to give us the size of the array or or is going to give us the in other words the number of, of elements which are stored in this uh, particular array so if you run this code 
you're gonna see first output, the first element is Alex, and then you're gonna see the size of the array is three. So we get first element Alex, and the size of the array is three. And this is very important to note that the size of the array is always one times greater than the last index in the array. So we have uh, an, ar an array which starts as index zero and uh, en ends at index two, which uh, has a size of three. So it's very important to remember this to avoid the uh, crashes in your uh, programming. And of course that you can put other data types in our array. So I can declare another array here, also val called numbers. And we can use the array of again. And here I can pass some numbers. And now you see the type is an array of int or an array of integers of, or whole numbers. And you can also mix types here. So you can put here numbers and strings. So now we have an array and this which is between our angle brackets. You don't know, you don't need to understand this for now, but this allows us to have array of two types, respectively of type int and of type string. And you can pull also a char here if you want. Let's say A. So you can create an array of any type if you want. So this allows us to to put, uh, to mix uh, our types in, uh, in the array. And uh, because we've looked at loops and how we can use loops, you can use loops to loop to this array. So I can put here, let's say that I want to use the first uh, array. So I can put here for name in names. Now I'm gonna refer our array of uh, strings. Then print, print, uh, and the name. So now you see that we have this type hint for our uh, name variable that we have here. Of course, this can have whatever name you want. Now, if you run this, you're gonna see our uh, three names outputted down here in the console. So now we have Alex, Stephen, Stephen, and Megan, because uh, now we're we're using the for loop to loop through our uh, array names. And uh, this is interesting, but what if you want to loop through our uh, array numbers, which is uh, a mixed array. We have numbers and uh, strings and chars. We can refer it here. Let's call it uh, i in And now you see the type uh, that was inferred for the i is this comparable that we have here. So this is gonna loop through our mixed array. So we put here i. Now if you run this, you're gonna see our uh, numbers and then our name one and our char output down here. So now we get first element Alex, which is a print line statement. Then the next print line statement, the size of the array. Then we have our uh, numbers in our uh, numbers array. And then we have our name one and our, uh, and then we have our char. So this allows us to, to loop through our mixed arrays. But what if I want to, to output only if uh, I want to output in the console only the integers uh, in this mixed array called numbers. To do, to do that, and this is uh, uh, good good uh, way to introduce the is keyword and with the is keyword we can check to see if uh, a literal or a variable is of a certain type so I can put here if I is let's say an int then and only then we're gonna output its value in the console then I'm gonna call our println and we're gonna pass our, pass our i variable to our println uh, function. Now, if you run this, you gonna, you gonna see in our uh, loop only the numbers here, only the integers, because this is keyword is checking to see if our i is of type integer, and this is gonna return 
true or false. In our case, it's going to return true for, our, uh, for all of our numbers that we have here. So we have 4, 5, 6, 7 and 4 again. And you can check to see if this is uh, a char. And I'm going to see in the console only our uh, single element A. I'll put it down here. So we have A. Or you can check to see if this is a string. This uh, element that we're looping at this particular iteration, let's say. So if you run this, you're going to see in the console only name one because only name one is of type string. So you get name one. So this is very important to know that with the is keyword, you can check to see if a variable or a literal is of a certain type or if it's not. And based on that, to to do, to do some uh, to, to, to execute some uh, code. In our case, you output that value in the console if that condition is true. So this is how you can use the is keyword and the for loop to, to the for loop to loop through our uh, array and uh, the is keyword to check to see if uh, an element in uh, our array is of a certain uh, type or if it's not. And uh, let's change our uh, array numbers to a different name because numbers is very specific. It implies that we only have numbers in this array. But uh, we, we have a mixed type, so we have multiple types in uh, our array, we don't have only numbers. And to do that, instead of changing uh, our uh, numbers array in everywhere in our code where you're using the, this variable, we can right click on it, go to refactor and uh, click on rename. Or we can click uh, Shift F6. Now, if I change the name of uh, our array numbers, it will be changed everywhere where you call this uh, variable. So look, if I delete now the name, the name is also changed in our uh, line of code uh, 9 we're using in the loop. So now if I change this to, let's call it uh, mixed elements. If I press enter, now this will be also changed uh, everywhere where we call our uh, our uh, variable, respectively, on the line nine here. So now we have our uh, our uh, array numbers changed to mixed elements, which is more uh, descriptive because it implies that we have an array of uh, mixed elements. So now it's time to do a challenge using the knowledge that we have about arrays. But first of all, I'm going to delete the code inside the curly brace of the main function because um, I have the previous project opened. Now, the challenge is to create a function which is going to take as an argument an array of integers. Then you need to figure out a way to determine which number is the biggest number in that uh, array. Then you need to return uh, that number to, uh, to the function. And you need to create another function which is going to uh, do the same thing, but is going to figure out what is the minimum uh, number stored in that array and then it's going to return that value. And third, you need to find a way to combine those two functions in just one function which is going to return the maximum value stored in that array if you want, or if you don't want it will uh, uh, return the minimum value. So try to solve this challenge and then uh, watch my solution. Now, let's uh, solve this challenge. So first I'm going to create a function which is going to be called uh, find max. This function is going to return the maximum value. And it's going to take as a, I'm, and I'm going to define here a parameter and a, an array. So here I'm going to type a name for our array. It's going to be called numbers. And it's going to have the type array of int of integers and it's going to return an integer. Now here I'm going to declare a variable, it's going to be a var and it's going to be called max. And in this max variable I'm going to store the first value in the uh, which is uh, which is passed, which is in the, which is in the array. So I'm going to type here numbers, square brackets, and I'm going to use the index zero to get the first value in the array. Then I'm going to loop through this array. So 
for number in numbers then here we're going to check to see if our uh, number is greater than our first value which was stored in the array our max value and if that is true then we're gonna store this value which is now greater than our than uh, our maximum value in our uh, max variable so here i'm gonna put max now it's gonna be equal to this number which is found to be greater than our previous uh, max value and at the end of this loop we're gonna return the maximum value and uh, we're going to do the same for uh, find them the minimum value. So I'm going to copy this code. And this is going to be called find min. But uh, here we're going to change a little bit the logic. Let's call this variable min. And here we're going to change the condition to less than min. Now, let's call those function in our main function and uh, let's pass some arrays to see how uh, it works. So, First, I'm going to declare a variable. It's going to be a val, and it's going to be called max. And uh, now I'm going to call our find max function, and here I'm going to pass an array. And I'm going to I'm going to pass the array directly here. So I'm going to type array of, and I'm going to pass some arbitrary numbers like then I'm going to declare another val. This is going to be called min. Now I'm going to call find min and here I'm going to also call our array of function and here I'm going to define some uh, arbitrary numbers again. Now I'm going to output those values in the console. So I'm going to add println here. I'm going to type max value is dollar sign and I'm going to refer our max variable defined above. Another println. Now if you run this code. get max value 7 which is correct this is the biggest uh, number and then we get minimum value is 4 and this is also correct so our uh, code works uh, perfectly well now the next thing is to combine those two functions that we have here let's decrease this now you need to find a way to combine those function in one single function which is gonna also return the maximum and minimum value but only if I want to return uh, to be returned, uh, so I can determine uh, if I want the minimum value to be returned by that function, or uh, if I want uh, the maximum value to be returned by that function. So I need to find a way to combine those two. And to do that, I'm gonna delete our uh, second function. I'm gonna delete the code inside the this function and I'm going to change the name of this function to find min and max and now here I'm going to define a parameter which is going to be a boolean uh, which is going to have a boolean type so I'm going to call it I'm going to call it search max and it's going to be A boolean. Alright? Now, 
based on that boolean value if is true if i want to search the maximum value here i'm gonna type an if statement so i'm gonna put if search max then i'm gonna add here the code to search for the maximum value but the first let's define a, a variable here it's gonna be also var and it's be called uh, gonna be called max and uh, it's also gonna have the first uh, value in the array which is as the in the zero now if our search marks is true then we want our uh, maximum value to be search and return so i'm gonna add here to the code to to do that so i'm gonna type here a for loop which is gonna go through our uh, numbers array and here i'm gonna add uh, the if statement which i'm gonna check to see if our number is greater than our max then gonna assign our uh, our uh, number to our max now i'm gonna go down here and, and uh, here i'm gonna add the else part so if this uh, argument which is passed to our parameter such max is false so i don't want to search for the maximum value then that means that i want to search for the minimum value so i'm gonna put here else now I'm going to add the code to search for the minimum value. And uh, for this, we need to define also a variable here. It's going to be called mean. And it's going to have the value of max. I'm going to explain in a minute uh, how this works. Now, here we're going to, going to also loop in our uh, numbers, through our numbers array. And here we're going to check if essentially we have the same code that we have in our find uh, mean uh, function so here we're going to search if our number is less than our mean then we're going to assign our number to our mean also we need to return this value at the end of our uh, loop so here we need to return max and here we need to return mean now let's press ctrl alt l to format the code now let's delete the those the code that we have here let's delete also this code now here now I'm gonna put uh, our uh, find min and max function dire directly in the println statement. So I'm gonna type here uh, or uh, or to put in a variable first. So let's put in a variable first. So I'm gonna define a variable. It's gonna be also a ma it's gonna be also max. And here I'm gonna type find min and max. Now here we need to pass an array first. So I need to pass we need to call our array of we need to define some uh, numbers here let's say uh, 20 40 50 now we need to pass an argument to our parameter search max which is going to be either true or false so first i'm going to pass true here now if we print uh, this value if you output this value in the console let's say that we type here uh, the max equals to dollar sign i'm going to refer our variable now if you run this code we'll get the maximum value is 100 which is correct now let's duplicate this code that we have here and let's try it for the minimum value let's call it mean and let's add the println uh, statement down here let's type the mean value is dollar sign mean 
Now if you run this code, let's pass here false. Let's run this code again. Now we get the maximum value is 100, which is correct. And the uh, minimum value is 20. And uh, we did this with uh, our find the min and max function by combining uh, our uh, two previous functions. And uh, our code uh, until now works uh, okay. Now it's time to have a discussion about how this uh, code, uh, how this code, uh, how this solution to my challenge works. So now let's see how our uh, logic inside our find min and max function works. So first we declare our function find the min and max. Then we declare two parameters, which is one is numbers and is of type array of integers. So here we're going to pass only an array of integers. And the second parameter is called search max and is a boolean. So we can pass here only true or false. Then we're going to say to the, then we say here that this function is going to return a value. Next on the line nine, we declare a variable which is called max and we assign using the index operator the first uh, element in the array in our max. So in this case we assign 20 in our max variable and then we declare another variable called min and we assign our max in our min. But our uh, max has the value of 20 because we assigned it here. So this variable min is also is also also having the value 20. So both has, have the have the value 20 at the start. Then we check to see if our search max parameter is true or false. And if it's true, then we're going to ex execute the if part. And the if part works in uh, the following way. First, we loop using the for loop through our uh, numbers array. Then we check at each iteration if our number let's say if 20 is greater than our max so if 20 is greater than 20 which is going to be false so the code inside the curly brace of the if is not going to be executed then we go for the next iteration so here now we're going to see we're going to check to see if our number respectively 40 is greater than our max which is 20 and this is going to be true and because of that, the code inside the curly brace is going to be executed. So now we're going to assign to our max, which is now is 20, our number, which is 40. So now our max variable has a value of 40. And we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing for the next, for the 50. So this condition is also going to be true. So we're going to assign to our max 50 and so on and so on until it reaches 100, which is, uh, which is which is going to be also true. This condition is going to be true and we're going to be assigning uh, 100 to our max uh, value. Of course, that if uh, we had uh, another uh, number here, let's say two, it's going to loop for that number also, and this condition is going to be false for that because our number two is not going to be greater than max. And it's going to exit, it's going to exit the loop, it's going ter to terminate, and it's going to return the maximum value, which is 100, like we saw in our uh, output in our console. And uh, at this point, when we re return our max value, the function is lived. So it's not executing any line of code uh, uh, besides our uh, uh, return max. It's not going to execute the subsequent code which comes below. But if our search max is false, it's going to execute the else part. So in this case, it's going to search for the minimum value. So here we have the same for loop. We search, you, you go through the through all the numbers, but here you're not checking to see if our number is greater than uh, max, here you're checking to see if our number is less than our minimum number. So you, ch you check to see if our, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, let's take 20, 40, you check to see if 20 is less than our minimum value, which is 20. And that is going to be false. So this code is not going to be executed inside the curly brace of the if, and it's going to loop again. And now it's going to check for the 40. And that's also going to be going to be uh, false. So and so on, and so on, and so on until it reaches 100, which is also going to be false. The loop is going to execute and it's going to return 20. Of course, that if uh, we put here two, let's say now the minimum value is going to be two because it's going to loop for another iteration. And now one is going to compare to see if our number 
respectively 2 is less than our mean, which our, our mean uh, previously was 20, that is going to be true and it's going to assign our 2 to our mean. So if you run this code now, now you're going to see that uh, the minimum value is not 20, but it's, but it's 2. And after that, we return this value to the function, uh, which is called. So now I get the minimum value is 2, which is correct. So this is how this uh, code uh, works. And uh, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about object-oriented programming. And particularly in this video, we're going to look at classes and objects. But first, I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to call it OP. For the language, select Kotlin. And for the build system, IntelliJ. Make sure to have the JDK selected. And uh, also, I'm going to check this little box because uh, this add sample code is going to add uh, the main function and that code uh, for us. So I'm going to click on create to create the project. Now I'm going to delete this code. And I'm going to hide the project pane. Now, what is object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming is a way of writing code, in a sense, in the way we think about the real world. So, in the real world, we have objects which can interact with, e with each other and um, which can do stuff. But the objects in the real uh, world have two major characteristics. First is the state. So, an uh, the state of an, an object in real life is represented, let's say that we, we think about uh, of a car. The state is represented by the color of that car, by the number uh, of... Uh, gears that car has by, uh, by the brand name of that car. So this is uh, the state of a car. The next thing that uh, real life objects have is functionality. So objects can do stuff. So let's take again the example of a car. A car can move, a car can stop, a car can switch gears. So objects in real life have this, uh, do this, uh, those two characteristics, those two major char characteristics represented by the state and the functionality. And uh, the aim of object-oriented programming is to construct objects using code in the way they are uh, they in the way they are in, in the real life. B but uh, to do that, let's say that you want to build an object, an actual object in real life, what you first need to do? The first thing that you need to do, you, you need to create a template or a construction plan for uh, creating that object in which you're going to define the generic things that uh, a car has. And uh, in programming, you will do the same thing, but instead of using a piece of paper or a, or a something uh, on, an, on your PC to draw that, uh, that um, template, in programming, uh, you're going to use a class. So the class is used to create the template, which then is going to be used to create an actual object an object which is going to have a, a specific state and a specific functionality. So, um, in a way, you can think th uh, that um, the real world serves here as a model for us to write code. And uh, in this way, in, by combining uh, the state and the functionality in one entity and have an, an object, and um, as you can see, you, you can also have uh, like in the real life, objects communicating with each other, you're going to see that this is really powerful because uh, you can uh, you can uh, model uh, your code in a more uh, dynamic, in a more, uh, in a more create, creative way. So this is what uh, we're going to do next. So first, let's say that I want to create an object uh, of type car. And uh, to do that, we go down here and we need to define, as I said, the uh, construction plan, the template for building an object. And in this case, we're going to build the car object. So we're going to define what is called a class. And we type the keyword class. Now we need to name our class. I'm going to call it car. And the name of the of the class should start with a capital letter. And if it has multiple words, it should be in Pascal case. Then you put curly braces and press enter. Now, inside the curly braces, we need to define the state and the functionality as I said, for uh, the objects that are going to be built with this template. And um, to do that, we need to use variables first for the state or uh, 
or in the context of object oriented programming and more specifically in the context of uh, classes they are called the classes and objects they are called properties and we, we define them like we define a simple variable we type var and the next thing then the first thing that uh, that a car has is a name a brand name so we're gonna type name but we cannot keep this variable uninitialized we need to provide a value to it and i'm gonna put an empty string for uh, for now so it's gonna have the default value an empty string the next thing is the model what kind of model this car is so it's gonna be also a string i'm gonna assign an empty string the next property is gonna be called uh, color it's gonna be also an empty string and the next property is gonna be called doors so this is gonna store the number of doors that a specific object which is gonna be built with this template is gonna have and we're gonna put zero I'm gonna put zero now. Now we need to define some functionality for uh, this class and for the objects, for and implicitly for the objects that are, that are gonna be built with this class. And uh, I'm gonna add two functions. First one is gonna be called move. It's not gonna take any parameters. It's gonna just output some text to the console, which is gonna say that the car is moving. So we put quotation marks. The car is moving. Now we're gonna define another function called stop. Also, it's not gonna take any parameters. It's gonna just output some text to the console. It's gonna it's gonna say that the car has stopped. Now we have the template. We defined what uh, our car is gonna have now we need to create an actual or, or object an actual and an specific object using this template and to do that we first need to declare a variable and uh, it's gonna be a val and i'm gonna call it car one so so our object is gonna be stored in this variable car one then we put equals and we type car and now we have some suggestions and we have our car that we define uh, below our car class so we press enter then we put parentheses so now we have created an actual object a real object real in the programming sense and um, which uh, but now this uh, actual object was also this is called uh, instantiation because we created an actual instance but we don't need to bother with uh, these uh, names for now so we created an actual object using this template that we have below but the the properties of these specific objects are those properties that we define here those default properties and to define some uh, specific profit pro, pro, so, some specific values to these properties that this uh, car object that we created has we need to type car1 dot so this is called informally that notation and now we have some suggestions so we have our uh, properties that we define for uh, a car and now we type car1 dot and we choose the name and now i'm going to assign a value to this name and going to be called tesla so now our car1 uh, object that was created has the property name tesla now we do the same thing for the next property for the model car1 dot model press enter and you put we put here s played so the model next we also type car1 dot now we're gonna assign a value to the property color and it's gonna be red next we type also car1 and we define for the property names for the property doors also a value so we're gonna put here four so now our object car1 has for its property for its properties some uh, specific values respectively we have uh, for the name tesla for the model as played for the car uh, for the color red and for the doors four so now let's output the property values of uh, this object that we created in the console and to do that we put our println function down here we put quotation marks inside the parentheses 
because I'm going to add some text here. So, uh, so I'm going to type name equals, you put dollar sign, then you put curly braces, and inside the curly braces, you type car1 dot name. And this is going to return the, the value of the property name for the car1 object that we created. Respectively, it's going to return Tesla. Let's press Ctrl D three times to do the same thing for the next properties. And here you put car one dot model. So this is going to return the value of the model property. Here we're going to put color. And here we're going to type doors. Now if you run this code, we get name Tesla. Actually, let's change uh, the text here to model to match the property name. Model color and doors. So now if you run this, we get name Tesla, model is played color red and doors 4 and those are the values of uh, the properties of this object that we created here with uh, our uh, template uh, car. Next what we can also do because in the class we defined uh, two functions we can call those functions on this uh, object that we created and to do that we also use the dot notation we type car1 dot move and this is going to call the move function which is inside the car1 uh, object let's also type car1 dot stop to call the stop function so now if you run this code we get uh, the values of our, to, to our properties and then we get the car is moving and uh, the car has stopped so car1 dot move and car1 dot stop is calling the functions on this object that we created uh, here. Now, let's uh, also add inside the functions the name of the car that is uh, moving. So he, to do that, we put here dollar sign inside the class and we type name. And this is gonna re ref reference this property name that is defined here. And let's also do the same thing for the stop function. Let's type name. And now what this is gonna do because those functions are in, they are they are living inside this object that we created here, car one. And this object has uh, the name Tesla. When uh, those functions are gonna be called, they they gonna they're, they're gonna say that the car and the name of the car, uh, which is uh, in our case for our object is Tesla, is moving, and then it's gonna say the car again Tesla has stopped because they are called on this uh, specific object that we created which has uh, those specific uh, values for its properties all right so now if you run this code we get as expected the car Tesla is moving and the car Tesla has stopped so the functions are called on this object that we define here and it's using the property values that we define for this object. But as I said, with, uh, you can create as many objects as you want using the same template. And let's do that. Let's create another object. So I'm going to type here val car2. Let's put equals. We type car and then we put parentheses. And this create it now another object, but we need to define some values to its properties because now the values for the properties are uh, the default values that we define inside the class, respectively the empty string and the zero. And to do that, we type here car2 dot name. So now we are calling the properties for the car2 object. And now we define some values to the car to the properties of the car2 object. So they are uh, this here is not overriding the value that we have here because this thing that we have here it's a distinct object in memory uh, from this object they are distinct distinct objects and they have their own properties with their own values and their own functions and now let's put here ford 
let's put uh, car2.model let's put mustang let's put uh, car2.color blue and for the doors let's put 2 car2.doors equals to 2 and uh, let's output uh, those values in the console so let's output the values uh, of, the, of the properties for this second object that we created in the console and to, the, to do that I'm gonna copy this code I'm gonna pa paste, it, uh, paste it below here and now I'm just gonna change the the variable to car2 to, to, call, to call the properties on the car2 object so we we'll put here car2 So now we're calling uh, the properties values on, on uh, our car2 object. And now if uh, I run this code, now we get name Ford, model Mustang, color blue, and doors for. And the uh, first part is from the our sec for, from our first object, which is name Tesla, model spray, the red, doors for, and the car Tesla is moving and the car Tesla stop. But let's add a space here to make uh, clear uh, uh, to make uh, clear which, uh, to make uh, clear uh, that this is the output for the second object to make things more clear. And to add the space, we put here uh, our a pr a println uh, statement. We put quotation marks and we put a backslash n. And this is gonna add a space between our println uh, statements. So it's, go it's gonna add a space between those statements and uh, and those. So now if you run this code, let's increase this, we get uh, name Tesla, so this is our first object, model is played, color red, doors 4, the car Tesla is moving because we're calling the functions on uh, the first object, and the car Tesla has stopped. And then we get name Ford, model Mustang, color blue, doors 2, and we have our space, because we put here this backslash and which adds uh, that space for us. Let's um, decrease this and let's also call the functions, the move and stop functions on the second object. So I'm going to type here car2 that move and car2 that stop. So now if you run this, let's right click and just click on run main.kt. Now we get our uh, first object, which is with, with its uh, value for uh, the value for, with the value for its properties, and then we get the two functions called on our first object, and uh, we get then our second object with uh, its values for its properties, and then we get the car for this moving and the car for has stop because now uh, we're calling the functions on the, this second object, and this second object has uh, the value for the properties, has has different values for its properties. So this is why we get uh, the car for this moving and the car for has stopped. Again, they are different objects, they are distinct ob objects created using the same uh, template, the, the same uh, construction plan. And uh, I'm going to end this video now and see you in the next video. So in the last video we saw how we can create a class and then how we can define uh, some properties and some functionality to that class then we use that class to create uh, two objects and then we define for those uh, objects for the property of those objects uh, some values but in the way uh, we we define values to the properties of the object is to call the the object and then uh, the property of the object and then we assign a value and this is okay but uh, if you have more than uh, than uh, four properties let's say you have 20 or 100 properties that will be very tedious to write each one of them and then assign a value and uh, a better way is to use what is called a constructor and as the name implied the constructor is used to construct the object and the constructor is called at the time when we create a new object so at the time we line we, we uh, type this line of code when you finish to type this line of code the constructor is called immediately so that is the the time where uh, we, we need to pass 
the values to our properties. And to do that, we go down here where we define our class. We put at the at the end of uh, our uh, at the end of the name of the class, we put parentheses, and here we define some parameters. The way we define parameters for functions, and the first one is going to be called name. It's going to be a string. The second one is going to be model, also a string. The next one, color, also a string. And the last one is going to be doors, and this is going to be an integer. Now, we need to assign whatever values pass to those parameters to the properties of the class here. And to do that, we just delete the empty string here and we'll type name. And as I'm typing, you see that we have name and it has this P. And this P stands for prop for a parameter. So it's saying, do you mean this uh, parameter that we define up here? And then we press enter to fill that for us. Then we put, we type here model, color, and then doors. Now, if you go up here, we have some errors because now the the when you create the object, the object is expecting for its uh, constructor some values. So if you hover over here inside the parentheses, it says uh, no value fast for parameter color, doors, model, and name. So if you, and if you look down here, you see that it has this public constructor. So now what you need to do is to pass the value that you passed uh, down here to to the properties by calling the calling them on the object is to pass them directly in the constructor and then the values the arguments if you want are going to be assigned to the properties so i'm going to put here and you have this hint name tesla then we put a comma so you have the, again the, uh, the hint which is very uh, helpful so for the model we put s played And then for the color, we put red. And for the number of doors, four. All right, so now this is more concise. And now this is doing the exact thing that we did previously, but this is uh, more concise. And we're using the constructor to pass the those values to the parameters to, that we define here and then those parameters are going to be assigned to the properties respectively with those properties name model core and doors you're going to see what is the difference between the properties and parameters uh, in a, in the next video now we have also an error here because uh, uh, this also expects some values to its constructor so instead of putting uh, those values here we put up here ford Mustang Blue and 2 Now we can delete this because we already passed the values for this second object for its properties and Now if you look at the code, uh, the code is more concise and more uh, and easier to read Now if you run this code you will have the same output because the code uh, works well. So now if you look at the console, let's uh, increase this a little bit. Let's scroll up. You have the name Tesla, model S place, color red, doors 4, the car Tesla is moving, the car Tesla has stopped. So we have the same output uh, as previously. And down for the second object we have uh, we have uh, the name Ford, the model Mustang, the color blue, doors 2, and the car 4 is moving, and the car 4 has stopped. So our code uh, works uh, well. Now let's close the console. But if you go down here, you will see that you have this, uh, this uh, the properties color. So if you hover over them, it says the property is explicitly assigned to a parameter name. So it can be declared directly in constructor. Now, what is uh, saying here in other words is that we can put the properties directly in the constructor so you don't need to de define the properties down here and then uh, assign the value that is passed to the, to the parameter to the property and uh, 
the difference between the properties and uh, parameter is, parameters is that the properties, respectively those that we define in the in the header of the class inside the parentheses here of the, in the constructor, is that uh, the properties are not uh, storing the state of of the class. They are not storing the state of the object. They are they are only here to to get whatever value we pass here. So whatever value you pass here, and its job is to only get that value and assign it to the property name. So only the the, the variables which are declared de declared inside the class are uh, storing ultimately the the state of that uh, object. So uh, if I delete, let's say if I delete this here, now we have an error here because the property name. Uh, it says on unresolved reference name, create member property card name, and that is because the property name is not uh, declared. It's not exists. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. a, a, a it's not a characteristic of a car. We we didn't define a property name because here the parameters, the parameter name, is only there to get the value and then pass the value to the property. But we can uh, let's press uh, Control Z to put the code uh, back. Now the error disappears because we have the property declared. But because the only thing that we do here is to 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 get the value that is passed to the property as an argument here and uh, for the next ones, and then assign it to the property, uh, we can put those directly in the constructor. So to do that, we just we can uh, hover over here and uh, let's hover over and click on this light bulb and click move to constructor. So now you have this, you have the same, uh, the same thing, uh, the same thing, but the only difference is that we have this var keyword in front and uh, that is responsible for changing the, changing the parameter into a property. So let's do the same thing for the next ones move to constructor and now we don't have that error that we don't have uh, a property for our class because now our, because they have the var so if you put the var or the var keyword before declaring the 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 parameter it is going to be converted into a property so now those are properties of our class car so they are storing actually they are storing the the value that you pass to to them uh, for the object that we create. So uh, it's not like previously where we have the property, the parameter, and then the value is passed to the property inside the class. So now if you run this code, we have the exact same output. The only difference now is that this is uh, more concise. We have the properties declared direct directly in the constructor, so we don't have declared the parameters, and then we assign uh, the value that is passed to those parameters to the properties. So you can uh, declare the the constructor like this if you want. So the question may arise: when to use properties uh, and when to use uh, parameters? And to 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 answer that question, um, you have you need to have in mind that uh, if you want to do some if you want to do some work before you assign the value to the property because in our case uh, the value that is passed here to the to the property in this case is directly stored in the property so we cannot uh, add some uh, validation to check to see if uh, i don't know if uh, this uh, name is if, if it starts to a specific letter or if it's uh, if it's an uppercase or because the value that is passed uh, that is passed uh, as an argument to the property there i say property because they are they are, they are now declared as properties it is directly stored as uh, as uh, the state of the object so if you want to to do some work before you assign the value of the property you need to, de to declare it let's say let's say that you want to Let's actually delete this and I'm, I'm going to declare it as a parameter. So let's say that you want to, to, to trim the space that is passed. So let's say that I put some spaces here. Uh, 
let's actually press control Z to see what is happening if I don't do that. All right. I pressed Control Z too many times. So let's let's again pass, let's put some spaces here. So now if you run this code, let's run it again. Now, because uh, the value that is passed as an argument here to the object car1 is passed directly to the property, so it's stored in the property and we, we don't do nothing with it, we have also the space. But if you want to, to delete that space, uh, currently we can do that because the values pass directly to the property and there is nothing that we can do from uh, that point. And to, to change that, we can declare the, the property that is defined here, uh, the property name, as a parameter first. And we can declare it down here. Uh, the, we can declare down here now the property. And we can put equals. And now we, we pass the, the, uh, the parameter to the property. So we assign name here. But before before that value is assigned to the property name, we put that trim. And that is going to remove the spaces. So that trim is a function which is part of the string class because the the data the all the data types that we looked at uh, are also classes. So you can call functions on them the way we called functions on our uh, on our uh, objects. So name that trim removes the space so in this case it removes the space uh, that we have here and after that it's assigning the value to the name uh, property so now if you run this code now we, now we have the space but if you run the code so let's go up run the code Now, as you can see, the space is removed because uh, we pass the value to the parameter now name. Then the parameter name trims that space. And after that, it's assigned the value to the property name. So in this case, so in this can be a scenario where we can, uh, where we can declare the, instead of declaring directly here, the property can declare it as a parameter. But um, what do, what, what we can do if you want to add more code than just one line of code. In that case, we will need to use what is called the uh, initializer blocks. But um, we're going to look at the initializer blocks and uh, at, at uh, other things in the next video because uh, this video is long enough. So see you in the next video. So in the last video, we looked at uh, constructors and how uh, you can uh, use constructors to construct your objects and uh, it was an alternative to defining the values to the properties of the of a particular object and uh, we've also looked at uh, how you can define uh, the this was i should say it's also called the primary constructor that we have here the parentheses and then the parameters or the properties and uh, we've also talked about uh, how we can define uh, parameters to our constructor and then how we can uh, convert those parameters directly into properties. And um, I also talked a little bit about how and when to use uh, parameters and properties. But uh, in this video, we're going to continue our discussion about parameters and properties and um, specifically going to look at how we can uh, execute more than one line of code when the object is created because um, now, uh, when the object is created and uh, we in the last video we trimmed this space that we have here uh, here we can execute only this line of course so if you want to add more line of course here to do some uh, to, to do a, a more uh, complex validation we can't because here we can put just one line of code and uh, to add more than one line of code of code we need to use what is called initializer blocks and um, initializer blocks are uh, as you'll see some blocks where we can put our code 
and uh, you can put more than one lines of code, you can put as many lines of code you want, and that code is going to be executed uh, when an object is created, when an instance of uh, our of our uh, of your uh, class is going to be created. So uh, this is what we're going to do in this video. Also, I should say that uh, you can declare the class in another file, not just in this file like we did here. So we can open now the project pane. You, you can go to src, go to main, go to, go to Kotlin. And here on Kotlin, you can right click, select Kotlin class file. And uh, from here, make sure to select file. And I'm going to call this file classes because here we're going to put our classes. Respectively, we're going to put our uh, car class, but you can put more classes there. And uh, we're just going to copy this class that we defined here. Control C and paste it here. Now I have an error because uh, this is declared two times here and uh, here. And we just delete it from here. And now the error disappears. And if you run this code, We get the same output because uh, our code uh, works uh, perfectly well uh, now. The only difference is that now we put it, we put our class in a different file. And uh, my suggestion is for you is to put uh, the class if you want in a different fly file, because in this way you have uh, the code in, in a more organized uh, way. Because here you have your class, here you have uh, the code, uh, the objects that you create with that class, and uh, so on. Now, for this video, I'm gonna use, uh, I'm gonna create a different class, and uh, to do, to do that, I'm gonna declare uh, another class, but I'm gonna declare it down here, and uh, I'm gonna delete the code that we have here because we're gonna use a different class, and the class is gonna be called user, so it's gonna represent the the use an user object. So we type here class user now we create the constructor the primary constructor we put parentheses we define the parameters or the properties for uh, now i'm going to define uh, directly the properties here so we type here the var or the var keyword to have the property declared var name string so it's going to be it's going to be store stacks var last name also string and uh, var age this is going to be an integer so this with this class we're going to create some uh, user objects we're going to put curly braces and uh, for now we're not going to put uh, any code here so let's create uh, a user so let's type here val uh, let's call it user you can give it whatever name you want so let's, let's create a new object now. So we put, we type here user, and then we put a parenthesis because we're gonna put, we're gonna pass the values to the constructor here. So we need to pass a name. I'm gonna type Alex, last name Dobinka, and for the age 23. So now we created a new instance a new object using the uh, using the class that we define uh, below but um, what if i want to to pass to to the to the name uh, to the name name property only the 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 names which starts with uh, the letter a in that case we need to declare this uh, property as a parameter first we need to declare here the parameter and then to declare the pro property below and um, before before we assign the, the value that is passed to, to, to the property we need to do some validation and if uh, that uh, argument that is passed to the parameter is, is starting with the a letter then we're gonna assign the value to the property name otherwise we don't do that so to do that uh, we need to use initializer blocks because we're gonna type more than one line of code and the, the initializer blocks are used in conjunction with the primary constructor. So when we create a new object, like we did here, the initializer blocks or the initializer block is going to be called uh, immediately when the object is created. And to use a, an, initializer, an initializer 
block we just but first let's declare uh, let's change this to to a parameter so let's delete the var keyword in front of uh, of uh, the variable so now we have only a parameter here now let's declare the property down here and now here we need to define an explicit type declaration so we need to put here the type string because as i said um, we're not gonna assign uh, the value to the property directly here in one uh, line uh, of code we're gonna assign the value to the property inside the initializer blocked after we do the validation respectively after we check to see if the name that is passed to the objects that we're going to create with the class starts with the letter a and if the the name if the argument doesn't start with the letter a then we're going to assign an empty string and we're going to output something to the console so this is why we need to provide here the type because we're not going to assign the value directly here so it cannot infer uh, what kind of data is going to store then we press enter we type init and uh, here we have a suggestion we have the init keyword and then we have the curly braces press enter and now here we're gonna add our validation and here we type if parenthesis now we type name so now we're referring the name parameter defined above here so if name or the value that is passed to the name parameter first we're gonna um, lowercase that name and to do that we type here name dot lowercase because i want to have uh, both cases so if uh, if the user passes uh, let's say a name with a lowercase letter then we're gonna check to see if it starts with, with a but if the user passes the the name with a, an uppercase letter we also want to check to see if uh, if that letter starts with a and to cover both cases we lowercase uh, the input we lowercase the name uh, so all the, we lowercase all the letters then we, t we put here another dot starts with and we put here a and if that is true then we're gonna assign whatever value was passed to the name parameter to the name property and we cannot type here name equals uh, name because now it's referring the parameter here and to refer the property that we define here we need to use what is called the this keyword so the this keyword is used to refer the properties of the class so we type here this so we're saying this name so now we have this name and we have a different we have this v variable here then we put equals name so now we assign the value that is passed to parameter only if uh, that uh, value or only if that value passed to the parameter starts with the letter a then we're gonna assign the name to the property name else if that is not true put curly braces and now we need to cover the else part because if this is not true we also need to pass a value to to the name property the name property cannot stay uh, without a value so we need to pass also a value here else we're gonna put this that name and uh, we're gonna put uh, user so i'm gonna put the user text if the if the the name doesn't start with the uh, with the letter a and we're gonna also output some text to the console so we put println here and we type the name doesn't start with the letter a or capital A so now if you create a new object here so we type here val let's say f friend we create a new object so we type user now we need to pass the values to the constructor so we put here uh, let's say uh, john let's put uh, smith and let's put 30. now because that the value that you pass here to the parameter name doesn't start with a, a letter a and start with the letter j this val validation inside the initializer block is going to be false and then it's going to be going to execute the else part and it's going to assign to the 
property name, the user uh, text. And it's going to output the name doesn't start with the letter A or A. But if that, that is not, uh, if, but if it's true, if it starts with the letter A, then this line of code is going to be executed, the if part. And it's going to be assigned, uh, it's going to assign the value to the property. So now if you run this code, we get the name doesn't start with the letter A or A, and it's correct. Our name starts with the letter J. So if I put here, let's say, uh, Andra, let's change this to, oh, let's say uh, also Smith. Now if I run this, now we have no output because the this the initializer block is is called, and uh, the if part is evaluates to true and it's assigning the the name uh, Andra to our uh, name property. So let's add the print uh, LN down here to see that that is correct. So print, let's print the value of, of the property uh, name for our friend object. And we put here, uh, and here we type uh, dollar sign, we put curly braces and we type friend dot name so now if you run this let's close get name under let's put comma here let's put colon here so our initializer block is called the code inside the initializer block is um, executed and then uh, this uh, if check evaluates to true and then and then it assigns the name Andra to our property name. But if we I put here John let's type it like this let's say to see that it's working because we lowercase the letters. We get the name doesn't start with the letter A or A name user. So the initializer block is executed immediately when the object is created and uh, the code inside the initializer block is called it checks to see if, sta if it starts with the lower it starts with, uh, with the letter a and if not then it is assigned to the property name user so we have this why we have user here and then it outputs uh, this uh, text to the console. So this is how we can use the initializer blocks in conjunction with the primary constructor. And um, you can also put more initializer blocks and uh, the order in which you put the initializer blocks matters in the sense that um, the order in which you define the initializer block is, is going to be the order in which they, they are executed. So the order in which you define them is uh, important. But uh, most of the time I think you'll, you use only one initializer block to put your code. So this is our discussion about initializer blocks. And in the next video, we're going to look at, um, because we talked about the primary constructors, there is uh, another type of constructor, which is called the secondary constructor or the secondary constructors. And uh, we're going to also look at the default parameters, because you can put, you can, uh, we can define default uh, values to the properties or to the parameters of the constructor. So we're going to do that. <coughs> we're going to do that in the next video. I'm going to end this video now. So now it's time to start a discussion about secondary constructors, because besides our primary constructor that uh, we define and that we talked about, in Kotlin you can uh, define multiple constructors, and those are called uh, secondary constructors. Now you may be wondering why you will need secondary constructors. And um, to answer the, that question, we, we need to consider uh, the user uh, class and the user objects that we can create. So let's say that a user only provides its first name and uh, for the properties last name and age doesn't provide any value. In that case, you will need the uh, you need a way to to define some default values for those uh, properties in case the user only provides the first name. And uh, 
if uh, let's say the next user uh, does provide the, the first name and the last name and the age in that case you're gonna use uh, the the primary constructor but if it doesn't provide uh, those uh, those values then you're gonna use the secondary constructor but to make this uh, more clear let's uh, let's add the code and we talk we talk about was while I am uh, writing the code so let's delete the, the initializer blocks that we have here because we don't need this code and let's also put the property now let's define the property in the primary constructor so let's just put here a, a var the var here in front of the variable let's also delete this println and um, let's delete the values here for the last name and the age so now as you can see we have an error because it's expecting here the um, it's expecting an argument a value for the last name and for the age and uh, to, to solve that problem we just go down here and we type constructor so this is the keyword for declaring the secondary constructor and we press enter to fill in that for us and we put parentheses and now here in the parentheses we define the parameters and I am specifically saying parameters because as you will see the secondary constructors cannot declare properties they can only declare parameters because uh, anyway let's uh, so let's define here the parameter so I'm gonna type here name let's put here uh, the type of this variable is gonna be a string now if you hover over here it says primary constructor call expected insert this call so what all the secondary constructors need to do is they need to call the primary constructor because ultimately the primary constructor is the one which declares the property the properties for the class and stores the values for uh, of that uh, pro of that property and to do that we put here colon we type this so we put colon this type the this keyword then you put parentheses and to the this call we pass the name so this name that we define here and for the next two values we're gonna pass some default values so here I'm gonna put user because uh, let's say that because well, as, uh, as I said in the beginning this user is gonna not it's not gonna provide the uh, the last name so let's put here last name not user last name and uh, for the age let's put um, let's put uh, let's say zero all right now what this is gonna do is now if you look uh, up here we don't have an error so let's uh, so now we don't have that error because now it's using the secondary constructor is passing the value here Alex to the secondary constructor that we define here and here we define only the parameter and the value that is passed to this parameter then it's passed to this to the primary constructor because by putting colon and this in parenthesis we're calling now the primary constructor and is the primary constructor the one which ultimately declares the property and stores whatever value we send to him in this case we send the value Alex and for the last name uh, we uh, we just uh, send the last the text last name and for the age we put uh, zero because this is our way to saying that this uh, user doesn't want to provide its age so this is why uh, you need to call the the primary constructor from the secondary constructor because uh, again the secondary the primary constructor is the one which ultimately declares the properties of the class is the one which stores the 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 properties uh, of the class the secondary constructor only only takes parameters and then calls the primary constructor so in fact if you put here the var keyword you have an error which says var on secondary constructor parameter is not allowed that is because the secondary constructor cannot call uh, cannot declare properties only the primary constructor and uh, because as I said we can declare multiple secondary constructors we can type here 
constructor so we can declare another uh, secondary constructor and here we can put name here we put string then we type last name also string so this secondary constructor is only gonna take the name and the last name as uh, arguments the age is not gonna this uh, secondary constructor is gonna, not gonna take any value for uh, the age now we need to put colon we type this parenthesis because now we're calling the primary constructor and here we we pass the name that is passed to this secondary constructor this that we define here the last name and for the age we're gonna put zero because this uh, this second secondary constructor doesn't uh, uh, take any value any arguments for its uh, for its age but because as I said ultimately the primary constructor is the one which uh, defines the properties we cannot uh, we cannot call the primary constructor and not pass any value so we pass this default value here and uh, so now if you if go up here and let's say that I delete the age now our code works fine because now what is happening here is this the the value for the for the name and the last name is passed to this secondary constructor this one here and the secondary constructor then calls this primary constructor and it's passing the two values to the primary constructor name respectively this name John and last name Smith and uh, for the age it uh, passes the default uh, value zero so this is how we can this is why we can pass here uh, uh, this this is why you can avoid here uh, to pass uh, let's say uh, you can avoid to pass uh, the, the last name and the age for the first because it is using the first secondary constructor and this object that we created here it's using this secondary constructor because here we're passing only the first name uh, for the first a value for the first name property and uh, a value for the last name property so it's passing them to this uh, secondary constructor which then in turn calls the primary constructor it passes them to the primary constructor so it passes the the two va the two the, the values for the two properties and the last one is defaulted because uh, he, because you don't provide the value for the age with, with secondary constructors you can also put you can at the end of uh, the call of the primary constructor you can put uh, curly braces to have some code executed when you create an uh, object with that specific uh, secondary constructor so you can put here curly braces and inside the curly braces you can have some code which uh, is going to be executed when you create an object with uh, this let's say secondary constructor when we, and when you create an object with this secondary constructor so it's up to you what uh, code you put there. But to illustrate this, let's put uh, a println statement here in the in this secondary constructor. So let's type here println, and here I'm gonna type second, and um, I'm gonna type second because uh, this is the first constructor, this is the primary constructor, and this is the one which uh, ultimately does all the work. Is the one which stores the value for uh, the properties. And uh, this is the third constructor. So let's copy this. Let's put here third. Just for illustration. Also, let's uh, output in the, cons the console the value of uh, the, the property values for uh, these objects. So let's type here println. And uh, let's type here name equals let's put the dollar sign let's put curly braces let's use our user uh, variable now let's call the properties on this uh, object so let's type name now let's press ctrl D two times and let's put here now uh, last name and uh, age and uh, let's also add a space between the information about the two objects to make 
things more clear, so let's put the printer in here, let's put the backslash in here. And let's copy the code that we have here. Let's paste it, paste it below. Let's change this uh, object to our friend object that we created. So let's type here friend. And I'm gonna speed this uh, now a little bit because it will take some. Now let's output uh, this information in the console. So now what we have is we have we have second and then third because uh, this first object is using the the second constructor. So this is why we have here uh, second. And uh, then the next line of code is called and we have third because uh, this one, this object that we have here, the friend object, it's using the third constructor, this secondary constructor. So this I have here third. Then we, then we have the values for the properties for the, then we have the values for the properties of the user object. So we have the, here, the output down here. And uh, then we scroll down and we have uh, name John, last name Smith, age zero, because we have uh, the property values for the second object, for this object. And uh, this is okay, this works uh, completely fine. The thing to have in mind is that uh, now we're using the secondary constructors and the secondary constructor then calls the primary constructor and the primary constructor is the one which uh, ultimately stores the values, which ultimately declares the properties and stores the, the values. But uh, one thing to notice in the output is that uh, the first object has the name uh, Alex and the last name last name and the age zero that is because uh, the first object is only uh, taking a value for the first name property or for the name property and uh, for the last name and the age because it's using this secondary constructor is uh, only passing the first name which is Alex that we have here and then it's using the default values last name and a zero it's passing those default, default values to the primary constructor. So it's calling the primary constructor. It's passing the value Alex and then uh, the default value last name and zero. This is why I have last name and zero here. And for the next one, we have uh, name uh, John and last name Smith. This is because now this is using uh, the next secondary constructor and um, that takes as a uh, arguments the name and the last name and then it's calling the primary constructor it passes the first name and the last name and the age uh, is defaulted so we have zero so this way we have here john and smith and then zero so it's important to 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 notice this and to think about how uh, this uh, to think about this thing so this is our discussion about multiple constructors respectively about secondary constructors in this video you saw how we can uh, pass uh, a different uh, number of uh, values to our uh, properties. Ultimately, you pass all the values to the properties by calling the primary constructor and providing the full values, because uh, in this way you can uh, satisfy all the possible cases. So if uh, in our case, uh, one user only provides the name and the last name is not provided and the age is going to use uh, this secondary constructor and it's going to pass the last name as default and the age zero. And this is um, in a way uh, similar to overloading uh, functions, but it's uh, not uh, the same because uh, what you're doing here is overloading uh, the constructors. And um, this, in this way, you can uh, you can think about uh, uh, why why uh, we are overloading the constructors, and uh, that is because. If uh, we didn't uh, have uh, secondary constructors, we would have to create another class with a different number of uh, parameters or, or a different number of uh, properties. And uh, we will need to, to create each object with that uh, specific uh, class. Let's say that we create this object which only takes uh, a value for its parameter name. Then we have to create a class in which we're going to define only the name property and it's gonna, then we're going to create that object only with, with that class. 
and uh, if uh, an object or if an object uh, let's say if a user uh, creates uh, if, if your user doesn't pro pro is providing uh, the the name and the last name but not the age you will have to create another class with only the name and the last name uh, defined uh, as its properties and you can see that this this uh, is uh, this will generate uh, uh, duplicated code and so on and we can solve all of this by using uh, secondary constructors and uh, calling the primary constructor so uh, see you on the next video and because Kotlin is about con conciseness in the next video we're gonna look at how we can do the same thing that we have here with default parameters because um, Kotlin supports for its uh, properties, for its parameters in the constructor default values. So the same thing that we have here can be achieved by providing default values to the properties. So see you in the next video. So now it's time to look at default values for our properties. And uh, first let's delete the secondary constructors. And now we have uh, errors here because uh, it expects the value, the, expecting the values for the next properties here. And um, let's also change this to to first name because I refer to it to the first name, but uh, it was called, it is, it is called name. So let's call it first name. So go right click on it, go to rename and then to refactor to change it in all the places. And let's call it first name. And as you can see now, let's change it in all the place, then press enter. So now we have the first name. And um, default uh, properties are, uh, default values to our properties are basically, they are similar to default values that we provide uh, to our uh, parameters uh, when we talked about functions. And what we do is, uh, let's say that I wanted to provide a default value for the last name, we just put equals. So inside the primary constructor, we put equals, and here we put, let's say, last name. So now this has the last name as its default value if a value is not provided for the last name. And here you can put also equals, and we put zero. And now the error, as you can see, disappeared from uh, both of our objects because now what it's doing is when we don't provide a value for the last name and for the age, then the default values that we provide here is gonna be, are going to be used as the values for uh, the properties. So this is uh, a way of uh, achieving the same thing that uh, we achieved previously with the secondary constructor, but this is more concise. And the question is when to use one, on one or the other is um, the, um, the answer may be if you want to execute some code when uh, an object is created let's say with one of the let's say if you wanted to if you want to execute some code when you create uh, an object then you can use secondary constructors because as i said secondary constructors can have a block of code when uh, which can be executed but uh, the this uh, the, the default because primary constructor does not don't don't have a don't have a block of code, they, you cannot do that. M maybe you could use uh, initializer blocks, but uh, that is uh, open to discussion. So this is how you can provide default values to, to the primary constructor. And our code works fine, it's, and it's very concise, very beautiful. And um, the next thing that you can do is that you can uh, also use named arguments so we can use the because here you use the first name and the last name and if i um, because those are uh, those are uh, both strings here you cannot see the distinction but if i put here uh, now i can use the name argument so i can put here first name equals so it's similar to the way we have uh, name arguments in our function and here we can put the text john also here and this uh, with this thing you can uh, you can uh, change the order in which you need to define the values for the parameter so let's put here last name but to illustrate this better let's create another object 
let's type val user2 let's type user and let's put here Ioana but let's use the uh, name argument so let's put first the age so we're gonna provide the value for the age let's say uh, 19 and uh, let's uh, let's type first name so here let's put uh, Ioana because this is a string in quotation marks and for the last name let's say uh, let's type also the name argument last name <clears throat> and for the last name let's put here um, Dobby let's say right so what we did here is that uh, in uh, the primary constructor the order uh, for, uh, for of the property is very specific we have the first name and the last name and then we have the age but with the name arguments we first provided the age so we provided uh, a value for the age probably which is the last one so and then you provide the value for the first name and with uh, name arguments similar to the way used in our functions you can uh, pass the va values to the properties in which order you want irrespective of the order in which they are defined here so this is very powerful if uh, if you ask me it's very interesting because uh, you can uh, pass the values to the properties irrespective of the order in which they are uh, defined so this is our discussion about default uh, parameters and uh, named arguments in uh, with uh, the primary constructor and uh, you cannot use default parameters and name arguments with the secondary constructors they can only be used with the primary constructor so see you in the next video but uh, before I end the video, let's actually run this code to see that uh, it works uh, in the same way it was uh, working in previously when we used the uh, secondary constructors. So let's run this code. So you have name Alex, last name, last name, because it's using this default value that defined here. Then we have age zero because it's using this value defined here. So this this object and then um, we have uh, name john last name smith a0 because now it's using this default value so the same thing can be achieved using um, default parameters and uh, we didn't end. output the values for the for the second uh, for the third uh, object that we created here in user 2 but you can do that as a as a challenge for if you want you can output the values for uh, this uh, object so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about getters and setters because um, so far in our videos even though we didn't see explicitly the getters and setters uh, here we've used the getters and setters every time we got the value of a property and every time we assign a new value to a property and um, the getters and setter in Kotlin are implicit, so they they are declared, they are auto auto generated by default uh, by by Kotlin for you. So every time uh, you in, let's say you get the value of uh, an object, let's say that you get the value of the user that first name, what actually happens here is not that we're uh, uh, getting the value of the first name directly, even though if you look at the code, this is what it seems to be. What is happening is that every time we get the value of uh, of a property that value is returned by the getter so you never access the property directly and you never uh, never uh, does change the the property of uh, the value of a property directly you every you every time you you are using the getters and setters and now this discussion is touching on um, on a very important concept in um, Kotlin programming and that is encapsulation. So encapsulation basically means to to protect, to hide the inner workings of the class from being accessed outside. And uh, if you look at this syntax that we have here, it seems that we actually accessing the values, uh, the properties directly. But as I said, that is not the case because we always using the getter and the setter. 
and uh, because we always use use the getters and the setters, the getter to get the value and the set to to change the value of a property. That means that uh, your uh, data, your properties are never accessed directly. Thus, uh, the low, laws of encapsulation are not broken. The, the, um, in other words, you, you, you never allow uh, somebody outside of the class to access directly that property. So this is why uh, this is why we have uh, getters and setters, and this is why the getters and setters in Kotlin are implicit. So they are not even declared explicitly here. We don't see any code which to imply that we have a getter a setter here because uh, they are automatically and by default generated every time you define a property so every time you define a property either in the primary constructor or inside the class the getters and the, get the getter and setter is automatically generated for you but uh, let's say that you, you want to override the getter and setter to provide some uh, additional uh, additional code to the code that is uh, by the by default provided you can do that by changing let's say this uh, property to a parameter and to override the getter in setter and to see how the getters and setters actually look under the covers just type here var we define the property first name we assign the first name parameter to property now the getters and setter need to need to be Override it that, uh, the immediately after the we after we define uh, the property. So we cannot have some code here and then uh, to override you can to override the getter and setter. So we need to we need to, we need to define them immediately after we we define the property. So we type here get and as I'm typing, you see that I have some suggestion. Then you go down here you, and you can choose uh, you choose this one. So you have parentheses, curly braces, and inside the curly braces, you, you press enter. Here you type return field. I'm going to explain immediately what is this. And now we need to override the setter. And to do that, we just type set. And I have some suggestions. We also go down here. We choose this one. Press enter. And here you type field again. This uh, and this identifier and we put equals to value. So this is the implicit code that is generated, that is auto-generated by Kotlin for you every time you 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 define a property in your class, either in the as I said in the primary constructor or uh, inside the class. So uh, because in fact, if you look here, we have some underlines, and if you hover over here, it says redundant getter. Remove remove redundant getter. Because uh, and also for the setter, redundant setter. Because they, they are redundant because they are uh, implicitly again auto-generated uh, by Kotlin for you. So this code is redundant here. You don't need this code because Kotlin already provides this code uh, under the covers for you. But if you're not satisf satisfied with this code, with this implicit code that is uh, auto-generated by Kotlin, you can you can um, you can override them like we did here and provide some additional code. So we can put here, let's say, some text, so so that every time we get the value of our uh, we get the value of our uh, first name uh, property, we're gonna have a pre prefix. And let's put here uh, first name. Let's put colon, dollar sign, and field. I'm gonna explain. I'm gonna explain immediately what this field is. But let's say first how uh, how this works. And here let's put a println to print the value that is passed to the setter and then assigned to the first name property. So let's put here dollar sign value was assigned to first So now if you run this code Now we have name, so we have uh, our text that we have here, name, and then we have first name Alex, let's actually delete this text to make uh, things more clear, let's delete this text, let's delete this. Now let's run this code again. 
So what we have now is that every time we get the value of our property name, we, ha we have that prefix first name that we have uh, overwritten here in the in the getter. So the getter is called, uh, as I said, the value is returned by the getter. So the getter is, is called, it returns the value of the first name property. So this field is uh, is the first name property, but is uh, it has this identifier field because of, uh, of an important reason, which I'm going to explain uh, immediately. So it returns the value of the first uh, name property with the prefix first name. And we have first name, the text that we have here. Then we have the value of the first name property. We have uh, Alex in our case, because our object has the name Alex, has the property name uh, Alex. Then for the for the setter, we don't have any code uh, here. Also, we have the first name uh, prefix for John. So our our code, every time we get uh, we get the first uh, name uh, property by any of the any of our, of our objects created by by using the user class, it it gets that value. It returns that value through the getter. And the setter, uh, we don't have uh, value as assigned to first name property because the setter is called only when we change uh, the value of uh, of a, of a property. And to do that, we type uh, user, like we did in our first video about object oriented programming, that first name equals, let's say, oh, let's put here uh, Vlad. So now if I run this code, now the setter is going to be called because the setter is called, as I said, only when it we change the value of our uh, of our of of our property. So we get uh, we get Vlad was assigned to first name property. So uh, the code inside the setter was called because uh, this code that we type here is calling the setter. So our code only only always goes to the setter. And the code that we have here, user that first name Vlad, what it's actually doing is passing that value Vlad to here. So this for this uh, this parameter it, uh, that we have here is uh, receiving the value of Vlad, and then that value is assigned to first name property. Again, we have this field identifier for a reason, and the reason is going to be explained immediately. So. Uh, the getters and setters uh, are working uh, well and they are, uh, as I said again, uh, used always when we get or uh, we assign a new value to our properties. Now, what is this field identifier? Why I didn't uh, type here uh, first name? And here I didn't put uh, first name equals to value. So whatever value is passed to the setter, then that value is assigned to the first name property. So why why do not, we don't do that? And um, the reason uh, for that is that because uh, this syntax user that first name user that first name user that first name equals Vlad is calling the setter. If uh, we put here first name equals value, so first name equals Alex, it will be equivalent to to call the setter again. So this line of code that we have here, it will call the setter again, it will pass the value to the setter and then it will, it will assign the value again to the first name. So it will call the setter inside the setter forever. It will be, it will generate an error. And to avoid the, that recursive call, that infinite call, we need to use this field identifier. So the field in the identifier is the first name property, but it has this, uh, uh, special uh, uh, use that it bypasses that uh, error that it will be generated if you use the first name here. So, uh, in fact, let's uh, let's put here a first name to see. So, if you put here first name instead of field, and we have an error here, let's put here uh, field because uh, I want uh, I want the error from the setter to, to get in the console, not the error from uh, this thing here. So now if you run this code, as I said, that will generate a recursive call. 
it will call the getter over and over. So we get the error. So you see, we have Vlad was assigned to first name property, Vlad was assigned to first name property, Vlad, and so on. That is because um, the setter, it's calling the setter forever. It's a, rec it's a recursive call because this line of code here, it's calling the setter, it's, uh, it's um, assigning the value to the, sending the value to the setter, then it's that value is assigned again to the first name property, which in turn calls again the setter and so on. So this field uh, identifier is used because it has this characteristic of uh, bypassing that error. This is why we're using the field instead of the first name uh, property here. And uh, it's basically the first name property, but it has this uh, specific uh, characteristics, which uh, characteristic which um, bypasses the uh, recursive call, which uh, we got when we've used the first name property. Now if we run the code, now we have no error because the recursive call is not happening because we're using the field which bypasses that error. So this is why we're using uh, and we're having and Kotlin has this thing field and this the field can only be used inside the getter or the setter, not uh, um, not anywhere else outside the getter or the setter. And uh, the same is true about the getter. This is why you need to use the field identifier inside the getter also, because it will uh, generate a recursive call uh, again. Now, to to illustrate uh, better, because um, you maybe find uh, confusing this discussion about getters and setters, what uh, they really are, they are uh, equivalent to having two functions which uh, update the first name property and uh, return the first name property. So they, they are equivalent to having a function called set uh, first name. And this function defines a parameter called, let's call it new value. It's gonna be of type string. Let's put curly braces. And here we type this dot first name equals new value. And the getter is equi equivalent to having a function called get first name. And this is not going to take any parameter. It's going it's, we're going to say, say explicitly here that it's going to return a string because it's going to only return a value. And this is going to return the first name property. So we put here this that first name. So the getter and setter that we have here are similar. This is uh, il illustrative for you to have in mind to having two functions which are setting the first name property, are updating the first name property and are uh, returning, uh, let's change this to first, and are returning the first, uh, the value of the first name property. But uh, because constantly is about con conciseness, it has this special uh, syntax and uh, they are uh, automatically generated uh, for you because, uh, as I said, Kotlin is about uh, conciseness, so you don't need to declare those things uh, every time you create uh, a class. So let's delete this. So have in mind that the, uh, under the covers is we have something like this. So let's delete this. Now the error disappears. Also, you can uh, have a shorter way of writing the setter and getter if you don't provide uh, some additional code. So if I delete this and this, I can put here get equals field and uh, that. yes, uh, this is uh, this okay because this is like having uh, a single line uh, a single function, a single line expression function, because we're returning the value to the function get. So you can uh, write it like this, or uh, I I show you th this for you because maybe you'll see uh, written in this way and you may be wondering why. That is because um, this is like having a, a single uh, body expression function. So you can write it like this if you want. But again, if you hover over, this is still redundant. Let's, so let's press Ctrl Z to have the previous code. 
So this is our discussion about getters and setters and um, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start our discussion about the late init keyword and how we can use the late init keyword uh, with uh, our properties. But first let's delete the code that we have from the previous video because we don't need this code. Let's also delete this code. Let's delete those uh, two objects. Let's and let's delete this property. Let's declare it here. So let's put the var keyword. And uh, let's also delete the default values here. And let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. Now we need to provide the values here because we don't have uh, default values for the last name property and the age. So I'm going to type here Dobin, let's say, and age 23. Now, as you already know, if you declare inside the class um, a property, let's say that uh, that property is uh, called favorite movie and it's going to store the favorite uh, movie of the user. You cannot let this variable uninitialize. So uh, let's say that it's going to be of type string. So you cannot let this variable uninitialize. You need to provide a value either by assigning directly a literal value here or by uh, receiving the value through, uh, through, through uh, a, param a parameter defined in the constructor. But um, that is not completely true because sometimes you'll want to, to have a property declared inside the class, but you don't want to assign uh, to it a value uh, uh, right away. So you want to assign the value to the property later. And to be able to do that, we need to use the late init keyword. And to use the late init keyword, you just type here late init, and we have a suggestion, late init. And uh, late init stands for initialize later. later. So what we're saying here is initialize let later this property favorite movie. So you say in the co to the compiler, hey, I'm gonna initialize this uh, property favorite movie, but I'm gonna initialize it later. So believe me. And uh, to do that, we just uh, type user that. So you, uh, whatever object you create with this class, and you know, you have uh, defined the uh, latent property, favorite movie, and you put equals, and then you put, let's say, uh, interstellar here. So now we've initialized our uh, favorite movie property, but we initialized uh, its value later. So we didn't provide the value here directly inside the class, either by, as I said, by providing a literal value or by uh, providing a value through the parameter defined uh, in the primary constructor. So this is how you can use the late init keyword if you want to assign a value to a property later. So you don't want to assign the value directly or, or you don't want to assign the, the value, cor more correctly said, uh, right away. So you want to assign the value later. You just put the late init keyword in front of the property and then you declare uh, the property as uh, you, you, the way you declare a simple variable, right? And uh, if you don't initialize this uh, this uh, property and you want to, and you output the value in the console, so let's say that I put here a println and I type user that favorite movie and I don't initialize it, and if I run uh, this code now, this uh, favorite movie property is not initialized, doesn't have a value. We're gonna have an error, and the error is uh, it's very specific. So we have exception to the main uh, Kotlin uninitialized property access exception, we had, we had, and then it says late init property favorite movie has not been initialized. So it's very specific in saying that hey, you didn't, you said that you're gonna initialize that. Uh, property but you didn't and uh, down here you try to 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 output in the console the value of the far favorite movie but we don't have uh, provided the value and it's better to have this uh, this is called an exception so it's better to have this uninitialized, pro uninitialized property access exception than having a null, null pointer, pointer exception because 
this is why Kotlin actually enforces this uh, behavior of uh, uh, assigning uh, values to the variable to the variables. So it, uh, Kotlin enforces to assign values to, to the variables and uh, not let them uninitialize un because uh, if you don't initialize, uh, uh, you don't provide a value to a, to a variable or to a property, then when you try to access uh, that variable or that property, and let's say that you have an app, uh, that is gonna throw what you, it's gonna throw what is called a null pointer exception, and that is very bad because those kind of exceptions are called only at runtime and not at compile time. So your app can uh, work, uh, let's say, completely well, and uh, when you press a button, I don't know to to see the the fa 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 favorite movie of uh, uh, a user then you get an error and the app crashes. So this is uh, why you need to avoid uh, those uh, null pointer exceptions. And uh, Kotlin, as I said, enforces this behavior of uh, providing uh, values always to the variables to, and to the properties. And uh, if you don't want to provide a, a value to the property, then you can use this latent and uh, it will throw this uh, different uh, exception called latent property favorite movie has not been initialized so it's it's uh, a different um, exception than uh, the null pointer exception but with the latent keyword we can still have uh, as i said that behavior of not initializing the variable but you still need to initialize it later because this is why it's called late in it but this is not uh, saying that uh, the latent uh, error that is shown here is not uh, also uh, having the same uh, behavior like the null pointer exception that I talked about because the late uh, init uh, error that is uh, that we have here if you have uh, an app it will uh, also crash your app but the late init uh, keyword allows us to not provide as I said a value lit or li a little value here or uh, a value through the constructor by the pa by uh, assigning the parameter here with the value pass to the parameter and uh, uh, the is uh, is uh, our uh, responsibility to initialize that variable later so that we don't uh, get into the same uh, problems that we talked about so we don't uh, get this error so it's up to you to to declare a, a property as later and eaten, then provide uh, a value later S because if you don't it will also crash your app when you try to access uh, by uh, I don't know in uh, your app uh, somehow you want to access uh, the value of uh, that property so uh, always have uh, have this in mind that you need to initialize uh, that uh, variable later also I should say that the latent keyword only works with classes and uh, it does not work with uh, primitive types so even though the as I said the integers and all the data types that we looked at and also the boolean and char are uh, classes we cannot use latent keyword with them because if I put here int you can see that I have an error that it says latent modifiers not allowed on properties of primitive types because uh, I'm not gonna get into much of details but what all we need to know to know is that uh, when uh, the int class and all the primitive types uh, which are classes, uh, at least uh, uh, at the surface, uh, when they are compiled, I think, they are uh, compiled into primitive types, so they are not compiled into classes. So um, this, I think, is the reason that uh, you, don't, uh, you can't use this latent keyword. But for uh, other classes, because a string is, uh, is a data type, but it's a special data type, as I said uh, in, a, in a previous, previous video, and uh, because of that, you can use the latent keyword. And you can use the latent, latent keyword uh, with other classes. So I can put here user, if you want. And it works, because user is also a class. It's this class that we define here. So uh, it's good to, to, to remember this. Now I'm going to end the video and uh, see you in the next video. But first, let's uh, press Ctrl G to have the code that we had previously. So uh, now I'm going to end the video and see you in the next video. 
So now it's time to start a discussion about companion object. But to do that, I'm going to delete the class that we have here. And I'm going to paste it inside our classes uh, file because we're going to need this class later in our videos. And I'm going to also delete this code because we don't need this code. And let's say that uh, let's create a class called calculator. It's not going to define any properties. It's just going to have a simple function called sum, which is going to sum two numbers. So we're going to define two parameters here. A is going to be an int, a B also an int. And it's going to return the sum. So we put colon at the end of our uh, uh, parenthesis for our function. We put int because this is what we're going to return. And we put curly brace and we type return a plus b. Or you can put this in a single body expression function. So you can put the code like this if you want. So you can put here, uh, you can also delete the type, you can put here equals. And this will work. But I'm gonna keep it uh, like this. Now, if you want to use this uh, some function that is defined in, in this. Uh, class calculator first you need to create an object with that class so we type here val i'm going to call it calculator and uh, i'm going to create here a new object calculator the constructor doesn't have any properties any parameters and if you want to to call that some function we need to use our calculator variable or uh, our calculator object or reference and we put that like we did in our previous video so use the dot notation so now we're calling the sum function on our calculator object that we created online too and we put and we call our function sum inside the parentheses you pass two numbers let's say five and ten and uh, let's capture this value that is returned by the by the function in a variable so let's put here uh, val result because that is going to return the sum of uh, 5 and 10 of course that you can put that in a println uh, statement if you want but I put it uh, in this elaborate way to to make um, more clear what we're doing and here I'm going to type println result so now if I run this code, you're going to see 15 in output in, in the console. So let's increase this. So we have 15. And uh, the way we did it is we created an object like we did so many times. Then we, on that object, we use the dot notation to call that function on that specific object, on this object. And that function uh, takes as uh, arguments, as, easy, as uh, values to its parameters, uh, to integers we pass 5 and 10 and then it returns this value and we retain we we capture that value in the result variable and then we output that value in the console and get 15 but um, if you think about the way we did uh, this thing uh, is uh, that the only way uh, we can call the sum function is by creating an object and then calling the function on that object but uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you have a calculator uh, class to call, to create every time through our code, every time you need to use the sum function to create an object throughout your code. A better way it would be if you could call that sum function somehow without declaring, uh, without creating an object and then using the, the object to call the function. And to, you, to do that, we need to use what is called a companion object. And to use a companion object, we go inside our class, we type companion object so we can press enter to fill in a companion object for us or you can type that then we put curly braces and inside the curly braces we put our code and in this case we're going to put our sum function now you, you're going to see something now we have an error here now this uh, function this sum function doesn't belong to an object to an instance that is created with the class calculator instead it belongs to the 
class itself and not to the not to any object that we create those uh, the variables and the function that are the functions that are declared inside the component object are also called class variables or um, class functions because they don't belong to they don't belong to a specific object that you create with that uh, with that class instead they belong to the class itself so you don't need an instance to call that function and uh, that uh, implies that we can't use it uh, with an object because it belongs only to the class and let's see how you can use it uh, using the class without creating an object we just type calculator dot sum and here you pass again 5 and 10 so we just use our name our the name of our class we put dot sum and now we can use the function without uh, then uh, without us needing to create an object and then uh, calling the function on that object so this is uh, very powerful because uh, you will need this in your code sometimes when you don't uh, it, it, it actually not, doesn't make sense to create an object every time you you call let's say a sum function for a calculator now we can uh, also retain that uh, value that is returning a variable also result put equals now we can print this in the console So we get also 15, but this time we didn't create uh, an object, we didn't create a new instance and we call that we call the sum function on that object. We just type the calculator class and we call that function on directly on the class. All right, so this is how you can use the companion uh, object. And this is also true for a variable. So if you put a variable here, let's say uh, max and you put an arbitrary number here, let's say 100, we can call this variable also by typing calculator the name of the class that and have our max variable uh, like uh, in contrast with uh, how we did uh, the how we called uh, the properties in the past by creating uh, an object and using that object to call that uh, property on that object in this case we just use the class and we call the the variable and this also can be can be useful if you have some uh, constants to which you want to use in or uh, throughout your code so let's delete this so you can use also with variables and if you think about uh, uh, at our uh, one of our first lessons about uh, the data types when you look at the minimum and maximum value i i type something like this val max and i uh, to get the maximum value i type int dot max value and this is using also a companion object because as you can see the integer class because the primitive types are also classes at least on the surface not when they are compiled on the JVM they uh, also use companion objects like we have here to to get uh, to, to get the properties and uh, to get uh, the functions because we don't we didn't, we didn't create an instance of our integer uh, of uh, with our integer uh, class and then call that uh, max value on the object in fact if you hold control on this integer uh, class and if you actually hover over it and after you hold control it says public companion object of int so if you hold control and if you press and uh, if you press click now it will open this prim primitives.kt file and inside primitives.kt file you have uh, our uh, int class and you have a companion object and inside the companion object we have this uh, public constant value we're gonna look at the constants in the next but the point here is that uh, it's using the companion object to to declare is declaring the, the this minimum value the maximum value inside the companion object so that you don't need to create an instance an object every time you need to use them so this is our discussion about companion object and uh, see you in the next video i'm gonna close this file now and if you, you want, you can, look, you can look in that primitives file if you want. Just take a look, uh, look at what is there. So see you in the next video.
So now it's time to start a discussion about singleton. But first I'm going to copy this code, I'm going to copy this class with the companion object and I'm going to paste it inside the classes file. And um, if you don't have this code, this code because you create a new project, just type the code that I'm going to type in a second. So let's delete the code inside the main function. Now, what is a singleton? A singleton is a design pattern in Kotlin with which you want to have only one instance of a particular ob object. So you want to have only one instance of a particular object and you want to have that instance available globally throughout your program. So you don't need to create uh, an instance uh, every time you need to use uh, that, uh, that object uh, in a different part of your code. And there are uh, practic practical reasons for having only one instance of a class. Let's say that you have a database. You want, to, you want to have only one instance of that database which creates uh, the database, which gets the data and so on. Because if you have uh, multiple uh, instances, if you, able, you are able to create multiple uh, objects with that class, then you will have multiple databases in your uh, phone or in, on your PC. And that is not uh, good because uh, you are uh, uh, using um, more memory than uh, you should and uh, you have uh, duplic du duplicated uh, duplicated and unnecessary co code. So to solve that, what you need to do is to create only one instance of a particular class. And uh, having this uh, example in mind, uh, this is what you're going to do uh, next. And first I'm going to show you how we, uh, we, we did uh, in the past, how we created uh, an, uh, a singleton without uh, having the object uh, keyword. So we go down here. And uh, first we're going to create a singleton in the old way. So we type here class, we're going to use our example database, not going to create a real database. We're going to just use this, this as an example. And to make to restrict the creation of instances with this database class, we need to make the constructor private. So we type private. And uh, when uh, you use an access modifier with a primary constructor, you need to use the constructor keyword. Other, otherwise, we'll have an error. So. If I delete the constructor keyword here, I have an error which says use constructor keyword after uh, modifiers of, of, of primary constructors. So you put constructor and inside the, inside the class. Now, because uh, we cannot create instances of this class, uh, that means that we cannot uh, access any of uh, the properties or the functions of this class and to, to, to have access to a function which is going to return uh, an instance of this class you need to use uh, a companion object because with companion objects you can uh, have uh, properties and uh, functions being uh, allowed to be, to be accessed outside of the class without creating an instance. And here we type again the private access modifier we call this instance and it's going to be a database, a nullable database. Should be var there. Instance database and as I said, nullable, so we can uh, assign null to it. Then we define a function called get instance. And this function is going to return an instance of our instance of our database uh, class only one instance, only one single instance, not multiple instances. And to do that, first to check to see if the instance is null. So if this is the first time that we want to access uh, this uh, instance, then it's going to return true. If not, it's going to return false. So we ch check to see if it's equal to null. If it's equal to null, so our instance hasn't been initialized, you know, type instance equals to database. Right, so if the instance is equal to null, that means that the instance has been initialized, we initialize the database. So we can initialize the class inside the class, we cannot initialize it outside. Else, so if uh, this condition fails, the, the, the code below is going to be read, else we're going to return the instance. So if the instance is not null and this, uh, this code uh, is not going to be uh, uh, this condition is going to be false and the code will not be executed inside the if is going to we're going to return the instance but here we go, you should uh, return the database 
and it should be a nullable database. Alright, so our error disappeared. Let's delete this. Let's press Control Alt L. Alright, now how are we gonna use this? First, we type here val instance and put equals and we type database dot and now I'm gonna use our function get instance. And uh, if we we print this uh, instance in the console, so we type here instance. If you run this code, so now we're calling the fun gets instance inside the component object. We get this uh, code. This, this code represents um, the location memory of uh, the instance. So we have this code here, and uh, if we try to instantiate this uh, class so we put here the constructor if we do that then we get an error because the constructor is private so we cannot create an instance and um, when we call the get instance uh, function so when we did this it first checks to see if the instance was uh, equal to null and it was equal to null then it created the instance and then it returned the instance but if you call this uh, function again, so let's call it instance2 equals database that get instance. Now this will evaluate to false because uh, the instance uh, is not equal to null. We have uh, an instance and it's going to come down here and it's going to return the instance, the already created instance. So if I put a println here and I'm going to output the instance2 you're gonna see that there is no instance to you have the same instance because it's you it's returning the already creating created instance so we have the same co code here meaning this translates to that uh, you have the same instance so no matter how many times you use database like it instance if it's the first time then it's gonna create the instance and it's gonna return the instance if you call that uh, again like we do for instance 2 then it's gonna return the already created instance so in this way you have the same instance no matter how many times you you call the get instance function because it will uh, always return the same instance because we um, because of our logic that we cre created here but there is a shorter way to achieve the same thing by using the object uh, keyword and uh, this is what we're gonna do next so let's close this. Now let's see how we can create uh, a singleton and which is going to have the same uh, behavior that we created here. So it's going to be only one instance using the object keyword. So I'm going to type down here object. I'm going to call it database. Now let's delete this code because we cannot have uh, two objects which have the same name. And uh, we cannot have a constructor here because uh, it's a singleton. So we put only curly braces. You can have properties and functions inside the singleton created with, you, with the object key. So let's delete that code inside the function, function too. So uh, now by just typing object database, now we have the same thing that we had previously just by typing object and database. So this will, will, will always return the same instance and we have only this code object and the name of uh, the object. So the, the, uh, and the instance of um, the object is going to be created the first time you call it. And we can put an initializer block to have some code to be executed here. So let's put a println, let's say uh, let's say database created and to you to use this just type let's put a println and you type database and now if you run this and the first time you call the singleton th that time the singleton is gonna be is gonna be uh, created so we have database created then we have this code which represents the uh, string uh, is the string representation of the object and if you press ctrl d here look what happens 
we have database created so because this is only one instance this object is a singleton it calls the initializer block only once when it initializes itself so when we call the database for the first time it, it's initialized and it calls the code inside the init block and after that it only it uh, outputs this thing representation the second time we call the database we don't have database created because uh, the instance was already created and the initializer block is not uh, called again because we have the same instance so if you can press ctrl d here multiple times and you're gonna see that we have the database created with only one only one uh, once because uh, that is called only when the only when the object is created for the first time so on this line in the next line we have the same uh, the same object so we have here this this is why we have the same code because it's basically the same instance so as you can see this is a lot simpler and more concise than the code that we had previously so this is how you can create a singleton in um, kotlin this is how this is how we should do it so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about lazy initialization but first i'm going to copy this singleton inside our classes file and if you don't have this file because uh, you created a, a new project again just type the code that i'm going to type in a second so i'm going to delete this now what is lazy initialization lazy initialization is used when creating an instance when creating an object uh, is expensive and expensive in the programming context means that it will take some time it will use some memory and in that case it's uh, recommended to use lazy initialization and um, to illustrate the lazy initialization i'm going to use our user class so i'm going to copy our user class inside our uh, main file not because i can't create here an object uh, by ha having the file he here but because uh, I, uh, I want to put the code here to make uh, clear what i'm doing so i'm gonna delete the code from here and if you don't have the file just create a new class called user define the properties first name last name and age i'm gonna delete this because you don't need this and inside our user uh, class i'm gonna put an initializer, an initializer block which is gonna be called every time you create a new object and here we're gonna put a print l, print uh, print line statement which is gonna say user we're gonna call the uh, first name property so the val value that is passed to first name property was created so let's create a new object here let's call it user1 equals user now let's pass some values to the properties of the constructor let's say alex now if you run this code we get in the output user and the value for the, for the first name property alex was created if i press ctrl d and i change this to user2 and let's change this to a generic name user and for the last name let's pass just the last name text and let's keep that age so if i run this code now because now on the line 3 you create a new object the initializer block is going to be called again because we create a new object it says user user was created now to initialize our user 2 with the lazy initializer we just delete this and to, to illustrate how the initializer block works we delete this and we put after user 2 by so we put the keyword by and we type lazy and as I'm typing, you see that I have that block lazy. Press enter and uh, put the curly braces. And inside the curly braces, we create our object. So user. And here we pass the values to the properties. So let's put uh, user1. Let's pass last name. 
and for the age let's put uh, zero now previously when the user was initialized uh, in the old way we saw in the output user user was created so the initializer block was called when he created the second level but now if i run this code look what happens we get only our first object we get the initializer block only called for our first object and for our second object initialized using the lazy initialization we don't have uh, the initializer block because the object is not initialized is the object is only going to be initialized when you use that uh, object in your code so if you use that object uh, somewhere in a code the object de then is going to be initialized and it's going to be used so if i type here a println which says uh, user that first name user2 now if i run this now because i you i'm i am using the user2 object now the user2 object instance is going to be created and then i'm going to see user2 that first name so now we see user we see user1 was created so the initializer block was called because when we called the the println user to that first name Th then in that uh, at that moment it created the instance and then it outputted uh, user one so this is why now we see here user one one was created and previously we didn't because now we're using the user two object in our code so unless uh, you are not using the the instance the object that we have created using the lazy initializer it is not going to be initialized so uh, this is initializer uh, this is initialization by lazy so see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about enum classes but first i'm going to copy our user class inside our classes file now i'm going to delete this class and also i'm going to delete the code inside the main function now, what are enum classes? Enum classes are uh, used when you want to represent a fixed set of values. So, when you want to represent, when you want to create some constants, you should use enums because enums are like constants, but they are more powerful because you can they can have properties and uh, they can also have uh, functions. And enums are usually used in um, if conditioners or uh, in if statements or in uh, in the when statement or uh, if you want to call it the if statement expression or when statement expression now let's see how you can create an enum class and to create an enum class you just type here enum the keyword enum and as I'm typing I have some suggestions then we put class and let's call this uh, enum class directions direction actually then we put curly braces and inside the enum class direction we define our enum values so here we define north we put comma enter south you can put them in one line just to have comma between them east and west All right so we have our uh, enums values defined inside our direction uh, enum class and those enums values that we have here, here they are instances of our enum class direction so they are an instance they are an object created inside the enum class direction just that they have uh, this uh, different name and as you can see the name of the enum values should be all the names sh should be in uppercase letters now let's see how we can access those uh, enum values to access the enum values we can let's put the print line here we type direction then we press that and we have some not, some uh, suggestions here we have west east north and south so we have our uh, enum values suggested so let's uh, choose west and let's output this in the console So we get west. So this is the enum value west. And uh, let's press Ctrl D. 
let's change this to east so let's change uh, this to east let's change this to north and south now if you run this code we get our enum values west east north and south so this is how you can get the enum uh, the how you can get the enum uh, values that you define inside your enum class now we can also you can also pass uh, you can define a constructor here for our uh, enum class and define some properties like var let's call it uh, direction of type string and var distance and this is going to be an integer now if you hover over here you have some underlines and the underlines if you hover over it says that enum has not the full constructor so now because as i said those enum's values are instances they are objects created inside our enum class now we need to pass some values to the properties that we define here so let's pass some values here so let's press let's type here uh, first north and i'm going to speed up this now a little bit all right so now what we did here we pass some values to the enum values constructors because in in uh, up here uh, in our uh, enum class direction we define some properties and those properties because the enum values are uh, objects they are instances for enum uh, directions even though they have uh, those different names you need to pass to the constructors then uh, some value so you pass here north south east west and you pass for the, for, for the distance 10 20 50 and 40. now let's see how we can loop through our uh, enums uh, values and to do that we just uh, delete this code and what of and uh, here we add the for loop so we, we type for let's call it the direction in and here we type direction our enum class dot values and this is going to return an array with all the enum values that we define in our class now let's put curly braces and let's add a println and let's print that direction so now if you run this you'll see the same output but in the, the order that they are defined uh, inside the class so we see the same uh, not the same output because uh, they are outputted in the order in which they are defined in the class so we have north south east and west and this is how we can uh, loop through an enum to through the enum uh, values of an enum class so this is how we do it so now let's delete this code now if you want to access the arguments that are passed to our enum values constructors we just first put a println to output the values on the console and we type direction so our enum class that and we choose our enum value let's choose north and from here and uh, here now we type also that and now we have some suggestions we have direction distance and um, we also have name a name is a, is a variable which is not defined by us so we only define those properties direction and distance but name is a, a variable which is built in in the enum, enum class similar to the the uh, the direction that values which return the array is uh, the the direction that values values was also uh, property which, which actually it was uh, an array property which was built into the enum class so we didn't create that it's provided by the enum class so this is why we have that name there so let's put direction let's press ctrl d du duplicate this code and let's uh, change this to distance let's press ctrl d again and let's also print that name which is the built-in uh, variable which is the built-in variable uh, provided by the enum class so let's put here name now if we run this code 
get north, so this is the value that we pass here, we get 10, and then we get north with capital letters. So, so we get the values that we passed here for direction and distance, which are defined in direction class. So we get the values passed for this specific uh, in, um, uh, value, and then we get uh, north. And this is the built-in uh, variable, which is uh, provided by you by the enum class. But as I said, you can also have functions. So let's have a function which returns the direction and distance. So let's type here fun. We call it print data because we're going to print the data of a specific enum uh, value. It's not going to take any input, put curly braces. But now we have an error here. And that is because uh, when you declare a function inside the enum class, you need to provide a semicolon for the last enum defined in your class. So you need to put here a semicolon and the error disappeared. And let's print the data here. Let's add the println. Let's put quotation marks. Let's put direction equals dollar sign direction. and distance equals dollar sign distance. Now if you call this on uh, our uh, on, on uh, enum value, let's type direction dot, let's say west dot, and now we have our function print data. So this print data function is going to print the data of the west enum that is defined here. So it's going to output west and 40 in the console. So you know, if you run this code, we get direction west and distance 40. So this is how you can use functions inside the enum classes. Next, let's see how we can use our uh, enum direction and generally how we can use enums with uh, the when statement expression. So I'm going to close the console. I'm going to delete this code and uh, the print data function works for uh, all, uh, all of our enum values. So let's delete this. And here uh, I'm going to define a variable. It's going to be a val. It's going to be called direction. I'm going to put equals and here we type direction, our enum class. Let's choose East. So now the enum uh, actually is no west. East. So now our uh, direction enum east is going to be stored in our direction variable. Let's use the when statement expression. And we type here when direction. Then we put curly braces. And here we type uh, uh, direction dot east, we're going to put arrow, execute this code. So print ln, the direction is east. And we'll do the same thing for the next one. So let's press Ctrl D. Let's change this to west. North and South. So this is how you can use uh, the enums with uh, the when statement. Now, if I run this, actually I should uh, change uh, the text there, but I'm going to change it. So let's ch close this to change the text here. Now, if you run this, you're going to see the dire direction is his because this condition is true. Our uh, direction argument here is going to match with this branch. So it's going to evaluate true and then it's going to execute this code. You can put curly braces if you want. But as I said in our discussion about the when statement expression, you should do curly braces if you have multiple lines of code. In our case, we have one single line of code, but you can put curly braces if you want. And of course that this branch will always evaluate to true because here we type direction that is 
uh, into our uh, direction variable literally directly and this value doesn't change but in a real app this value could come from a database or from the user input and in that case you need to use a function which is uh, also built into the enum uh, class and that function is called value of so we type direction that value of and this value of function check is checks to see if our uh, value that we pass here exists inside our uh, enum class so it checks to see if uh, it's defined here and it, all, it also returns that value so if I type here is now if I run this code we get an error which is no enum constant direction that is because all of our enum values have uh, they are uh, defined in uppercase letters but if I put here that uppercase and if I run this code now we get the direction assist and uh, this value that we have here is this value uh, as I said could come from a database or from the user input and dire direction that value of is going to check to see if uh, this uh, enum value exists in our enum class and it's going to return that value in our uh, variable so it's going to assign that value to our variable so, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about inner classes. So, what are inner classes? Inner classes are classes which are declared inside another class and they are generally used when you know that there is a very close relationship between two classes. So, when it doesn't make sense to put two classes separated, then you should use uh, inner classes. And let's look at an example. And we're going to imagine here that we have a list view and uh, this list, video, list view is going to uh, display some uh, uh, items in a list in on the screen and uh, here we're going to use uh, inner classes because for uh, displaying the each individual uh, item we're going to create a list view item so first we create a class called list view We create the primary constructor, we define a property called uh, items and it's going to be an array of strings. Now we put curly braces and inside the class we type the keyword inner then class and now we create a class which is going to represent the individual items in the list view so we type here list view item put uh, the primary constructor but we put uh, we, not, we don't define any properties and then we put curly braces and this uh, inner class list view is going to have a function called display item and it's going to display the value the values of uh, an item of uh, at, a, at a specific position so we put here position let's say we define a parameter to our function it's going to be an int and uh, we're just going to type here print line and the inner classes are uh, have access to the properties of the outer class so inside our inner class that we, that we have here we can uh, we can access the properties that are defined inside the outer class list view in this case we have a single property called items and here we can type items and notice that I can use the items property which is defined in our outer class list view we type position and this is going to return an item at this position which is passed as an argument here to to, to our parameter position and uh, we go up here and we type val list view because we're going to create an instance for list view type list view now we need to pass an array to our uh, primary constructor to the property item so we type here array of and we define some generic names here let's say uh, name uh, one And name for now 
how can uh, we access the display uh, item function which is inside our inner uh, class uh, uh, list uh, item list view items this sh this should be list view item not items so let's change this go right click on it and go to, to refactor and rename let's call it the uh, items press enter now to access the display item function which is inside our inner class list view item we type list view so our instance our object uh, list view dot list view item and then again dot and now we have our function display item and uh, we can uh, pass here let's say uh, let's say uh, Two. Now, if you run this code, so we get an output name three, and this is correct because name three is the at the index two. And uh, this is how you can access the, the display. How this how you can access generally a function inside an uh, in, inside the, an inner class. You just create the, an instance of the outer class. Then you call. Uh, you call the name of the class of the name of the inner class and then you call the function or uh, so see you in the next video so now it's time to do a challenge using the knowledge that we have about object oriented programming and the challenge is to create a class which is going to represent a bake account of a person and uh, this uh, class is going to have uh, three properties the first one is going to be called the account name the second one is going to be called the balance and uh, the third one is going to be called transactions and uh, it should be a mutable list. Also, you should uh, create uh, functions for deposit and uh, withdraw and also a function for calculating the balance. And uh, you, also, you also should add the, the checks for checking to see if the amount uh, is uh, when you deposit the amount is greater than zero and all of that stuff. So do this challenge and then uh, watch my solution. So, my solution is this. I'm gonna create a class and uh, for this uh, challenge you should also have in mind uh, the discussion that we had about uh, access modifiers. So, I'm gonna call it account and I'm gonna define here a property called, uh, gonna be called val, it's gonna be called account uh, name and it's going to be of type string of type string and we put curly braces and inside the class I'm going to declare the next uh, two properties and uh, those one are, uh, first I'm going to declare it without the access modifiers because IntelliJ probably is going to figure out that uh, we need to put access modifiers on them. So I'm going to type var balance and uh, I'm going to assign zero to this with the default value and uh, var uh, transactions and this is going to be equals to a mutable A mutable list of int because this this is going to store the transactions so these are the three properties of our class now I'm going to create the first function which is going to be called deposit and this function is going to be used to deposit uh, money inside our uh, bank account and it's going to have a parameter called amount it's going to be of type uh, int and first we need to check if this amount is greater than zero because we don't want to deposit a, a negative value. So if amount is greater than zero and we choose greater than zero because we also don't want to deposit zero. So this is why I put greater than zero. Then if it is greater than zero, then we're going to add that to our transaction uh, list that add amount and uh, then I'm going to say balance I'm going to update our balance. I'm going to put plus equals amount. Then I'm going to add the print line, which is going to say, I'm going to put uh, quotation marks, dollar sign, 
I'm going to type amount. And I'm going to put dollar sign this dot balance. So I'm going to output in the console what is the balance. But if the amount that is passed to this uh, function is a negative sum, I'm going to go in the else part and I'm going to say, I'm going to add the print line here which is going to say cannot deposit uh, negative sums. So I'm going to put here ca cannot deposit negative sums. So this is our uh, deposit function. Next I'm going to create another function and this is going to be called withdraw and this is going to be used for withdraw withdrawing money. So we type fun withdraw and uh, we put parentheses and this is going to take a parameter called with uh, draw wool so uh, it should be like this and it's going to be an integer we put curly braces now it should be with with here with 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 draw now we need to convert this into a negative sum because now we are uh, withdrawing money from our account. So first we need to check if and I'm going to put minus because I'm going to convert this into a negative sum. Withdrawal is less than zero. So if this is a negative uh, sum, which is going to be withdraw, I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to add to our transactions this transactions that add and you also put the minus and so you put minus with draw because now we're adding well, now we're uh, we are uh, taking money out of our account then we're gonna put this that balance my uh, uh, plus equals minus withdrawal because now we're taking money and then we're gonna add uh, again a print line it's going to be this one, so I'm going to copy this. But the, now this is going to be the withdraw. Else, if uh, this is not uh, a negative sum, so I'm going to put else. I'm going to type print line cannot with draw negative sum so if he tries to withdraw a negative sum then we're going to say cannot withdraw a negative sum here we put the minus because we we're taking money out of uh, our uh, account, so we need to check for uh, this. Why we're checking here if it's less than zero? Sh should be negative here. And we're gonna create another function, and this is gonna be called calculate balance. So we type here fun. Let's uh, bring this fun calculate calculate balance this is not going to take any parameter and it's going to return an int we put curly braces and I'm going to put this that uh, balance to zero because I want to calculate the balance so I'm going to add the, the transactions to this uh, property balance so here we're gonna say and here we're gonna loop we're gonna type for transaction in our list of transactions so for transaction in our list of transaction we're gonna type this that balance plus and equals transaction so our transaction and then we're going to return uh, the balance at the end of uh, our loop when we end we ended uh, looping so return this dot balance so this is our solution to the challenge and let's uh, 
let's create an account and let's pass some values here. So I'm going to type here val alex account and I'll put equals account I'm going to put now I'm going to call the primary constructor so I'm going to type here alex I'm still, use, I'm still using my name here but so I'm going to type here alex account dot deposit so I'm going to deposit let's say 1000 and uh, I'm going to type Alex account that withdraw. I'm going to withdraw 500. Then I'm going to put Alex account and I'm going to put uh, deposit uh, negative sum, let's say minus 20. And Alex account that, uh, that withdraw also negative sum, let's say minus. Uh, 100. Now, if you run this code, we get 1000 deposit, balance is now 1000, so we have our call card uh, called from our uh, deposit function. Then we have uh, So I should I didn't change the text here. So this why is saying uh, this sh sh should say with uh, with drone. So uh, sorry, let's change this to with drone. So let's run our code again. So we get 1000 deposit, balance is now 1000. Now we get our uh, correct output, we get uh, then 500 withdrawn. So we get our call, call from our withdrawn function. Withdrawn balance is now uh, 500. Then, I, then we get cannot deposit negative sums, cannot withdraw negative sums because we passed uh, negative numbers to our uh, deposit and withdraw function. And here we're uh, checking to see if uh, those are uh, negative or uh, positive. So this is our uh, solution to our uh, to our challenge, and I hope that you enjoy this and uh, that you solve this. And uh, this is not uh, again the best solution. This is just my solution. Probably you find uh, you figure out a better solution, or, or maybe a, concise, a better and a more concise solution than this. Actually, I forgot before we end our video, let's actually call also our calculate balance uh, function. So I'm going to type here uh, Alex account dot calculate balance and this is going to return an integer. So I'm going to type here val because that function returns something. So I need to capture that in a variable. So I'm going to type here val balance equals Alex account. So I'm going to add the print line here. And it's gonna say balance is dollar sign balance. Let's proceed per control L to format the code. Now, if we run this code, now we get uh, our previous output 1000 deposits, balance now 1500 withdrawn. Balance is now five, uh, 500, then cannot deposit negative sums and cannot withdraw negative sums, and then get balance is now 500. So our uh, code works uh, well. So this is our uh, code. One more thing that I forgot is that uh, I said at the beginning of the video that you should uh, have in mind the discussion that we had about access modifiers when doing this challenge. And uh, I forgot to uh, to add the access modifiers for balance and transactions because now what can I do for balance? I can use our uh, Alex account uh, accounts and I can type here balance and now because that is uh, actually that is not really public because when we talked about uh, getters and setters we said that, that uh, when you access a property you always access, access that property through getter and setter so you never access directly the getter and uh, the property but uh, still you should uh, not make that uh, 
that uh, public be because by default if you don't provide an, an access modifier they are uh, they are by default public so if i type here now account balance as you can see i can call that and i can type here uh, 1000 and i can deposit uh, now i can change the balance of uh, the account directly from here and if you hover over here uh, intellij uh, figure out that you should make this private so make this private the balance and also the transactions because you don't use them uh, inside the primary constructor and they are uh, used only through the to the, the functions that we define here the because of that you should uh, you should uh, declare them as private because you use them only through the function that you declared inside the class so declare them as private and now you if you hover over here it says you cannot uh, access balance because it's private in account and now we cannot change the balance from outside the class we can only de uh, deposit or withdraw uh, 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 sums of uh, money from our bank account by interacting only with the functions and not by calling the property directly and uh, assigning uh, a new balance to to the property so make them private and this way you cannot uh, uh, you don't uh, you don't uh, access uh, the property outside of the class and you change their directly the the value of the property again it's not really directly because the code uh, that we had previously so this code actually is calling the setter here but still you can change uh, the value of uh, the balance but now because we made that private and uh, the compiler is smart enough to figure out that because they are uh, not declared inside the primary constructor and they are only used you only interact with them with uh, the deposit and withdraw uh, and uh, calculate balance function so we don't use them outside you don't have them also declared in the primary constructor it knows that you should make them private because you interact them only with the functions and now we have this underline because it's private so we cannot change this balance now from outside the class we can only interact them again using the functions. So I'm going to delete this and uh, now see you in the next video. So let's delete this. So actually I'm going to let it there because uh, it's uh, good to see. So now it's time to start a discussion about inheritance. So what is inheritance? Inheritance is the concept in the Kotlin programming uh, context with which you can create a class using another class. So in other words, you can get all the functions and properties that a, f that a class already has in your new class. And in addition to do getting all the functions and properties in, uh, in your new class, you can add some new functions, some new properties which are specific to this new class, but they aren't for the... Also, this, the class from which you are inheriting is called the base class, the parent class, or the super class. And you might be wondering, why is this uh, useful? Why you, you'll want to do this? Let's say that you have uh, a very big class which performs a very hard uh, task and has a lot of functions and code, and, but you want to create a new class which is slightly different from this class. What you can do is you can get all that code copied in the new class and then you can add your uh, new functions or new, your new behavior to, to this class. But that is not uh, uh, recommended because you have duplicated code. What you can do instead is you can inherit all the functions and properties which this big class already has and in your new class you can add the new functionality the new behavior which is specific to this new class but it's not for the base class so in this way you, you can uh, you, you you avoid the duplicated code and you increase the code reusability and uh, for that i'm going to show you an, an example and i'm going to create two classes one is going to be called car and uh, one is going to be plain so we create here a class we go down here we type class i'm going to call it car it's going to have uh, some properties the first one is going to be called name this is going to be the brand name of the car the second one is going to be color also a string engines the number of engines that this car has going to be an integer and val uh, this is going to be doors so it's going to store the number of doors all right we put curly braces because i'm going to add some uh, functions to this class two function actually fun move 
and uh, fun stop and here we're gonna say print line quotation marks dollar sign the name of the car is moving similarly down here in the stop we're gonna say the car has stopped car has has stopped and we're gonna create a, another class called plane which is gonna have also val name gonna be a string a val color also a string val engines an integer and the val doors an int put curly braces and we define those two functions I'm gonna copy those and I'm gonna paste it here so now what we did here is that we created two classes they both both have a uh, uh, properties for the primary constructors and uh, but as you probably already noticed we have the same uh, properties we have the name here we have the name there we have the color there we have the color here the color there the engines also we have here and there and we also have those functions which are almost uh, actually they are the same so we have what i said at the beginning duplicated code so it doesn't make sense to put this code here another Another way to do this is to create a base class, a generic class called vehicle, which is, uh, and usually you create the generic class when you know that uh, several classes are going to share uh, those uh, properties and those behaviors. So a car and a plane, both are vehicles. So we can put here, instead of declaring the, the name and the color inside the, our uh, inside our classes car and plane you can put this in a, in a vague vehicle uh, class in a base class and we can inherit those properties in our classes instead of declaring them uh, inside our uh, car and uh, plane class so we can put here val name it's gonna be a string and uh, val color also a string now I can copy those two. Let's put curly braces here and I can paste it paste it here. So now I can delete those uh, those uh, two functions from uh, our classes. And what we can do now is we can inherit those properties. So we can delete those uh, properties that we have here. We can uh, you as you'll see you'll need to declare them as parameters but uh, they are not uh, they're not going to be as properties any they're not going to be as properties here now what we can do is that we can inherit this shared uh, those shared uh, functions and those shared properties because both the car and the plane have a, a function to move have a function to stop the baby they both share uh, a name they, they both share a color so they both share those properties and uh, functions but uh, as we did it previously is to put them inside the, 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 the classes so it's not, it's not good because we have a duplicated code. And in this way we put this code here and now we can inherit this code so we can have this code directly, you can, uh, you can have this code uh, being, uh, uh, being accessed inside the car and plane without declaring them in our classes. So. To inherit from a class, first you need to mark the class from which you want to inherit as open because by default they are they you cannot inherit from a class. So if I and to inherit from a class, we go at the in closing parentheses of our primary constructor. We put colon and we type the name of the class from which we want to inherit. And in this case going to be vehicle. Now, if you hover over here. It says that this type has a constructor and thus must be initialized here. 
and, and next you say this type is final so it cannot be inherited from and that means that we cannot inherit from this class unless we mark this class with the open keyword in front of uh, it so we need to put here open and now if we hover over here now we don't have uh, that error we only have this error which says this type has a constructor and thus must be initialized here and that basically mean means that it says hey i'm trying to use this vehicle uh, class i'm trying to but in order to use it i need i need to initialize this vehicle uh, class so we need to pass some values to the constructor the primary constructor that is defined here you need to pass some values to the name and to color and to do that we define here name we type name actually that let's press ctrl z let's put a space and we type name we put uh, comma then we type uh, color and notice that we don't have the var or the val keyword in front of them that is because they those uh, those parameters that we have here because they are parameters because they don't have the var or the var keyword they they uh, they 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 have to be declared only as parameters because the properties are uh, going to be declared and they are declared by the primary constructor of the base class from which we are inheriting from <laughs> and because of that we don't uh, we, we don't we don't need to declare the property again here as you can see if i put the var keyword we have an error says name has uh, anyway that means that we cannot have the property declared here because the property is uh, already declared inside the base class inside the vehicle class from which we are inheriting from what we can do here is define the parameters and uh, the value that is passed to those parameters to so the primary constructor of the class cars are going to be passed to the to the vehicle primary constructor so here we put the primary constructor so we put two parentheses and we type name and this name is this one from here so we type name then we put comma because we need to pass a value for the second one for the color and we type color and this color is this color here so we type color now if uh, you go up here let's say for, let's look first as the actually let's also inherit uh, from uh, inherit inherit uh, also on in on the plain uh, class so we put colon also here we type vehicle and now uh, we need to also to define here the parameters the name and the color so we type name and uh, as I'm timing, you can see that IntelliJ has given us some hints. So if I type here color, it says that color string. So it's very helpful. Put colon. We pass those values to the primary constructor of the base class. So we type name, color, and now if I go up here and I create some instances of our uh, car and plane class. So we type here val car. Let's put equals let's type car let's choose for the name uh, bmv and uh, for the color let's say red for the engines one for the doors four now i'm going to create also an object with our plane so let's press ctrl alt to format the code val plane equals plane so our class we type here uh, for the name uh, Boeing for the color let's say oh, white and blue and um, for the engines four and for the doors let's say also four now if i go down here and i type here car dot if you look here you said you see that we have the function stop and the function move but we didn't declare them here we deleted them previously but because we are inheriting from the vehicle class because 
when you are inheriting the properties and the functions from the class from which you are inheriting from are part of the new class so they the the move function and the stop function they are now part of our car class similar the same in the same uh, is, uh, the same here the the the, the move and stop are uh, are part of the class plane so if i type here car dot move and car dot stop and then plane dot move and plane so look i then now i can call them like they are uh, declared inside the, our uh, car and plane but they are not there but they, because we are inheriting they are part of uh, the class so you can think of uh, you can think of this thing that we have here as a single entity so it acts like a single entity so now if you run this code we get in the output BMW is moving BMW has stopped bearing is moving bearing has stopped and uh, this uh, we get this output because as i said those functions are part of our classes and uh, they are using the name so in this case the name that is passed to the car this name that we have here bmw is passed to the to the primary constructor of the base class and then it's used here so it's calling the move and say bmw is moving so in the same way for the for the plane we get the same output it gets the value that is passed here Boeing and then it outputs Boeing is moving and Boeing has stopped but we can do even more we can override those functions inside our class so we can create a version which is inside the base class from which you are inheriting we can create a version of this function which is specific to the car or which is specific to the plane and I'm gonna look at that uh, so now I'm going to override the move function from our base class vehicle inside our plane class because I want to make the move function specific to the plane class. So I want to provide I want to provide an, an implementation of the move class which is specific to a plane. So how a how a plane is moving? A plane is moving by flying. So I'm not satisfied with only this generic function which says the name of the vehicle is moving. And to override the function, you first need to mark mark the function similar to to the class we need to mark it with the open keyword so we type open because Kotlin wants to make things explicit so we put open and now we can uh, we can uh, we can override that function inside our plane class so we go to, to, to override the function we go to code generate and here we have vehicles and hash code to string and we go to override methods and you you have those equals hash code and to string and those are here because every class that you create in Kotlin is implicitly inheriting from the any class but we're gonna look at that on more more on that later because we'll look at that in a different video and we have our function move and stop so the 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 IDE is telling us that the, those are the functions which can be overridden inside our plane class from our uh, vehicle base class. So we choose move, we press OK, and uh, you have this uh, super that move. We're gonna see immediately what is this, and you can also override it by just uh, typing the keyword override, and you can override the function. So you can type here override. And while uh, I typing, you see that we have this override fun, move, stop, or and have also those. So we choose move, and now we have the same thing. Now, super that move means that call the function. So super means call something from our base class. In this case, call the move function from our base class. So we're gonna let that here, but in addition to that, we're gonna add a new function. So we're gonna type here fun flying because the plane is flying and uh, we're just gonna have a simple print line which is gonna say I'll put quotation marks let's bring this down a little bit the plane is flying so now I'm gonna call this function flying inside our uh, move function which was overridden so we type 
flying flying now if we run this code look what happens If you look in the output, we get BMW is moving, BMW has stopped. And then we get the, pli the plane is flying, and then we get Boeing is moving and Boeing has stopped. So what, what has happened here now, because we were, when this function move is called here on uh, our object plane created, now it's using our own implementation of the move uh, function. And uh, after that, so it's using our own implementation, it's calling the flying function that we created here because a plane uh, is moving in a specific way, it's flying. And then it's calling super.move. And super.move is uh, calling the function from the base class. So it's calling the function from here. So by doing this, we made our function specific. We make, uh, we make the We made the function move specific, we make the function move unique to the plane class because the plane is moving in a specific way and we can do the same thing uh, for the, the car class. So uh, now you may be wondering why why I didn't declare the inside our uh, base class the engines because they are also present in, the, in both uh, classes. Because when you create a generic class you should uh, only include the commonly used functions commonly used and shared functions and the properties. So uh, all, uh, all vehicles have a name and a color, but not, not all vehicles have engines. So this is why I put the engines here. So in addition to the name and the color, which all vehicles have, we added some new properties which are specific to a car. Similar here. In uh, addition to the name and the color, which all vehicles have, and we inherited that from our class, we added also engines and doors, which uh, those things are in addition, they are specific to a plane. And uh, more, we also override the move function because we're not satisfied with the with a simple move function from our uh, base class to include, the, to provide our own implementation of how a plane is moving. So. You can see that by using an uh, inheritance and adding new properties, adding new function, you can uh, create more uh, specific classes. You, you can in, uh, inherit. Uh, you can also inherit from the car class to create a more specific class. You can create a Tesla uh, uh, class and so on. So this is what inheritance is, and uh, see you in the next video. So I thought that's a good idea to show you another example with inheritance, and I'm gonna go down here. And I'm gonna define a class, I'm gonna type the keyword class, and I'm gonna call it view. And this view is gonna represent a view in uh, which is used in Android. And uh, a view in Android is just a rectangular area on the screen, and it's responsible for drawing and event handling. But you're gonna mimic, as I said, uh, what a view is in, a, in a Android. You're not gonna create a, a view like the one that is in use, like the one that's used in Android. And we define the primary constructor, but we're gonna not uh, define, we're not gonna define any properties to the primary constructor. And this view is gonna have a simple uh, function called draw, and it's gonna be responsible for drawing this view on the screen. So we type draw, and uh, we create a function, and we're gonna add a simple, a simple print line here, which is gonna say drawing the view. So we put here quotation marks, drawing, the view and uh, we're gonna mark this uh, class as open because I want to inherit from it and we're also gonna mark the function open because I'm gonna override that function in the in the next class and uh, because this is a, a generic view and is gonna have this draw function only this function what you can do let's say that I want to I don't want to create a simple uh, a simple view which is just a rectangular area on the screen but I want to create something more specific let's say that I want to create a button in that case instead uh, of uh, creating the button the button uh, from zero because this view in Android has a lot of functions and uh, properties which are responsible for creating the view for uh, uh, handling the events and so on so 
because here you have only a simple function, but the, the real view has hundreds of functions. And instead of creating uh, our button from zero, we can just inherit from the view and we can inherit all the functionality that the view already provides to create a generic view. And we can add some unique characteristics, characteristics which are specific to a button. And in, th in this, in this uh, way, we increase the code reusability and it's more easy for us to, to create the button than rather than creating the button from zero because the view already provides all the tools that you need to create the generic view. Only we are going to inherit all that uh, behavior, all that properties, but I'm gonna, but we're going to change it a little bit. So this is what we're going to do with uh, inheritance. So we create a new class called button. So we define the primary constructor and here you can define now some properties which are specific to a button, not, not just to a generic view, which is a rectangular area on the screen. So we put val text and this is going to be a string. So our, bu our button will have a, a text which can be login or sign up. And uh, also it's going to have uh, orientation because it's going to be uh, on, on a place on the screen on a specific place on the screen and uh, this is going to be a string. Of course, you just only mimic, only mimic the uh, view and button which are uh, are uh, used in Android. This is why we have so many uh, we have so little properties and only a, a simple function function in our view draw. And we put uh, here colon to inherit from our view because I want to inherit all that functionality, all that uh, 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 properties that a view provides, but I want to just to change it a little bit to make it more specific. I want to make a button. And uh, of course, as I said, this is just uh, uh, an example we don't have, but in a real uh, in a real app, this will have uh, hundreds or thousands of lines of code. And we can inherit all of that behavior or that functionality in our uh, new, new view, which is a button, but we can override some functions and you can provide some, uh, you can create a more specific view than a generic view. So here you need to uh, define the primary constructor and you put uh, curly braces. Now I want to override the draw functions so that when the draw, when the draw function is called, I want to not drawing just a generic view, but to draw um, a button. Of course, as I said, this is just an imaginary example. So you type override fun draw and instead of calling the super uh, function which is inside our uh, our uh, base class view or parent class view I'm gonna type here print line and we're gonna put the text drawing the button of course and now what we did here, we created a generic view, as I said, and again, this can have what, hundreds of maybe thousands of lines of code and functions and different functions, different properties. But we, oh, we inherited from the view class and we added some new functionality. So instead of just drawing a generic view, now, of course, we just add a simple print line here. But here we can have the code which is going to be responsible for drawing a, spe a button. So it's going to be more specific than a simple generic view. So you can put here, uh, here is the code for creating the button. So I'm gonna put uh, a comment there. And let's say that um, now I want to create a, run, a round button. So instead of creating again, all that functionality which uh, which is present in the view and then uh, create and then uh, use and then creating all the functionality which is uh, inside the button, the button class, we can make this button uh, open and we can inherit all the functionality that the button provides. And we're going to add something new, something unique to this class that we're going to create. And this class is going to be a round button. So we type here round button. And uh, here we need to define the text because we're going to inherit from the, for the, from the class button orientation and notice that I don't use the var or the val keyword here because they, they, they're going to be only parameters because the properties, the actual properties are going to be, are going to be um, ultimately uh, declared in the button class. 
And uh, one thing which is going to be specific to a round button that you're going to create is going to be corners. So we type val corners. It's going to be an integer because uh, the, co the corners basically here we're going to pass a value which is going to in our major example, this is going to reach, receive a value which can be uh, in degrees. So how many degrees do you want to, how many degrees do you want to make uh, the buttons? By how many de degrees do you want to make the button round? So you can pass here 20 or 30, anyway. So we put colon here and we inherit now from our button class, right? And here we need to pass the text, the orientation. And uh, that's all. And we put curly braces. Now let's override the draw function in our round button because when that function is called, now I want to add some specific code, some new functionality which is specific to a round button. So it's not gonna uh, draw uh, a, just a button, but it's gonna draw a round button. So we, of course, we're just gonna add a simple print line there. But um, in a real app, you can put here the actual code which is gonna draw the round butter. So we put here print line and we put drawing the round button. Now let's create some uh, instances. Let's create some objects with those classes. And we type here val view. So we're gonna create our generic view. We define the primary constructor. We don't have to pass any values there because we didn't define any properties inside our view. Then we create a button. So we put here val button equals button. And here we need to pass some values. So I'm gonna pass here the text, let's say login. The orientation, let's say, uh, it's going to be a text here, so we put here, let's say, center. Next, we create a new a new object, but this is going to be now a round, bu round button. So we put here round button equals round button. And we pass the text here, round button. Actually, let's pass the text uh, sign up. And uh, for the orientation, let's put uh, center also. And oh, you need to pass also value from, for the corners. Let's put, uh, let's say, 30 degrees. It will be in our uh, imaginary example. Now, let's call the, func the function draw on uh, all of our uh, objects that we create. So we type view dot draw. Then we put button dot draw and round button dot draw. Now if you let's press control Z if you run this code So we get in the output, drawing the view, then we get drawing the button, drawing the view again, drawing the round button. And let's uh, think about why we have this uh, output. So first, we, s we see that we have drawing the view, which is uh, the function inside our view that we created here. So it's from the generic view, so it's drawing the view. Then we have drawing the button. So here, when this line of code is uh, Red it says drawing the button. So we have uh, we have our uh, we have our code which is you know which is which is just a print line. But uh, so is, this is drawing the the button. Then it's calling the super uh, function. So it's calling the function inside the view, which it says drawing the view. Next, when uh, this line of code uh, is red, so round that round button that draw. Now it's calling the draw function which is inside the round button so instead of just now calling the 
because now we, we are he inheriting from the button class. Now uh, we override this function here and, and it's, it's uh, using our implementation for creating a round button. It's uh, executing this line of code and then it's calling the super implementation which is drawing the button. You can actually remove this if you want because you, let's say that uh, uh, calling the code inside uh, from the button is not uh, gonna affect our uh, logic. So if I delete this, now if you run this code, now we have uh, drawing the view, drawing the button, and we have drawing the view, drawing the round button. So now it's not calling here the super, so it's not ca it's not calling the code which is inside the first the button because we are inheriting first from the button, but, but the button is also inheriting from the view. So it's calling first this, then it's calling draw, which is inside here, and we had the drawing the view. But now we only have drawing the round button because here, now it's using our own implementation of the draw. So we have drawing the round button. So by this, just by, by making our uh, view, because as I said in the real app, this view is, can have hundreds of maybe thousands of line of code of different functions and properties. So you don't want to create all of that from zero when I want only to, let's say, I want to create a button. I can't inherit, I can inherit from the view, which already provides all the functions and properties and logic to create a generic view, but I can override some function which are responsible, let's say, for like this draw, and uh, I can Ex I can uh, define some logic and when uh, all of that functionality is called, it's gonna not draw only a generic view, but it's gonna draw a button. So by inheriting from the view, we increase, uh, we increase code, the code reusability. And uh, this is very, very powerful because let's say that, uh, like in our example, you want to, you don't, you're not satisfied with a simple button which is used in Android and you want to create a, a round button. So instead of creating all of that logic from zero, you can just inherit from a sim uh, simple button. You can have override some functions. And uh, when, uh, when you execute that code, now it's gonna execute the code with the implementation, with the additional implementation, uh, the, with the additional code, which is, which is gonna generate a round button and it's just, not just a simple button. So, this is our uh, this is our discussion about uh, inheritance. I hope that this clarifies some things, and uh, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about seal classes. So often you want to represent only a fixed set of possibilities. So a web request can either succeed or it can fail. A user can be a standard user or a pro user. And in those cases, you may be thinking now that we can use enum classes, but enum classes have some limitations. And let's see why uh, you should use instead seal class. So let's type main. I'm going to create an enum class here, call it uh, result. And uh, let's put curly braces. Let's type here success. and uh, error. Now, the problem with this is that we cannot m encode more information here. So let's say that I want to 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 define here a non-resolvable error and a resolvable error. And uh, I cannot do that here. So if I type here x dot exception, I can do, I cannot do that because uh, uh, the, the 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 types that we define here cannot have uh, properties, so you, you cannot define uh, this here. And for that, we need to use seal classes. And to use a seal class, we just type seal class. I'm gonna call it result. It's gonna have a parameter called val message. It's gonna be of type string. And you can define uh, your uh, classes which are gonna inherit from the seal class either outside the seal class, so you can type here class, let's say success, and uh, let's type here uh, me message of type string, and we can inher inherit from the seal class, so you can type here uh, result message, or you can copy this, and you can define it inside the enum class, so 
you can have it as an SC class. So I'm going to type another class here called uh, error. I'm going to define the parameter here. Actually, not that is the parameter message. And I'm going to define the parameter here. Message. I'm going to inherit from the result. You know, from the results class. I'm going to pass that parameter here to the parent class. Now, I'm going to define a function down here called get data fun. Get data, and it's going to have uh, a parameter called uh, result going to be of type result and here we're going to define a when statement so we type when and to type result and now is the interesting part now if you hover over this underline over when it says when expression must be exhaustive add necessary is error comma is success branches or else branch instead so in other words, what is saying here by uh, to, to have the when uh, statement exhaustive is it's, it's what it's saying in other words is that it needs to cover all the possibilities. So both possibilities that we have here. And you can type yourself this or you can uh, click on here, click on this uh, right bulb and you can click here add the remaining branches. And as you can see, it's added the remaining branch. So you add is result that error and is result the success and those are exhaustive those are the only two possibilities which are which are possible so here i'm going to type result uh, let's define a function inside the uh, seal class so i'm going to type here fun show uh, message it's going to have a print line which is going to say result dollar sign message so, and now I'm going to put that show message and also here result dot show message and now this is uh, this is uh, exhausted because now it, we co we covered all the possibilities which which are uh, inside the, which are, which are uh, as a consequence of the fact that we our classes are uh, inheriting from the seal class so if i add here a, an uh, else branch so if i put here else as you see, as you you'll see this is going to be redundant because we covered all the possibilities and the compilers know this and this can be very useful in some scenarios so if I put curly braces, as you can see, this is gray out because it's redundant because it knows that we covered all the possibilities and the possibilities are only those two result that error and result that success. So if I type here now val success, let's type success equals result, it should be a two yes there equals uh, result dot success let's type success here let's press ctrl d let's call this uh, error result dot, let's change this to error so this is how you create instances of the nested classes let's call this failed now let's type here get data down here get data and let's let's pass success and let's run our code now as you'll see the message 
result success. So we get result success in the output. So if I change now this to error, you will see that it says result error because it is executing this branch. So if I run this, you get result failed. Now the interesting part here is if I add here another uh, uh, possibility, so if I type here class progress and I type message string inheriting from result let's type let's pass the message parameter to the super class to the parent class now what what we have because our class is a sealed class what we have here is that the when is underlined and it's trying to say something to us it's saying that when expression must be exhaustive add necessary is progress so it knows that there is another possibility for uh, for our result uh, in which it can be therefore you need to add that possibility otherwise i'm going to show you this error and if you try to compile this code i'm going to throw an error so what what you can do here is can, we can type here is result to make it exhaustive so to cover all the possibility result that progress let's put the arrow result that show message and now if i create here another val let's so call this uh, progress equals to result that progress and let's define for the parameter progress here now if i change this to progress now you'll see in the output result progress. So we get result progress because now this branch is true. But if I let if I delete all of those, look look what happens. If I click here or is where you have those on un, uh, this underline it says add else branch so when expression must be exhaustive so it means that it, it needs to cover all the possibility possibilities add necessary is error is progress and is success so if you click here on more actions and if you click here on add remaining branches it it knows that those are all the possibilities on which uh, our result can be and it automatically generated the the check for us and you, we only just need to type here result that show message and that's all and with tnums you, you don't have this uh, auto generated uh, code for you because uh, result that show message let's type here and i'm gonna explain immediately so with with uh, an enum if you add another uh, so if you have uh, the, an enum class I can delete the code now here because but I'm gonna keep the code as it is and because all the subclasses of a seal class are known by the compiler the compiler can fill all the possible cases automatically for you. So if I declare this error class as a seal class and I declare two classes inside here called let's say class resolvable error so or recoverable error And uh, it's going to have a parameter called exception. It's going to be of type exception. This one. And we're going to extend from our error seal class. Not this one. This one. And we're going to pass the message parameter. And I'm going to declare another class. Non-recoverable. And it's gonna have an exception. So this is more powerful than uh, enums because you can uh, have all those properties and you can you can um, have subtypes and and uh, all of this. And with enums we cannot do this. So let's extend from error. 
let's pass the message and now we need to delete this because we cannot instantiate uh, the sealed uh, class so let's delete this now if I delete this now from here look what happens I have an underline and it says add it says when expression must be exhaustive so it must cover all possible cases that uh, that exists for this uh, cell class as necessary is not recoverable or is recoverable branches so if I click on this and I click on this bulb and I click here add remaining branches as you can see it added all the possible cases so all the possible cases that we define inside our seal class for us automatically and we just type here result that show message again here result that show message and you cannot uh, have this behavior with the non class so this is why uh, seal classes are more powerful because you can have uh, subclasses you can have uh, more information on the classes so you can have exceptions passed to them and so on so this is our discussion about seal classes and uh, see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about abstract classes and to show you what abstract classes are i'm going to use the code that we had uh, in our discussion about uh, inheritance but i'm going to change it a little bit so i'm going to delete for this class plane because you don't need this class and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna delete these instances that we have here, and uh, I'm gonna declare this as a var, and this also as a var. So they're gonna be now properties. I'm gonna delete the properties that we have here, and uh, now we have uh, this here. So I'm gonna delete this too. Let's delete this. Let's delete this. Now, what are abstract classes? Um, abstract classes are very similar to interfaces. Uh, the only difference is that in abstract classes you can declare properties which can have uh, a value. And uh, in, uh, in interfaces you can't. Actually you can, but you, you need to provide an, an access modifier. And uh, to declare an abstract class, we go in front of the class that we, I want to make it abstract and we type the abstract keyword. Let's put the class keyword. And now our, our class is abstract. And uh, with an abstract class, you cannot create instances. Abstract classes are created only to be inherited from uh, uh, by other classes. And now if I try to create an instance with this abstract class, like let's type val vehicle. And uh, we type vehicle here and we put the parentheses to call the, co the constructor you have an error here and says cannot create an instance of an abstract class so you cannot create an object with an abstract class an abstract class can only be inherited by another class and abstract classes usually are used like interfaces when you want to provide uh, what you need what needs to be done but you don't provide how it's going to be done so you can you need abstract classes are used when you define uh, f functions without the body and the code the body and the code is uh, it's uh, implemented it's provided by the class by the class which inherits from the abstract class so they are uh, as I say similar very similar to interfaces the only difference is that in abstract classes you can have properties so you can have here a val text and you can assign here some text in uh, in an interface you cannot do this let's type some text so this is the difference and uh, also uh, you I should say that uh, you can uh, implement many as many interfaces as you want uh, in a class but you can only inherit from a single class I, this uh, I forgot to say when I talked about uh, interfaces now if I want to make uh, if I want to, if I, to make uh, now our functions abstract, we just type the keyword abstract in front of them. And now uh, they are abstract and we do, we're going to do the same for uh, our stop function. But now we have this underline because, as I said, abstract functions like interfaces or uh, the functions which are defined in the interfaces cannot have a body. So we need to delete this, uh, you need to delete the body, you need to delete the curly braces because the actual body, the actual 
logic and the code is going to be provided by the class which uh, inherits from the abstract class. Now, to inherit from an abstract class, we go here, we put colon and we type the name of uh, the abstract class from which we want to inherit vehicle. Now, if you go out here, now we have this red bar which says, so we need to call the constructor here. Right, actually, I think I can delete this. But you still, you still need to call this uh, constructor here, even though we don't have any, any parameters, uh, any, even though we, we didn't even define the constructor here. Now uh, we need because, like the interface, the abstract class. If you inherit from an abstract class, and if that abstract abstract class has some abstract abstract functions defined in it you need to implement those uh, function inside your class. And you go here when you have this underline, if you, when you click on this uh, red bulb and it says implement members or uh, make car, uh, car abstract. And we click on implement members, we select our two functions, we click OK. And now we have uh, our functions implemented inside uh, our class. So this is what uh, abstract classes are and they are as I said very similar to interfaces but the only difference is that you can uh, define properties inside uh, an abstract class and you can provide the value to that uh, property and uh, here because we 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 have uh, inherited from our abstract class here you can provide the actual implementation of the functions so as you can see we have this to do which says not yet implemented so they are uh, they are very similar to interfaces so I'm going to end this video now and see you in the next video. But before uh, I end the video, I thought that it's a good idea to uh, to say to, to you where abstract classes and interfaces are uh, used. Uh, interfaces are used in many, many places, but uh, abstract classes are particularly used when uh, and also interfaces are used when you have some APIs and those APIs want to just to define the functions and the API is gonna generate the actual code for uh, for those function. So you can have a let's say a database, and you can provide the the name of the functions which are responsible for creating the database for uh, getting getting data from the database. But you don't provide the, the actual code which is gonna select that data from the database and return the data. You just you just declare your functions as 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 uh, abstract. And uh, the API is going to generate all that code which is responsible uh, for uh, returning the data and uh, from, the, in other words, the API is going to do all the hard work. You just, you, you, you just define the, the functions. If you have, uh, if you, let's say if you have a property, define an abstract class and the abstract functions or uh, interfaces and the API is going to do the hard work of, uh, uh, based on what your function is doing by reading the name of the function is going to generate uh, all uh, that code which you you you've ha you've had to generate if you do, if you don't have uh, if you not before the api to generate that for you so this is where uh, uh, interfaces uh, and uh, abstract classes are uh, sometimes uh, used and uh, interfaces also are used in uh, event handling and that is uh, when in, when um, uh, the you need to write code to, to respond to respond to respond to graphical using using your interface uh, uh, movements. So I'm gonna end the video now. See you next. So now it's time to start a discussion about data classes. But in order to understand what data classes are, we first need to understand what is the difference between structure equality versus referential equality. And to illustrate the difference, I'm gonna declare two variables. The first one is gonna be a val. It's gonna be called name one and we're gonna assign the value Alex to it. So it's gonna be of type string. Now I'm gonna press Control D to duplicate that line of code and to declare the second variable, which is gonna be called name two, and it's also gonna have uh, the value Alex. Now I'm gonna add the, the println here to output something to the console. And here we're gonna type name one equals equals name two. So the equals two operator is doing what is called is checking for structure equality because it's checking to see if the content of the variable name one is the same with the content of the variable name two. So in other words, it's checking to see if they have the same value and it's they have because both have Alex assigned to them. So now if I run this code, 
because this is a boolean expression this is going to return true or false and we're going to see in the console true but uh, if i change this to alexandro now the variable name to has a different value so this is going to return false because they're not structurally equal their content is different they have different values now we get false and this is called the uh, structure equality the next uh, type of equality is called referential equality and the referential equality is used when you want to check if two variables or two objects are the same so what uh, the referential uh, equality operator is doing is checking to see if uh, two as i said variables or uh, objects are the same so if i type here name uh, one and to use the, the referential equality operator, we put three equal sign here. And if I type here name one equals name one, so is name one equals to itself, that is gonna be true. So you're gonna see true in the console outputted. So we have true. But if I change name one equals 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 to name two, that is gonna return false because they are distinct objects in memory. They are different uh, variables they are uh, not the same there is the name one name one variable is not the same variable as name two so we're gonna have false here so we have false so this is the difference between a structural versus referential equality so now i'm gonna close this i'm gonna close the console and uh, having this in mind uh, we're gonna start our discussion about data classes so let's go down here and let's create our uh, user class because I want to compare two user objects to see if they are structurally equal. So we type user, let's uh, define the primary constructor and let's define three properties for the primary constructor, the first name, the last name and the age. Which is going to be an integer. Now, if I want to check if two user objects are uh, structurally equal, let's first create those objects. So let's delete this code. Let's type val user1 equals. Now let's create our object and let's pass some values to the properties of the constructor. Let's pass here Alex. For the last name, uh, let's put Dobin. And for the age, 23. Now let's press Ctrl D to duplicate that line of code and to create the second user object. Let's give a different name to this, user2. Now we go down here, let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. We typed our println because I want to check to see if our user's objects are equal, if they are structurally equal. So we type here user1 equals equals, so the equals to operator, user2. Now, if you run this code, what do you think you're going to see in the output? What you'll see in the output is actually that you'll get, we get false. And uh, you may be wondering why. Because if you think about it, they are structurally equal, they have the same values for the properties, but they are uh, distinct uh, objects. But uh, we, we said previously that the equals, equals, uh, two equals operator is checking for uh, structural equality. So why get false here? This is because previously the equals to operator is, uh, uh, you, it was checking to see if the uh, two strings are structurally equal and the uh, equals to operator is actually a function which is defined inside the any class and the string class, what uh, actually was doing when we call the equals to operator, it was using its own um, implementation of the equals method. So, uh, every class that we create in uh, Kotlin, it's using, it's implicitly inheriting from the any class. And because every class that we create, it's implicitly inheriting from the any class, uh, every class is also going to use the functions which are inside the any class. So if you don't override the, those functions inside your class to provide your own implementation, like the string class did for our strings, then it's going to use the implicit uh, the is going to use the function which inside which are inside the any class and uh, if you type here user one that and we have uh, equals to string and hash code those three but those three functions we are particularly interested in, and the particular we are interested inside the equals 
they perform uh, when you don't implement in inside your own class those uh, functions. Again, particularly on the equals class, the equals class performs only a referential equality. So it only checks to see if those two users are the same users. And if they're not, it's gonna, ret it's gonna return uh, false. So this is why you get false here because it's uh, calling the function, the function which is inside any class. So what you have implicitly is something like this. So for any class that you, you use or for any class that you declare, you have implicitly inherited from the any class. And because of that, you have those uh, three functions which are uh, defined. And if you don't override them to provide your own implementation, then it's gonna use uh, the code that's inside there. So actually if you press control here, and if you click, it takes us inside the any class. So it's clear that this function the equals function is inside any class. So be, because we don't have any functions here. So we need to override that function inside our class and we need to provide our own implementation. We need to define our own code to determine if uh, two user are, uh, when, uh, when two users are structurally equal. This is what we're gonna define inside our class. So um, let's delete this. Let's put the curly braces and actually I'm gonna bring an image to show you how the Kotlin hierarchy actually looks. So this is the image and at the top, as you can see, we have the any class and then we have our boolean class, our string class, and then we have our user class. And all of those classes that we have here, the boolean, the string, the number, they are inheriting from the any class. They are um, using the, the functions which are defined inside the any class and they uh, override the, they are overriding those methods inside them and they are providing their own implementation for uh, those uh, functions. And this is what you need to do also here. As you can see, they all uh, inherit from the any class implicitly. So we need to override them to provide our own implementation for the equals and for the next two, because we're gonna look at also at the, as you saw there, we're gonna look also at hash code because uh, equals and hash, hash code are very linked together and also the two string uh, function. So we need to override those uh, inside our class. So this is what we're gonna do. So we go inside our user class and here we need to override the equals function. When we type override and while I'm typing, you can see that we have three suggestions here and we select the user uh, function because this is the one that we are interested in. And as you can see here, this uh, function is part of the any class. So we press enter, we delete the super return. And the first thing that we need to check is to see if the current uh, instance, the current object that on which this uh, equals uh, function is called, it's comparing uh, with itself. So we need to check if the the if the object is the same uh, as the object that we are comparing with. And to do that, we type here, if this, so if this current object, this current instance equals equals, so three equals, we check for referential equality to see if they are uh, the same, equals other. So we type other. And if that is the case, if we are comparing the same uh, object, so you have user one equals user one, then we're gonna return true because that means that uh, we are comparing uh, with uh, the same uh, object. If that is not true, then the, the next thing that we need to check, we, we, we're gonna go down here. So if not, you're not comparing with, uh, it's not comparing with itself, then we need to check if uh, the other, so the object which is passed as an argument to this uh, function, which is called on uh, another object, we need to check if other, so the argument is user because we, we can uh, we need to check explicitly to see if this object which is passed as an argument to our uh, equals function is a user uh, object because we don't want to check for a different object we need we need to, to see if this is a user object so only if the um, object which is passed as an argument to the equals function is uh, a user object then we're gonna return true so here we need to type now we need to determine, we need to define our logic for what it means for two users to be equal. And uh, it's up to you how you define this implementation. I'm gonna type here only return. So I'm gonna, my logic is if they have the same uh, first name, the same last name and the same age, we're gonna uh, say that they are equal. We have uh, the same user. Of course that in a real app you can have a more uh, 
complex implementation. So we type here return this. So this current instance, that first name. So, and then we put two equals other. So if, so the other is because we check here explicitly to see if this is an user. The other is also because this condition is gonna only pass if uh, the other argument is an user. So we type other because we have access to the first name and the last name and the age. If other that first name, so this is our uh, first condition and this that this that uh, last name. So gonna check for the all uh, for our three properties equals equals other so other is a uh, user object because we determined that here that last name and this dot age equals equals age so this entire expression that is that we have here is gonna return through only or if all the our three conditions are true. If this that first name is equal to other that first name, so the, to, with the object that is passed as an argument to our equals, and if this that last name is equal to other that last name, and if this that age is, age is equal to the um, other that age, let's put here. Then and only then we're gonna have uh, true here, so it's gonna return true. Otherwise, if one of those condition fails, it's gonna return false. And down here we need to, if uh, other let's say doesn't pass, so if other is is not a user, we're gonna return false. So in that case, we're gonna return false. Now, if I run this code, look what happens. So previously we had uh, false, and now we have true here and uh, this is because now it's using the equals uh, function which is inside our uh, user class so it's using our own implementation so it's checked here to see if uh, uh, our uh, uh, if first name is equal to other that first name so it's checking uh, so it's using our logic inside the the, the equals uh, function so this is why you get uh, true and uh, you can also you can, now if you press, if you hold control here, as you can see now it's taking us inside the equals uh, method that we defined here. It's not taking it inside the any uh, class. This is because now it's using our own implementation. So first to check to see if we are uh, dealing with the same uh, object, then you're going to return true, you're not going to go any, any, you're not going to go down. And if uh, is, this is false, you're going to come up here, we're going to check to see if other, the object which is passed to our equals function is an user uh, instance, it's an user object, then we're going to check to see if uh, our uh, current object that we are calling on this equals uh, function is equal, uh, we check to see for the first name if they are, if they are if it's the same, we check to see if the last name is the same, and we check to see if the age is also the same. Then in that case, we're going to return true, and we're going to say that they are structurally equal, so we're going to see true in the output. Else, if other is not a user, so if you pass uh, to the function argument a different uh, parameter, a different argument here, let's say you pass an integer, then it's going to return uh, false here. It's going to come down here. So now, if you look here, you may be wondering how this syntax works. So we have those signs, but it's calling the equals function. So you can also put that equals if it makes uh, more sense, and if we put that equals user. So uh, now you can see that, so, but uh, if you hover over here, it says replace with the two equals. So it's the same thing as having that equals and uh, passing uh, that argument here, which is user two. So again, we are invoking uh, the equals method on the user one object. Let's press control Z. And we are passing our user two objects and we are using our logic that we define here to determine if they are equal. And we can replace this back to two equals. Or if it makes more uh, uh, visual sense to put the to use the equals, you can use equals. It's the same thing. We put user to here. So as you can see, we are uh, calling uh, the function. So this means this object. So this object that defined here. This if uh, 
when we're saying this that first name, it, we we mean this object. So if this that first name it's equal with uh, other other that first name, it's then we are calling this object that is passed here as an argument. So um, next we need, we'll look at, we're gonna look at the next two functions because as I said the, the equals and hash code are very linked together, and we're gonna also look at the the to string function. And uh, now if I change the first name for the user2 to John, and if I run this code, it will get false in the output because when it will come uh, inside this if, it will check to see if this that first name equals to other that first name. And because uh, we're using the end operator and all the condition have to be true, this is gonna return false. So I get false in the output. And, um, but if I change it back to Alex, we'll have true. So the objects are structurally equal based on the logic that we defined uh, here inside our equals uh, function. And uh, as I said, you also, I'm gonna also look at equals and hash code because they are very linked together. And uh, the rule is when, whenever you override equals, you also need to override the, the hash code. And if two objects are comparing equal, so if they are equal based on the equals method that we implemented, they also have to have the same hash code. And um, I'm not going to go into that, but um, this is because they are, uh, the hash code is used for performance reasons in collections. But uh, we're not going to go now into that. Uh, we can just type here uh, override. And uh, here we just type return zero. And this, uh, this is not going to affect our equality at all. As I said, this hash code, uh, it will make, uh, it m makes more sense to implement the hash code in a different way in uh, collections because they are used um, for performance re reasons, particularly with uh, hash set and hash maps. But uh, for now, uh, for our uh, simple class, uh, because we don't use this class inside uh, any collections, we don't need because uh, we don't, uh, don't have to think about that, per the performance reasons to, of the hash code. And, uh, just if you want to just uh, just return zero here like I return and uh, yeah, it could work fine. It's not, it's not gonna affect uh, at all our uh, equality. But remember that rule but, uh, that uh, if you override the uh, equals, you also have to override the hash code and uh, if two objects are comparing equal, they more must have the same hash code. This is true, as I said, particularly in collections, not uh, now because we're not using this code inside collection. And we can also override the toString method. And the toString method is used to return the string representation of the class. So we also type here override, and we have our toString uh, function. I I said method a few times, but uh, they are functions, not uh, methods. Methods is a different thing in Java. And uh, let's delete this function. Let's type it again. So if you can see. So this is gonna return the string representation of uh, the class. So we need to to return here the values that that are passed to the, our to the, our first name and last name and age. And uh, if you don't do that, if you add the print line here and you type user one, let's press Control D and user two, you're gonna see just uh, some. Uh, you're gonna see the user and you're gonna see some uh, numbers, but we're not gonna see the string representation of the, those two users. So you're, gonna, you're not gonna see Alex, uh, the name and the age. So you see this, uh, those two. But um, to avoid that, because this is also use, useful, because previously when we want to um, output in the console the values of the properties, we had to call those properties and uh, to add multiple sprint uh, lines. But with the two string, uh, function we can just type here uh, return and we type here user we put uh, parentheses and here we type first name we put equals we put dollar sign Let's put a single quotation mark, dollar sign, first name. Let's put a quotation mark, here a single quotation marks. Last name equals 
dollar sign, last name. Let's put inside the single quotation marks this. Comma and age, we put also equals dollar sign age. Now, if you run this code again, now it's gonna use, it's gonna, when, when uh, we are typing user one and user two, it's gonna use the two string function that we defined inside the user class, and it's gonna return the string representation of uh, that uh, specific object. So if you run this code, we get user and get first name Alex, last name Dobin, age 23, and we get for the second user, first name Alex, last name Dobin, and age 22. So now we get the string representation of this class, and this is uh, more beautiful because you don't have to to always type that user one, user one that age, user one that uh, last name, the first name, and so on, and for the second object too. Because now it's using the two string function with uh, our own implementation inside here. So this is how you can use the two string function. And this also how you can use the hash code. But the, as I said, hash code uh, is uh, it's a different uh, discussion which you're gonna have uh, when we're gonna talk about collections. For now, just type return zero here and everything could all fine. And if you think about, there is uh, a lot of code just to compare uh, two, two objects. We have uh, almost uh, 38 line of code just to to determine if two objects, two user objects are equal. And uh, we also have to override this, uh, not necessarily, but we also override this hash code and the two string. So there is a lot of code just to do this uh, simple thing to compare it if two user objects are equal. And because Kotlin is about, it's about conciseness, we don't actually need to do all of this stuff. But I, th I, thought, I thought that it is, um, okay to explain to you what you will need to do in the past in order to understand what now uh, Kotlin is doing better, respectively with data classes. So you don't need to type yourself all of this code that you have here. You can just, so if I delete all of this code, let's copy it first and then delete it. So if I delete all of this code, also the, and now if I run this, now we get false and we get uh, those, uh, we get user and this text because now we ha don't have an implementation of the equals, of the two string, of the hash code. And um, if you think, as I said, it's a lot of code to implement all of that. And uh, in Kotlin, you can just type the data keyword in front of the class and all of that code, not specifically the same logic, but all of that code that we type there is gonna be generated automatically for you. So the equals method is gonna be generated, the hash code and the two string. And uh, the properties which are gonna be included in, inside the implementation of the equals, of the inside the uh, of the hash code and inside of the two string are gonna be all the properties defined inside the property constructor. So all the properties defined inside the prop inside the primary constructors are gonna be used inside the implementation of the equals of the hash code and the two string. So just by putting here the data keyword, all of that code, all of that logic is going to be implemented uh, for us. So if you run this code now, so look at this how concise is compared to what we had previously, just one line of code. And if, if you run our code with the data keyword, now as you can see, we have true and we have uh, user, first name Alex, last name. So you have the same output as previously and just by putting data keyword, ja all of that was, the, all of this code, so let's press control Z, all of this code, not specifically exactly this code, but all of this code, all of the implementation of the equals of the hash code and was generated automatically for us just by uh, just by putting the data keyword in front of our class. And uh, if you don't want to have a property included in the implementation of the of the equals or of the, of the hash code or of the the two string, you can just omit it from here and you you declare it inside the inside the, the class. So if I put let's say here uh, so if I delete this because uh, data classes cannot have uh, parameters and I declare it inside the class inside the data class, 
var age, you need to assign a value because we cannot let uh, the property uninitialized. Let's delete this now. And if you run this, now that uh, property is going to be excluded from the implementation of the equals, the hash code, and of uh, the two string. So we have here true, but we have uh, first name Alex, last name Dobbin. So now the implementation for the equals only includes those properties, the first name and the last name. And also for the two, two string function, we have only the first name and the last name. The age is excluded, but let's put this back. So this is what data classes are. They are generating autom automatically for you the implementation of the equals, the hash code, the two string, also for the copy function and for the component function, but we're gonna look at the copy, copy function in a separate video. And they generate all of that uh, code that we saw pre previously that we talked about automatically for you by just putting the data keyword you put the properties inside the primary constructor and all of that implementation is going to be generated for you for all the properties defined inside the primary constructor and just that just by one line of code all of that logic is generated automatically so this is what data classes are see you in the next video so now it's time to start a discussion about interfaces so what are interfaces interfaces um, are you used when you want to have a commonly used behavior shared among different classes, but you don't uh, want to provide the actual code that goes inside the class uh, which is going to implement that interface, but you just want to define the, the name of the function and the parameter of the function. The actual code that uh, goes inside the, the functions that you define in, in, inside the interface uh, they are particular to each object that implements that specific interface. So let's say that you have, uh, let's say that you have um, some classes, let's say that you have a class car, a class uh, which is, uh, which represents uh, a truck and you have a class which represents, represents a plane. You know that uh, all of those three objects have uh, in, co in common the same uh, behavior of starting the engine, let's say. And you don't know how each particular class is going to start the engine, but you know that each uh, class is going to have in common this function which is going to start the engine. Again, you don't care about uh, the particular, how each particular object is going to uh, what code goes inside or, or what uh, uh, logic goes inside the start, start engine function for uh, each of uh, those particular objects. But you care only about the fact that they, they share the same uh, behavior. They, they all start the engine, but how they start the engine is uh, particular to each class. And uh, this is what uh, we do with interface. We only define uh, the what, so what what we define in the interface only the 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 what and the what represents the uh, what uh, those uh, classes are gonna have in common so you know that they are uh, gonna have a function called start engine but you don't don't know how each object uh, how each class is gonna implement uh, that uh, logic and to that to, to to for that i'm gonna use an interface so we define what needs to be done, but no, we don't define how it's going to be done. So to declare an interface, we go down here at the enclosing curly brace of uh, the main function and we type interface. And while I'm typing, you see that we have this uh, suggestion. We type, we press enter, or we can type uh, the entire word if you want. So interface, and I'm going to call this interface engine. And the name of the interface uh, should be with uh, a capital letter, should start a capital letter. It should be in Pascal case if it has multiple words. And uh, interfaces cannot have constructors because they cannot be instantiated. You cannot create, uh, you cannot create an object with uh, an interface. Interfaces are used only, they are created only to be implemented by classes. They cannot be instantiated. So we need to put curly braces and inside the, the body, inside the curly braces, we define what needs to be done. So we define only the function we define, we, de we type the name of the function, I'm going to call it start engine, but we don't define the actual code for the function. So we put parentheses, here you can define parameters if you want, but we don't put curly braces and we define our logic here. 
because we only care what about what needs to be done so we only care that each class uh, needs to start the engine how it's gonna start the engine it's up to the each particular class so we go down here we type class and I'm gonna create a class called car and it's gonna have uh, a val name which is gonna be a string and uh, a val color which is also gonna be a string and now to implement the interface we put colon and we type engine and as you can see we have this uh, engine we have this i for interface here so we press enter then we put curly braces to define the body of the class and now we have this underline here and this underline is here to tell us that we need to in, in, now we need to implement the we need to implement this function because the the interface and the class have a contract it's like a contract and the contract says that if you implement an interface you need to you must implement uh, you must override the, the 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 function so you need to implement the function this to we this is why we have his, uh, here an underline so if i click on this uh, underline or if i hover over there and i click on the light on the red bulb you see that it says implement members so click on implement and we have our uh, uh, start engine function we click ok and now our functions was overrided here and uh, we have this to do which is not yet implemented and this is there to to tell us that this method uh, this function is not yet implemented so we need to define the actual uh, logic here and let's create two other classes let's um, call this class track and it's also gonna have a name a val it's gonna be a string and the color also a string and we're gonna also implement the interface so we're gonna put colon engine then we put curl base and now we need to implement because I said there is a contract between the interface and the class and the contract says that you need to implement the function so we implement the function here and we create another class called plane and uh, it's also gonna have a val name it's gonna be a string and uh, a val color also a string and here we put colon and we're gonna also implement the interf interface inside the plane class and we put colon engine our interface then curly braces and now we have the underline because again we there is the contract now between the interface and the class and that says that we need to implement this function inside our plain uh, class and we have those to do and those to do are uh, here to tell us that we need to uh, we need to impl we need to provide some logic to the to the actual uh, function so let's delete those and let's put some code here so let's delete this And uh, let's add a print uh, line here, which is gonna output some text to the console. And we're gonna have the text, the car is starting the engine. And uh, I'm gonna copy this because now I'm gonna put here some text. I'm gonna say the truck is starting the engine and here is going to say the plane starting the engine now what uh, what we have done here and uh, what we did here is that we know that each uh, class respectively our car our truck and our plane they all gonna start the engine so they all gonna share this start engine uh, behavior they go all all gonna have this functionality what we don't know is how each class how each uh, how each object is gonna start the engine because they uh, they uh, start the engine in a different way the engine of uh, of a car is different from an engine of a truck or from a lane so we know that uh, each uh, each is gonna know that each class or uh, each object is gonna start the engine but we don't know 
how they're gonna start the engine. So here inside the actual uh, here inside the the function we we type the text the car is starting the engine, the truck is starting the engine, and the plane is starting the engine. So they differed in how they start the engine, but you know that they go all gonna they all gonna start the engine. So this is what interfaces allows us to do. You can define an interface if you know that uh, mul multiple uh, related or unrelated uh, classes or objects are gonna have a function shared between them, but you don't know how each particular class or object is gonna Im is gonna uh, how is gonna Im how is gonna have the actual code? Uh, how is gonna write the actual code for that uh, that behavior? So you don't you don't care about the how you only care about the what. So we know that in this case they all start the engine, but they they start the engine in a different way. And uh, you can have here uh, another class, let's say that uh, uh, a person which creates another. Uh, another class and the, the class is gonna be called Tesla and in that case again you can implement the interface because you know that uh, the Tesla is also gonna start the engine you, you don't know how it's gonna start the engine but you know that uh, it's, it's gonna start the engine and how it's gonna start the engine is uh, specific to a Tesla car so this is what interfaces allow us to do we can define uh, some uh, shared uh, behavior between uh, unrelated or related uh, classes and that the actual code you don't define any code inside the interface you can put you actually can define here a property but uh, uh, usually you just define uh, the the function the function name some parameters and the actual code goes inside the class which implements that uh, interface and let's let's actually create here a class uh, tesla so we put here uh, let's uh, put this a little bit up so we put here class Tesla is gonna have also a val name. It's gonna be a string and a val color, and this is also gonna be a string. So now we can implement our engine interface. So we don't know how Tesla is gonna start the engine, but we know that it's gonna start the engine. So we we implement our interface. Put colon the name of the interface, and now we need to implement the start engine. So we click on that and we have not yet implemented let's put our print line here I'm gonna press ctrl V and here's gonna say Tesla is starting the engine so this is what uh, interfaces are and uh, see you in the next video because I'm gonna end in video now so here it should say uh, Tesla is starting the engine not uh, the Tesla so I corrected that so I thought that it's a good idea to show you a practical example using Android Studio where interfaces are used because the, when I first learned about interfaces and abstract classes I found them very confusing because they are very very abstract and uh, you don't uh, see when, when you, somebody teaches uh, you those concepts you don't see how where, where, and where you're gonna use those, uh, those uh, concepts, interfaces and abstract classes. And for that I'm going to open Android Studio to show you a practical example using interfaces. And uh, also I'm going to use Android Studio to show you a practical example where we're going to use um, abstract classes. So I open Android Studio, you don't need to, it, it looks similar to our IntelliJ ID because it's IntelliJ ID, just that is, uh, it's Android Studio. So we, put, we click on my application. And here we have uh, this thing called main activity. We don't need to worry about uh, this because, it, as I said, uh, I just want to show you where interfaces are used in Android Studio to get uh, to get uh, an idea about where uh, they are used. Because as I said they are very abstract. And I already I already set uh, set up some code. So in uh, this this thing called activity that main this is where uh, we put our uh, UI this is where we put our buttons this is where we put our uh, list views uh, this is where we put uh, generally our uh, UI so as you can see we have two buttons here and they have an ID 
Again, I'm not gonna go into this, but if you click here on design, you see that we have a, log a login button and a sign up button. So this is the UI part of our uh, app. Now I'm gonna click on this main activity and this is the part where we're gonna put our code. And now I'm gonna link those UI buttons. So let's go to code. So this is the code for creating those buttons. And I'm gonna link those buttons because they have this ID here, login button. So you have here uh, Android ID. And if you come from Android Studio, you already know all of this. I'm gonna link those uh, UI buttons with some objects buttons by typing some code. So I'm gonna define up here a latent var called the login button and it's gonna be of type button. So this is a class button. Then I'm gonna define another latent it because I'm not gonna initialize it right there. So latent it again sign up button and it's gonna be also of type button so types like we have types for uh, for our numbers or for our just that this is a class and this this class is a button object and now we need to link those those objects that we created here with those buttons that we have here those UI buttons so to link those login button and sign up button and to do that, to go down here, and I'm gonna, gonna go, I'm gonna do this in the longer way. And here we type login button. Again, you don't need to understand all of this. This is just to illustrate uh, how interfaces work. I'm gonna put equals, and now I'm gonna type find view by ID. And this function find view by ID is gonna link our button object that we created here with our UI button that we have uh, that we have created here. And it's gonna be linked by its ID, by this ID that we have here, login button. So if you go here, here you type R. So R is this thing which, uh, again, don't need to understand all of this. R is, is used to, to get that ID to link our uh, button object with our button UI. So we put R that ID, that, and we have our, uh, our two IDs. So we, we choose login button. So now, we have linked our UI button with our button object. So we linked the UI, in other words, with the code. Now let's link uh, also the sign up button. So you type here sign up button equals find view by ID. You, you also type r dot id dot sign up button. Again, you don't need to type this code because probably you, you don't even have Android Studio. This is just to illustrate something. Now, to illustrate how interfaces work, let's say that I want to, let's say that I want to, to do something when this login button is clicked, and I want to do also something when this sign up button is clicked, and it, and here interfaces come into action. What we can do is we can say login button dot, and there is a function called set on click listener, and this function what is doing is basically set, uh, setting a listener on our UI button so that when you click on that button, the, a function called onClick is gonna be executed and uh, the code that is uh, gonna be in that function is particular to each, uh, to each button. So you, you, you're gonna set the interface, so you, s you type set onClick listener and here you type, also this illustrates uh, the object. Also, this by by this example, we also illustrate how the anonymous classes work. So you type object, and now I'm gonna inherit. Uh, actually, gonna implement our interface on click listener, and this on click listener interface has a, a function called on click. And here we put curly braces and press enter. And now here we have this underline. And if you click on it. You have this rate bulb because it wants us to implement to implement that on click uh, function. So we're gonna implement that, and it says to do not yet implemented. I'm not gonna do the same thing for the for the sign up button. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste it down here, 
and I'm gonna change it to sign up button. So now each individual each individual button has a own has its own on click listener interface and the code which is going to be executed inside the one click method because this function is going to be triggered when you click on the button is particular to each button so this button is going to log in the user this button you're going to put here the code to sign up the user but you're not going to do that you're just going to we're going to uh, show some uh, text on our uh, emulator so we type here to show the text toast that make text here you need to pass the context so don't worry about all of this main that activity here you need to pass uh, how how long this uh, is gonna show on the screen so we choose uh, short and we put that show to show this on the No, actually here we need to pass uh, the text. So what text is gonna be shown on the screen. So here we're gonna say login uh, button clicked. And uh, now here we need to pass how long it's gonna show. So you type toast that short. So if it's gonna be show, shown uh, for a short time. And then we need to call sh the show function to show this on the screen. And I'm gonna press uh, control uh, C to copy this and I'm gonna paste inside our on click function in our uh, interface that we have here for the sign up button and this is gonna say that uh, sign up button was clicked so sign up button clicked now in Android Studio we have uh, what is called an emulator and this is basically a virtual uh, phone and we can run uh, we can run our code and we can and test our code and we're gonna see on on that emulator those buttons and when you're gonna click on those buttons this uh, code that we define here for for uh, those buttons because we linked them so we linked those two buttons that have here the login button the sign up button so this is their ui uh, code this is their xml code you We've linked them through code here and when we click on them the code in each particular object is gonna be executed So now if you run our code go up here and uh, I'm gonna create now the virtual phone to see our buttons and I'm gonna click on them to see how it works I'm gonna close those Now it's connecting to the emulator And this is our uh, virtual virtual phone so this is uh, the, the virtual phones and he, here we have our uh, UI that we created here so this is what the users see so this uh, the what the users see and this is what we see this is the this is what happens under the covers and now if I click on this login button look what happens it says login button click so it executes this on click function inside the login button if i click on the sign up button it says sign up button click because it's executing the on click function and the code inside the on click function for the sign up button and uh, they are uh, as i said uh, linked by the by the id so this is what happens under the covers this is what the user see now this is uh, where interfaces can be used because if you think about you, you can have multiple uh, UIs, uh, different UIs, text views, uh, lists uh, or uh, uh, items, individual items in a list which can be clicked and for all of those you know that all, is go all, all of them are going to have a on click function, all, all, all have this shared uh, functionality to respond to, to a click. You don't know how uh, that uh, is gonna, how that that on-click function is gonna uh, execute, or what, or what code that on-click function is gonna have for each particular uh, UI uh, uh, UI. But you know that each 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 one is gonna have a one-click uh, function. What is gonna go inside the one-click function for each for each particular? Uh, uh, UI it's up to that uh, specific uh, UI so it's up to a button it's up to a text views and so on so this is uh, 
or interfaces are, are used because we know that they're going to have a shared functionality of one click but you don't know how that functionality is going to be implemented by each particular UI. In our case, we, do, we know that a login button and a sign up button, both, both are going to have a, a one click, both are going, to, are going to respond to click events, but we don't know what they're going to do. So this is why you define the interface and the developers who write code going to implement that interface and you're going to write the actual implementation for that function which is specific to that uh, object. So this is our discussion and if you find this confusing, uh, particularly if you find confusing the, uh, if, because I touched a little bit on Android Studio in our discussion, don't be because uh, I just wanted to show you a practical example where uh, interfaces are used using Android Studio. So let's click again on login button. We get our toast, the login button clicked, sign up button clicked, and can create another button which can be used for, uh, I don't know, if you forgot the password and you, you're gonna implement the on-click listener, you're gonna override the, you're gonna override the on-click function, you're gonna write some code to to send, uh, to send, to help, help the user to recover its uh, password and so on. So we can see how interfaces can be used practically in this, uh, with this example. So this is our discussion, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about object expression, but first uh, let's go down here and let's create a class to see why you'll need to use object expression in the first place. So we type here class and our, and our class is gonna be called button. We put uh, parentheses to create the primary constructor and define some properties here. The first one is gonna be text, it's gonna be of type string. The second one is going to be also val, it's going to be called id, it's going to be an integer. And the last one is going to be called on click listener. It's going to be of type on click listener. So this is an interface that we're going to create. So let's go down here to create the interface. We type interface on and while I'm typing, you see that you have this suggestion, one click listener to create the interface. Press enter, put curly braces and let's define a function, fun on click. Let's put uh, parentheses. Now let's create some objects with our class button to see why you'll need to use uh, object expression in the first place. So let's go here and here we type uh, val, let's call it login button put equal and now let's create our object type button with parentheses now let's pass some values to the properties of the primary constructor and this is gonna have the text login for the id we type some uh, arbitrary numbers here one two one three two and um, now here we need to pass uh, the one click listener interface but we, do not, we cannot type here one click listener because we cannot instantiate the interface so what can we do to solve this problem one solution to this would be to create a separate class here let's put it actually above the interface let's call it click listener this class class click listener and this class is going to implement the interface so we put here colon and we call our uh, on click listener interface, put curly braces. And now we need to implement that on click uh, method, that on click function that we defined actually inside our on click listener interface. So we press OK to override that on click uh, function. And we have that uh, to do, we have this to do which says uh, to do not yet implemented. So this is there to, to tell us that uh, it's not implemented yet. So let's delete this. All right, so what you could do is you can create here an instance of the click listener. So we type here uh, val click listener equals we create the instance or create an object. And now we can pass here the click listener. So now it, the error disappeared. But if I create a second object, let's call it uh, 
sign up button equals button. Let's pass the text so sign up. For the ID also an arbitrary number. Now in our uh, imaginary uh, example that we have here, uh, actually if we think uh, of a real scenario with this button and with the one click listener, what we want to achieve here is that if you have a graphical user interface, you want that uh, you want to detect that click, so you want to detect when that specific button, let's say that this button object that we have here is linked to an uh, graphical button which on, on which you click because they are linked when you click on that you want to call that one click function that is defined inside our interface inside here but you want to make that one click interface you want, you want to make that one click function particular to particular to that button which was clicked so we we want to to implement that uh, one click uh, function to that particular button which was clicked and the code that goes inside that particular button so let's say that you click on the login button is particular to that button so that in the next uh, when the next button is clicked so when if the user clicks for on the sign up button then you need to, you need to also have uh, the one click method called but that one click that one click function actually I, I i keep saying method but the the one click function should should have its own implementation uh, particular to the sign up button so what can we do in that case we cannot pass the same uh, instance here to click listener because even if it create here another instance of the click listener it will still have the same code which is here so if you put here some code this code will, it will be shared among all the objects that are created so what you can do in this case is to use an object expression or also called anonymous 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 classes so what you can do here we can type object we put colon and now we we are uh, inheriting from our uh, we are actually implementing our own click listener interface so we type object colon on click listener and we put curly braces because here we declare and we also instantiate the the anonymous class so we need to implement that right there so by doing this now we we, are, we made the on click function particular to each object to each object button so we can do the same thing here we type object And we implement our one-click listener interface. We put curly braces. Now we need to implement for this particular object, for the sign up uh, button object, we need to implement that uh, function. So we type, uh, we, we, cl we click on this object. We go to the red bulb, light bulb and we, we type, we press here where it says implement uh, members. So implement the one-click function. And now what we did here is we made the on-click uh, function particular to each object. So each object now we can put here some code, code, or we can type here uh, this uh, sign, sign in. Actually, let's type login, login. There was it. so now we can have code here which actually log, logs in if you have a real graphical user interface which logs, logs in the user and here you can uh, add some code to sign up the user when that specific button is clicked so by doing by using the object expression also called anonymous uh, class because you don't have a, a reference you don't have a name for the class here you just it's just anonymous for this uh, is anonymous so we cannot uh, it does not have a name so we cannot call it later or do something because it's created and also instantiated right there so this is why you need to implement the one click function and now we made the one click function particular to each button and if you have more uh, objects more objects of created with the class uh, 
button, they, they will have their own uh, implementation of the on-click function, which comes from the interface on-click listener. So this is why you need to use uh, anonymous uh, class or uh, also called the object expression. And it's an expression because the value that uh, the because the object is always cre it's created and instantiate it's, all, it's actually declared and instantiate at the same time it's also assigned to the property that we define here so this is why it's called an expression so see you in the next video all right so now it's time to start our discussion about delegation but first i'm going to add the main function here now what is delegation? Delegation means giving power, given authority from one instance, from one class to another class. And delegation is uh, usually used in, in scenarios where inheritance starts to break. So when inheritance starts to break, when you want, let's say it for whatever reason, to inherit from two classes. In that case, you can't use inheritance because with inheritance, you can inherit just from only one class. But with delegation, you can plug in multiple uh, implementation of classes in your own class. And let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to create first an interface called uh, A. And it's going to have a function called print. Then I'm going to create another interface called B. And it's going to have a function print to. Then I'm going to create a class. So I'm going to type here class. And it's going to be called first delegate and it's going to implement the fun the interface a here and i'm going to press ctrl o to override the function print here and i'm going to create another class called second delegate and it's going to implement the interface b so i'm going to press ctrl o to override the function print o. now i'm going to create up here a class called app so class up now let's say that i want here to inherit from the first delegate and from the second delegate so and from the second delegate and if i type here first delegate i put parentheses opening parenthesis closing parenthesis if i put curly braces uh, now i have an underline because i should mark this as open so mark this as open and also this uh, as open because i want to show you that so now if i want to inherit from the second class called from the second delegate because let's say that i want to use the the print to function in my class for whatever reason i can't because i can't only inherit from one class so if i hover over here over this and underline it says only only one class may appear in a super type list so another other words saying that we can only inherit from one class and that is all we cannot inherit from multiple, multiple classes. Now, with delegation, we can plug in multiple implementations in our own class. So what I can do here, I can say, hey, implement the interface A. So I'm going to inherit from the interface A. But you're going to say, use for the interface A the implementation of the first delegate class. So this is what we're saying here, A and the keyword by first delegate, we're saying, hey, use for the interface A, the implementation which is provided by the first delegate class, and that will work. Then I'm gonna put a comma here, and I'm gonna say, use also for the class B, so I'm gonna type for the interface B, so we're, we're, we're gonna type B, and I'm gonna use the by keyword, so I'm gonna type here by second delegate. So we're saying use for the interface B, the second delegate implementation and it's gonna use that and it's gonna be um, happy with that so you're gonna see that we get no error and now i can override here both the print function and also the print to function so if i press ctrl o now i can override also the print to and this is inherently very powerful because we can plug in here multiple as many implementations as you want in your uh, class so this is and uh, if you think about uh, uh, in contrast with the in inheritance this is very powerful because here you can plug in as many implementations as you want and uh, this is very powerful so this is how you can use uh, delegation in kotlin and next we're going to see how you can use delegation with properties 
So to use delegation properties, first I'm going to paste some code here. So I'm going to paste this code here. And what we're having here is a class format delegate, which is inheriting from the read and write property. And it's overriding the get value and the set value. So we are overriding the setter and the getter inside our class and we provide our own implementation. So whenever you, you use the setter to set a value or the getter to get a value, we, we are overriding those functions and we provide our own implementation. Next, I'm going to create here up here a class, but first I'm going to delete the code and the interface that we have here because we don't need this code. So I'm going to delete this code and I'm going to create another class. And this class is going to be called user. I'm going to put curly braces and I'm going to define the properties inside the class. So I'm going to type here var first name. So what we are doing now is we're creating a property first. It's called first name. And now I'm going to use the by queue. We're also going to say by format delegate. So what we're saying now is use the use the the we use the code which is inside the format delegate whenever you set the value or get the value of the first name. I'm going to put uh, parentheses here. Next I'm going to type another var last name and I'm going to type here again by and I'm going to type format delegate. So format delegate and we put parentheses. So not now what is going to happen is that whenever you set the first name property or we get the name the first name property is going to use our implementation that we provided here this is what we're going to do and the same it will be true for the last name because we are using the delegation here on properties so i'm going to create here a user so i'm going to type here val user i'm going to type equals to user and i'm going to type here with and i'm going to type user this is the scope function, I'm going to put curly, curly braces and I'm going to type here first name equals Alex and the last name equals uh, Dobinka. Now if I output those values in the console, look what happens. So if I type here, here print line user that first name and print line, let's actually use again uh, the with uh, Scope function. I'm type here with. Let's pass here user curly braces, print line, first name, and print line, last name. Now, if you run this code, you're gonna see that it's using the overriding uh, functions that we provide in our format delegate. So we have in uppercase letters like we defined here. We're gonna when we, whenever we set the value, gonna be a, set it with, uh, it's going to change the value to lowercase letters. So you get Alex and Obinka in lowercase uh, letters. Oh, this is how you can use uh, delegation on uh, properties and uh, see you in the next video. So now it's time to start a discussion about collections. But first I'm going to create a new project. I'm going to call it collections. For the language, select Kotlin. For the build system, IntelliJ. Make sure to have the JDK selected and also check this box to have uh, the main function auto-generated for us. So I'm going to click on create to create the project. Now I'm going to delete this code because we don't need this code. And also I'm going to hide the project pane. Now, what are collections? Collections are a group of uh, objects stored together in a single variable. They are similar to array, but uh, they are they are different in some sense. And uh, there are mainly three collections that we're going to look at. And this, those are the list, the set, and the map. And uh, and those among those uh, collections, they are uh, separated in two groups. So there there are multiple multiple uh, list and uh, sets and maps and immutable lists. Uh, set and map and that and uh, mutable means that you can uh, write to that uh, collection so you can uh, add or, or, or uh, remove elements to it so the that collection can grow or shrink as you add or remove elements to it and the mutable means that you can only add elements only when you instantiate that or, or when you create that uh, collection you cannot add later elements to it the size is fixed, so we cannot add or remove element. So this is the difference between immutable and mutable. And we're going to look at uh, all of those uh, in this video. So we're going to look at the list collection first, and we're going to look at an immutable list. So we type val, 
I'm gonna create a variable names and um, here we're gonna type to create an immutable list type list of and here we need to specify the type what kind of data I'm gonna put here and we'll type name one name two and name three now we cannot add or remove element from this uh, list because it's an immutable list but we can get on element to output in the console and to do that we type print line we type names we put square brackets and we get the element by its index and the index also starts at zero so let's get the first uh, element so if you run this code you'll see name one output in the console, in the console. so we get name one so this is an immutable list. We cannot add or remove elements from it after we uh, instantiate it here. What now? Now let's look at an mutable list, so a list which can, in which you can add and remove elements to it. So to do that, we just change this from a list of to a mutable list of. So we type here mutable list of. We can also remove the explicit uh, type here the explicit type declaration because it's gray out so remove that because it can be inferred and to this uh, mutable list now we can add or remove the element so I can type here names and we have this add function so we can type add and here we can we can pass a new element so we pass here let's say name 4 now if I uh, Let's type here names that for each print line, not this for each names that for each this for each print line. Now, if you run this. Now you see you have name one, name two, name three, and name four. So name four was added to our mutable list because our list is mutable. We can add or remove new elements. So down here I can I can type names dot remove, and we can remove an element. And we can remove the element. Uh, I think by uh, you can remove you can use this function remove add. So we can remove the element by its index. So we can type here the index. And that is going to remove the first element. So if you run this code, name one is not going to be showed. So as you can see, name one was removed because you can we remove it by its index. And we can also remove an element using this function by typing uh, the element. So we type here, let's say, name uh, name two name two element now is going to be removed so you, now if you run this name two was removed so those are two functions with, with which you can remove elements from the mutable list so this is a mutable list you can add and uh, remove elements to it and the list is gonna grow and shrink as you add or remove elements to it so this is the mutable list now we're gonna look at a set and a set is a collection which can store only unique unique elements so it cannot have duplicates so if I uh, delete uh, this in uh, our uh, in our uh, mutable list we can put an element which is the same so we can have two elements which are the same so if you run this we have two elements which are the same you can see name one at the end. We have name one, name two, name three, and name one again. So we can have uh, uh, duplicates in our uh, collection on our multiple list, but in a set we can't. So, but first we're gonna look at uh, first we're gonna look at a uh, multiple set and then at, at a multiple set. So we type here. Uh, let's delete this. We type here set of. And here we need to pass string. Now, if you run this, you will see that name one is not shown two times here. It's going to be shown only one time. So you have name one, name two, and name three. This is because the set uh, set all, the set is not allowing duplicates in its uh, in its list. So 
and this is a immutable set set of so if i type here names that add we cannot add or remove new elements but we can also use a mutable set of so we type here mutable set of and now we can add and remove new elements so you can type names that add so here you can add a new element let's say name uh, So now if you run this, you're gonna see name one, name two, name three, and name four. And uh, our duplicate is not shown because as I said uh, a set can only can only store unique elements, not duplicates. But if I add objects that we create, look what happens. So let's create some user objects. But first, let's create the class user, and it's gonna have. Uh, val name is gonna be of type string now let's create some user objects here and we're gonna add to our uh, mutable set so we type here val user one we're gonna type here user and we're gonna pass some generic names like name one and let's control d a few times Let's change this to name two into five. And let's add here a val user six equals user. And let's type here Alex. Let's press control D. And let's change this to user seven. Now let's add those to our uh, multiple sets so let's change now the type so it's gonna store user objects so we're gonna pass here uh, user one i'm gonna speed up now this a little bit i'm gonna press ctrl alt l to format the code now we cannot this we cannot add here a name for because now the type is user. Now if you run this, let's actually change this print to it that name, and let's let's run our code now. And we have uh, name one, name two, name three, name four, name name five, and we have Alex two times. So why you have duplicates? Even though I said that sets can only store unique elements, this is because previously the set actually what is doing to determine to if to if uh, it has duplicates is using the equals to function that we talked about in our video about data classes so when we typed only strings then it was using the equals to uh, function which was overridden inside the string class to determine if there are uh, uh, if there are equal strings but now because our class doesn't have the equals to function over it in its, in its uh, class, it's not, uh, it's using the equals to function which is inside the any class. So you cannot determine if two users are, uh, are equal. And to change that, just let's hide the console. And to just put the data keyword here, because now this will generate the equals to function, the, 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 two, the two string and the hash code so now if you run this now we have alex only one time because now it's using the equals to function which was uh, auto generated by by uh, by the class user because you put here the, the data keyword so this is a, a good thing to have in mind that this multiple set is using the equals to function to determine if uh, the objects that you add to to yourself are uh, equal so having this in mind now let's look at maps so i'm gonna close this i'm gonna delete this let's delete this let's delete this also Now let's look at the next collection that you can use in Kotlin and that is the map collection and use collection when you want to store key value pairs. So I'm going to create a variable, it's going to be called users and 
I'm going to put equals and I'm going to create first an immutable map. So we type map of, map of, and here we need to specify what uh, kind of type is going to be the key. So the key is going to be an integer, but you can put any class you want here. And the value is going to be a string. So I'm going to store the ID and the name of uh, a an user. And to define our element in pairs, here we type first the key, and then we use the to keyword to map our uh, key to its element, so to its value actually. So we type one, two, and now the value. Let's first type Maria. So now we have one element stored in paired, and the key is one, the value is Maria. Next, I'm gonna do the same for the next one, so I'm gonna type here two, two, the keyword two, Alex, and then uh, I'm gonna type uh, three, the keyword two, so I'm type, you need to type the value now. I'm gonna type John. Now, to get one element from uh, this map, we type print line, we type here users, square brackets, and we type, we, we get the element by its key, as you can see by this hint key. So we get, let's say, uh, the element uh, one. So now if you run this code, we get Maria because Maria has, uh, because this key is for the, for the key one, uh, the value mapped, the value which is corresponding to this key is Maria. And if you change this to two, gonna get Alex. If you run this, So this is an immutable map. In this map, you cannot add or remove elements. But if I declare this as an mutable map, so let's change this to a mutable map. So we type here mutable map of. Let's delete this from here. And let's uh, pass here int and string. Now, here now, so you need to put this in parentheses. Here we can add new elements, so you can type users. Actually first let's loop through our uh, map to see our elements. And I'm gonna use the for each function to loop. So we type here users dot for each and we choose this one. And inside our loop we add a print line and I'm gonna put quotation marks and here we're gonna put dollar sign. I'm gonna type T and T is the key and dollar sign U and U is the value. So now if you run this, we get one and Maria, two and Alex, three and John. So we have the key and we have the corresponding values. And you cannot have duplicated keys and this is very important to know. You can also add or remove elements from uh, this map. So to add an element, just type users and we need to specify the key. So we put square brackets, so we type users, square brackets, and then we put a key, let's say five. And we put here equals to, and uh, here we need to pass a value. So the value is going to be, let's say, Vlad. Now, if you run this, we get one and Maria, two and Alex, three and John, and five and the corresponding value, Vlad. So Vlad has the key, val the key value, five. So you can also remove an element from our map. So we type users dot remove. And you, 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 you here for this remove function, you pass the key of the, of the element that you want to be removed. And let's say that I remove uh, two. So I remove Alex from our map. So if you run this code, now Alex is not, is not gonna be shown here because it was removed uh, on the line four. So Alex was removed. So this is how you can use uh, immutable and mutable maps. This is how you can uh, add and remove elements 
and uh, this is how you can uh, loop through our map and this is our discussion about collections and see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about collections operations and we're going to look at the first operation and that is transformation and we're going to start with the first one called mapping so i'm going to create a new project i'm going to call it collections operations select cattle intellij then click on create We we'll go on the left hand side, click on Kotlin, right click, new, we're going to create a new file, I'm going to call it main, I'm going to create the main function. Now, what are transformations? As the name implies, transformations are some functions which, with which you can change a specific collection. And we're going to look at the first one, which is called mapping. So I'm going to create first uh, a collection. So I'm going to type val numbers and it's going to be a set. So I'm going to type numbers gonna equals to set of. And here we're going to define some values like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's press Ctrl Alt L to format the code. Now, I'm going to add a print line here. Now, to use the mapping collection transformation, we just type numbers. And uh, one important thing uh, to know here is that uh, those uh, tra transformation uh, functions are lambda functions. So if you don't know what lambda functions are, I uh, suggest you to watch the section which is called lambda function to first understand what are lambda functions because it will be uh, it will be very hard for you to understand how this, uh, how those transformations work without understanding how lambda functions work. Now, here we're gonna call our uh, our uh, transformation function, which is the first one, which, which as I said is mapping, and the function is called map. I'm gonna explain immediately what it's doing, and uh, as you can see, it's a lambda function. So we're gonna press enter, and we, we are inside the curly braces. And here we're gonna define our transformation. So what we're saying basically here is, do whatever I, I type here in this, uh, in those uh, curly braces, apply to every element of the of this cell, of this collection. So if if uh, now to refer to to refer to the parameter uh, uh, to the to a specific parameter from the numbers. Uh, uh, set we type it and I'm gonna type it times 10 so what we are saying here is do this transformation so change this uh, change this uh, th this set by uh, m multiplying every element inside the, this uh, this uh, collection inside this set by 10. So if you run this, now every number is going to be multiplied by 10. So if I run this, now we get instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, we get 10, 20, 30, 40, and 5. So what this map function and what this uh, it times 10 did is, is it transformed, it changed our uh, set into into what it, it, it was changed by the expression that we defined here. So we said that I want to, the, every element we said here to be multiplied by 10 and then we display them uh, here. We can go even further. We can put here an if statement. So we can type here if, let's say it, so it refers to, the, to a specific element in that list, in that set. So if it equals equals, so if it equals three, I'm gonna say, we're gonna say here it times 100. So what we're saying here, if one of those elements inside this numbers set is equal to three, then multiply it, change it, so change it by by the by this expression so multiply it by 100 and you can also put the else part so you put else we're gonna put it times 
So if the else part is true, if the else part is executed, we're saying if the number is not equal to three from this list, then uh, multiply the number, uh, multiply uh, the number by uh, by ten. So now if I run this, look what we have here. So we have 10, 20, and we have 300 here. This is because this transformation now is using the if and else uh, statements that we define here. So this is what uh, the map transformations allows you to do. You can change, you can transform a specific collection by an expression that you defined inside the curly braces of the map function. All right. Now let's look at how we can uh, can use map transformation to with another uh, collection. Let's see how can you can use the map uh, transformation with a map. So with uh, with uh, with a map which has a key and a value. So to do that, we just type here val numbers map. So I'm gonna type val numbers map map. I'm gonna put equals. I'm gonna type map of, and here I'm gonna type key 1 2 1 then key 2 2 2 then key 3 2 3 and finally key 4 2 4 now if you want to use the map uh, map uh, tra trans transformation function on uh, the map uh, map collection you 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 can uh, use it either on the keys so you can use it on the keys or on the values so we can type here print line number map number map so we choose here that and we choose map keys now so we choose this one map keys lambda expression so map keys that one and here we type it dot key so we get the key dot uppercase so that is gonna uppercase all the keys inside our map then we're gonna add an, another print line here we're gonna type number map dot map now we choose uh, map uh, values and we type here it dot value so the value plus it dot key dot length now if you run this though this expression is going to be applied to all of our keys inside our numbers map that we define above and the second transformation is going to be applied to all the values that we defined inside our numbers map so if you run this code now we're going to see the the keys being first uppercase and then we're going to see the keys plus uh, plus the length so you see first we get uh, 10 20 340 uh, and 50 for uh, our first transformation that we have here then we have uh, our uh, uh, second uh, then we have our uh, transformation on the map on the map keys so we have we have the key and then we have the value we have key and the, the key is uppercase because we said uh, to, to, to do that by using this expression it so it uppercase all the keys as you can see here and then you see the corresponding value for the key after that you see you, you have numbers map map that value so you have it that value plus it that key that length so you have key and you have uh, one and we have six you have key two and have seven so the key the value of the key is uh, is uh, to the value of the key it's added the length of the so to the value that we have here we we have added the the value length of the string key that we defined here so this way we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, two then we have uh, seven then we have eight and then we have nine so this is our and you can also you can also do for the uh, map for the map transformation and to type here numbers dot map and we choose this one index not null 
and here we choose uh, we have uh, two parameters first is the index and second is the value so I'm gonna choose the name for the first one index and for the second one let's call it uh, value then we have the arrow and here we have gonna define our uh, transformation uh, our expression which is going to be applied on our numbers so here i can use the index so i can i'm going to type here an if ex, if uh, statement so if index equals equals zero then i'm going to assign so i'm going to transform to the to the we're going to put that value null to the index zero else I'm gonna type index times value. So else you're gonna uh, multiply the index time, times the value. So if you run this, we get two, six, twelve, and twenty. So uh, for the first one, we get nothing because we for the first index we assign uh, null. And then uh, it's using the else part to, to transform uh, our uh, numbers list and it's multiplying the index by the value. So we, we first uh, we first have the index uh, zero multiplied. Uh, here we have null for the index because we checked here. So we have null. So at the index uh, two, we have one times two and uh, we have two. Then here we have uh, at the index uh, two, we have two times three so the index is two the value is three and uh, we, we we get uh, we get uh, six here and so on so this is how you can use also the index if you want in your uh, transformation now we're gonna look at the next transformation that we can do in our collection and that is zipping now it's time to look at the transformation function called zipping so i'm gonna add a comment here called uh, zipping and I'm gonna declare uh, two lists. I'm gonna call the first one uh, colors. I'm gonna put equals. I'm gonna type list of. I'm gonna type red, brown, and uh, gray. And I'm gonna create another. Uh, List called animals. We equal to list of. I'm gonna type here uh, fox, bear, in quotation marks, and uh, wolf. Now, what uh, the uh, zipping or the zip. Uh, functions allow us to do is to create pairs of elements with the same position in both collections so we can create pairs with red we can create a pair of uh, fox and red a pair of bear, uh, bear and brown and a pair of wolf and gray and you can do that just by typing here print line and we have you can do this in two ways you type colors and you can type uh, that that zip and you type here uh, animals and if you run this you will see them in pairs so see you're gonna see fox red uh, bear brown and so on so you see here red uh, fox brown bear gray also um, the zip uh, and the zipping is used to create pairs and the pairs uh, are uh, at the same position in both uh, in both uh, collections or if uh, you don't want to use the z function with uh, parentheses you can type he here colors zip and animals and type here animals now if you run this code you're gonna see the same output Now, if you want to use a transformation with the zip function, you can type here print line, and you can type colors dot zip. Now I'm going to use the parentheses animals and animals, and now I'm going to put curly braces, so the lambda function here. I'm going to type 
animal for a, let's put first color and animal I'm gonna put uh, the arrow sign and here I'm gonna type D I'm gonna, but I'm gonna put first uh, quotation marks and put D and I'm gonna put dollar sign and I'm gonna refer our uh, animal uh, parameter that we defined here so we type here D animal dot and we call the replace first char function so we type replace first char and as you can see this also is uh, I think a lambda uh, function and inside the, of this we type it dot uppercase uppercase and this is gonna uppercase the first letter of the animal uh, uh, of the animal that is uh, defined here and I'm gonna type is dollar sign color right now if you run this you're gonna see the fox and the f is uppercase because it's uppercase by this expression that we have here it replaces and this it, it refers to the animal uh, an animal uh, variable animal variable that is defined here and it refers to the first letter so it says it that uppercase so uppercase the first letter then uh, then uh, return that uh, to the to the animal uh, animal variable and we have the fox is red so have the color and then we have the bear is brown the wolf is gray and all the animals start with a capital letter like we define here in this uh, in this expression so this is the zip function so this is how you can use the zip function to create pairs and uh, also you can use the unzip function to unzip a list of pairs so first let's create a list of pairs so i'm gonna type val number pairs equals I'm gonna type list of and here we're gonna put one two one two 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 three two three four two four now if you want to unzip those pairs that we created you can just type here print line number pairs let's first uh, display them as uh, pairs and uh, necklace print line and so let's type number pairs dot unzip now if you run this you're gonna see them first in pairs and then you're gonna see them unpaired because we use here the unzip function so as you can see here you have first one and you have uh, one two two three three four four so we have in pairs first and then we have them separated so we have first one two three four and then we have the numbers one two three four so did we unzip them we separated them they're not pairs now anymore with this unzip function this so this is how you can use the unzip function now it's time to look at the next transformation that we can use and that is association now what is association association transformations allows you to build maps from the collection elements and certain values associated with them in different association types the elements can be either keys or values in the association map we're going to see what this means and uh, the basic association function is the association associate with which creates a map in which the elements of the original collection are keys and the values are produced from them by the given transformation function so let's see an example with, uh, with this so i'm going to delete this code because uh, it will make the output uh, hard to understand because we have so many things here and I'm gonna type val numbers I'm gonna put equals I'm gonna type list of and I'm gonna type here one two 
3 and 4. Now I'm going to type here print line numbers and we are going to use the association associate with the function. So we type associate with and this is going to produce uh, as I said previously it's going to produce a map in which the elements of the original collection are keys. So the keys of this map are going to be those elements and uh, the values are going, to maybe, are going to be produced by what expression we define here inside the parentheses. So I'm going to define here it. So I'm going to type it dot length. So now if you run this, you're going to see the keys being one and then you're going to see the value being the length of that uh, specific element. So if you run this, We get the key 1, the value 3, the key 2, the value 3, then we get 3, the value is 5, then we get 4, and the value is 4. So what has happened now is that the associate with function created a map in which the elements, the key, ele the key are the elements of the collection. So those are the keys inside our map and the values of uh, those uh, with associated with those associ associated with those keys are produced by the expression that we define here by it that length so basically going to use the length of that uh, specific element and it's going to be the value so this is why i have 1 3 2 3 3 5 and so on now for building maps with collection elements as values there is a function called associate by it takes a function that returns a key based on an element's value and uh, if two elements keys are equal only that uh, last one remains in the map so let's look at this one so i'm going to type here print line and i'm going to put here numbers So we type numbers dot associate by and now here we're going to define the expression which is going to build the key because now the the associate by function is going to build a collection which the elements now are not keys like we had previously but they are values so here in the expression we need now to define how the key for those respective values that we have here is going to be created so we type here it dot first dot uppercase so this is what what is this is going to do it's going to create a key it's going to use on let's say that we have element one and it's going to uh, take element one it's going to take the first letter of the element one and it's going to uppercase it and we're going to have o and as the key we're going to have o and as the value we're going to have one and uh, for the next ones, uh, it will be the same. So now if I run this code, as you can see, now the, the values are, uh, now uh, the collection elements are the values here. So they are the values. So previously the collection elements were the keys. And uh, the keys were built by the expression that we defined here by this. So we have O and we have T and we have 4 and we, we, we have uh, T uh, only one time and no, we don't have 2 and 3 because uh, you cannot have uh, duplicated keys in a map so this is why we have one, only t one T here so uh, this is associate uh, so this is association now associate by can also be called with a value transformation function and to do, to do that, we just type here print line numbers dot associate by. Now we need to apply a transformation now on the key and on the value. And how gonna how gonna do that? We we can uh, type here. Actually, let's delete this because we don't need curly braces. We put parentheses and we type here key. And we have a suggestion key selector so we're going to apply the first transformation on the key 
So we type key selector that named argument and we put curly braces. And here we type it, so the key dot first dot uppercase. So now what we're saying here, apply this transformation for every key in, uh, in, in, in the map that is going to be built. So apply this transformation for every key that is in the map that is going to be built. So we're saying to uppercase, uh, to take the first letter and uppercase it. Then we also need to apply a transformation for the value. We put, put comma here at the end of our uh, curly brace. And we type here value, we also have a name argument. We put again curly braces. And here we're gonna type it that length. So this is the transformation that is gonna be applied to all the values in the map that is gonna be built. So this is the transformation. So this is how all the keys in the, in the in the map that is going to be built are going to be uh, changed. So the first letter is going to take, this thing is going to take the first letter of, of the keys and it's going to uppercase it. This will, uh, will uh, take the length of uh, the, the, all the values in the, in the, the, in the, in the map that is going to be built and it's going to display the, the length of that uh, element. So if you run this, we get 0, 3, T, 5, F, 4. So we have the first letter, uppercase, and then we have the length, 3, then we have T, we have the letter uppercase, and we have the value 5, the length of that uh, uh, element. Then we have F, so we have a f a f 4, and we have the, the, the transformation apply on that uh, element, on this element, on uh, on four and we have the length and we have four. So this is how we can use transformation, transformations with the associate by function. And uh, next we're gonna look at the uh, next transformation fac function and that is flatten. Now it's time to look at the next transformation function that we can use and that is the flatten function. But first let's see why you'll need to use this flatten function in the first place. So I'm gonna add a comment here called flatten. And I'm going to create a variable here, so I'm going to type val, it's going to be called numbers sets. And this is going to be a list with list. So I'm going to type here list of, and inside the list, I'm going to, I'm going to type set of. So we have a list inside, the, inside of a list. And I'm going to provide some values to our set of, like one, two, three, then another set of, four, five, and six. Then another set of seven, eight, and nine. So what we are having now is we have a list within a list where the index of this list is its own list. So we have a list of sets of ints. Now, if you want to loop through this list, if you want to display the elements in this list, uh, it is not that easy because you will first need to loop because let's say that because what we have here is what is called a multi-dimensional array. So more specifically, what we have here is a two-dimensional array. And at the index zero, we have a list. At the index one, we have another list. And at the index two, we have another list. And to navigate to this list, we need to first get inside that uh, list that is at that, at that specific index to loop to that list. And then we need to move to the next index and to, to loop through that list to that next list, which is at the, that, that index. But now let's see first how we can access one individual element from our two dimensional array. So from our array of arrays. And to do that, to type here print line, I'm gonna put number set. And if we, we put square brackets and we define the index from uh, which from which list we want to access the element. And now I want to access the element nine and the element nine is stored at the index two. So we put two 
and let's say that I want uh, and uh, I want to access as I said the, the element line now to access the element line I need to go within this list and use the index to get the element 9 and the element 9 is stored at the index 2 so I'm gonna put square brackets 2 but this for whatever reason doesn't work with a list of sets and we need to change this to array of array of also those also change it to array of array of also array of and now uh, everything will work fine so array of so if you run this so now we are accessing the index to where the array uh, uh, is stored or uh, our number is stored and we get the element 2 we get element 9 so now if I run this you're gonna see 9 output in the console So we get nine. So this is how you can access one individual element uh, from our uh, multi-dimensional array. So I'm gonna delete this. I'm gonna change it back to to a list of and to set of. So let's type list of set of set of and set of. And now let's see how we can loop through this uh, two-dimensional array. And to do that, we type here four. And we type numbers. I type specific numbers because this is gonna, as as you can see, uh, gonna hold on, hold the numbers, the set of numbers, four numbers in number sets. So now you we are you, we are getting the. As you can see here, this is of type is uh, the, the type set of ints. So this uh, basically gets the element at the number set index, let's say zero, and it gets the first set. And now we need to loop through that set. So another four number in numbers. So now we are looping through the list to through the set which is inside the list at the index zero, at the index zero. And I'm gonna add the print line to add to to output that number. I'm gonna type here number, and also I'm gonna add the space here. So I'm gonna add the print line here, and I'm gonna type here for or slash n. Now if you run this, as you can see, you have on the output one, two, three. Then we have a, a space four, five, and six. Then seven, eight, and nine. But uh, we achieve this by using uh, a loop and then we use another loop. So we have a loop inside the loop. We have a nested loop in order to get uh, to the to this uh, two dimensional array because uh, as I said, the, in, the index of this array is its own list. So it contains a list. Now with the flatten, uh, with the flatten uh, function, what we can do is that we can convert this uh, two dimensional array in one dimensional array. So you don't need to use these nested for loops in order to loop through to them. It will return the nested, uh, the nested, uh, uh, it, will provide, it will provide access to the nested collection elements without you needing to loop through this uh, uh, two dimensional array. It will, uh, it will basically take that two dimensional array and it will convert it in one dimensional array and you will not need to create uh, to have this nested loop inside you have to have this loop inside the loop in order to to display the numbers so to, to do that to type here uh, val numbers let's say flatten equals to number sets so our, our uh, list with list dot flatten now, if you look at the type here, now this is a list of ints. You no longer have a list of sets of ints. So this is uh, very, very uh, uh, informative because it tells us that this now is just simply a list of ints. It's not a list with a set which is uh, which uh, which uh, itself is also a, a, a list of ints. So this converts that two-dimensional array in one-dimensional array.
And because of that, now it's much easier to get one element from our list because now our list is not a two-dimensional array, it's just one-dimensional array. So if I type here print line, and uh, let's say that I want to get the element 9, I'm gonna type here uh, numbers flatten, square brackets, and I'm gonna type here 8 because it's stored at the index 8. So now if I run this, So we get 9 here. And uh, as you can see, this is much easier than uh, with uh, the, the two di 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 dimensional array. So this is what the flatten function is doing, is converting the the two dimensional array or a, if a, a multi dimensional array in, into one dimensional array. So now let's look how we can loop through our uh, one di dimensional array. So let's delete this. And if you want to, to loop through this, you just type for number in numbers flatten. And we add here a print line number. And let's comment this code. And if you run this code, Now we get the number displayed one uh, after another, so we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. And we got this because our uh, function, our flatten function, our transformation flatten function is uh, transforming, is converting our uh, two dimensional array in one dimensional array. So it's easier for us to get the elements and to loop, loop through them. So this is what the flatten uh, function is doing. And uh, next we're gonna look at the string representation and the functions that we can use uh, for, the, for the string representation. So I'm going to close the console. Now it's time to start a discussion about string representation. So if you need to retrieve the collection content in a readable format, you can use functions that transform the collections to strings. And there are two functions to do that, the join to string and the join to. The join to string builds a single string from the collection elements based on the provided arguments. The join to does the same but appends the result to the given appendable object. And what that means is that it's going to add the text to the uh, object on which that uh, function, the join to function is called. You're going to see an example with this immediately. And uh, now I'm going to create a variable called numbers, well, numbers. I'm going to put equals, I'm going to call it actually numbers strings equal and I'm going to type here list of and I'm going to put here uh, the text one, two, three and four. Now if you want to retrieve the the, if you want to get the string representation of this list, if you just type here print line and you, type, you put here numbers strings and if you run this, we get one, two, three and four. But this I, I think is calling the two string function. It's not uh, because we're not using the join to string function. And I don't like those uh, square brackets i want them to be uh, separated by comma with spaces uh, to get the to get that just type here print line so let's put here print line and to type numbers to string dot join to string and uh, we don't we delete this and we put parentheses. Now, if you run this, you'll see now uh, the string representation of our list. They are going to be separated by comma when we uh, it's going to have a, it's going to have a spaces. Now, let's look at the join to function. And for that, I'm uh, going to define another list down here. So I'm going to type here. Uh, let's press Control Alt to format the code. So I'm going to type here uh, val is going to be called list string. 
and now I'm gonna use something called a string buffer and this is like uh, the string type uh, is a little bit different but uh, it's gonna allow us to do uh, uh, it's, it's gonna allow us to present uh, how the join to function works so string buffer and we put parentheses and here we define our text and we're gonna type the list of numbers and I'm gonna put uh, colon so we type here the list of numbers colon now to use the join to function we just type here another print line we, we, we type number string number strings dot join to and as you can see this ref, uh, receives a buffer and this is the buffer that we created here so I'm gonna press uh, enter and we're gonna type I'm gonna uh, give us the argument the listing that we created and what is this this is gonna do is gonna append this text that we have here in front of all of our uh, elements that we have in our list number strings so now if you run this code as you can see it added the text the list of numbers that we have here to our number strings in front so we have the list of numbers one two three and four now if you want to build a custom string representation you can specify its parameters in a function arguments which are the separator prefix and postfix and the result will start with the prefix and end with the with the postfix and the, se the separator will come will come after each element except the last so let's see how we can do that so uh, i'm gonna use uh, i'm gonna use the number numbers to string so i'm gonna type here uh, print line numbers to string and we type join join to string and, and we select this one with the we select this one with the which, which with the separator parameter and the type here separator so now we define the what is going to be the, the the separator here and we're going to put quotation marks and we're going to put this so this is going to be our separator between our elements next we're going to define the prefix so we put we put here uh, comma type prefix and now I'm gonna put the prefix and the prefix is gonna be the text start and colon so we put quotation marks start and colon and we also need to provide the postfix and to do that we put another uh, comma here so those are named uh, arguments which are uh, uh, defined in this function and join to string so we type here uh, postfix and we put colon end. Now, if you run this, you're gonna see them separated by this separator that we define here. It's gonna have the prefix start and it's gonna have at the end this postfix, which is comma and end. So now if you run this code, as you can see, we have start and we have one, then it's separated by the sign that we define here. Then have two, three, four, and we have the end. So we have our uh, postfix that we had defined here. Now, for bigger collection, you may want to specify a limit, so a number of elements that will be included into the result. And if the collection exceeds that size, uh, that limit, all the other elements will be replaced with a single value called the truncated argument. So let's see what all of this means. So. Let's say that I have a list called uh, numbers. Let's type here val numbers and I'm going to create a range from 1 to 100. So what we have here is uh, 100 numbers. And uh, let's say that I type here print line. But uh, first let's convert this to a list. So I'm going to put this in parentheses. So you put this in parentheses and you put at the end dot to list. And this is going to convert now uh, our range into a list. And now as you can see, the, uh, the type is a list of ints. And now if I type here numbers, and if I run this code, I'm going to get all of our numbers uh, displayed.
Now, with uh, as I said, with the join uh, join to string function, we can specify a limit and uh, also a truncate, which is going to be the thing which is going to be showed out after our uh, number uh, limit. So, what I can type here is I can type join to string, and uh, we choose uh, also one with parentheses. So here we type limit, the named argument limit. And let's say that I don't want to get all the numbers, as you can see here, from to, to 100. And I want to get only the uh, first 15 elements. To do this, we just type here limit 15. Then we type truncated. And that is going to be, uh, that t this truncated thing is going to be showed after our uh, limit number. So I'm going to put here uh, quotation marks, less than um, sign, dot, dot, and uh, greater than sign. So now if you run this, look at what we have in the output. Now we, get, we only have the f first 15 elements and uh, then for the next elements we only have this uh, 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 string that we typed here, this, uh, this expression that we have here. And we can change this, you can change this let's say to 25. So if you run this now, you'll see only the first 25 elements displays. So this is how you can use the join to string with the limit name argument and with the truncated. Now, Let's say that you want to customize the representation of elements of, el of the elements themselves. You need to, uh, in that case, you need to provide the transform function. So what we can do is uh, that we can type here uh, print line, let's say, and I'm going to type uh, number strings, put dot, join to string, and we choose this one with curly braces. And here I'm going to define how this uh, this uh, uh, list is going to be transformed. So how it's going to be changed. So I'm going to type here quotation marks, element, and I'm uh, going to put colon. We're going to put uh, dollar sign. I'm going to put it dot uppercase. So we're going to uppercase uh, all the elements. So if I run the code now, now get element and get one. So you get and you get one um, uppercase and element. You get two uppercase element, three uppercase element, four uppercase. So this is how you can use the transformation. Uh, we can this way you can transform your uh, list using the join to string function. So this is our discussion about the string representation and now I'm going to move to the next section. So I'm going to end the video now. Now it's time to start a discussion about filtering. So what is filtering? Filtering is one of the most popular tasks in collection processing. In Kotlin, filtering conditions are defined by predicates and that is lambda function that take a collection element and return a boolean value. True means that the given element matches the predicate, false means the opposite. The standard library contains a group of extension functions that let you filter collection in a single call. Those functions leave the original collection unchanged, so they are available for both multiple and read-only collections. To operate the filtering result, you should assign it to a variable or chain the function after filtering. Now, the basic filtering function is filter. When called with a predicate, filter returns the collection elements that match it. For both list and set, the resulting collection is a list. For map, it's a map as well. Now, let's define a, a variable here called numbers. So let's type here val numbers. I'm going to put uh, equals to list of. And uh, I'm going to type here one two, three, and four. Now, if you want to filter this list, what you need to do is let's create another variable here called longer than, than three. 
I'm going to put equals and I'm going to type numbers dot and we type filter so filter and we choose this one and here we defined how our list so we could define the expression which is going to uh, determine how our list is going to be is going to be filtered so we're going to type here it so the element that length let's say greater than three now if we, I add a print line down here, print line. Now, this list is gonna contain all the elements from our uh, numbers list, which are longer than three. So if I put here longer than three, and if I run this, we get three and four, because those are the only string numbers which have a length longer than three. So I'm gonna close the console. Next, let's see how we can filter a map. And for that, I'm going to create another variable called numbers map. Now put equals to is going to be equals to map of. And I'm going to define here the key is going to be a string key one. The value is going to be one, comma, then key two, 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 then key three. Two, three, and now I'm gonna put key 101, two, 101, the value. Now, if you want to filter now this map, I'm gonna create another variable called filtered map, and it's gonna be equal to our numbers map, but it's gonna be filter. So I'm gonna, gonna type that numbers map that filter. And now I'm gonna filter filter the map both by the key and uh, by the value. So you type here it dot key dot ends with. So we we want to filter it first by the key, and we want that key to end with a specific character, and that character is gonna be one. And so we put the operator end. We want the the value to be greater than one hundred. So we put here it that value greater than 100 and the only key which satisfy this condition that we define here is only is the key is this key so now if i add the print line here and if i type filtered map so the map which was filtered using the expression that we define here now if you run this you're gonna see you're gonna see this in the output because this is the only one which satisfies the condition. So we get key 101 and we get the value 101. So this is how you can filter a map using the, both the key and uh, the value. Now, the predicates in filter can only check the values of the elements. If you want to use element position in the filter, use filter indexed. It takes a predicate with two arguments, the index and the value of an element. To filter correction by a negative condition, use filter not. It returns a list of the elements for which the predicate yields false. So let's see how we can do this. So I'm, I'm gonna declare two variables down here. Val filtered index is gonna be equal to numbers or a variable that is defined above dot filter index. And this is gonna take uh, two parameters, index and the value. So I'm gonna type here. Actually, we need to put curly braces. Index. Let's change this to value. Actually, let's keep it as S. Control Z. And here we're gonna define our uh, expression by uh, by which uh, our uh, list is gonna be filtered. So I'm gonna type here that first I want the index to not be equal to zero. And 
I, I also want that the value of uh, the element. So actually let's change this to value to, to make more sense. So let's type here value because we're talking about the, those ones. So I want the value of that string. So the value that length, I want, I want it to be less than five. All right, so this is the transformation if you want. This is not, not a transformation. This is how we want to filter our uh, numbers list that we define above. I want to filter both by the index. So this is why we use the filter index and also by the value. And I want the index to not be equal to zero. This is the first condition for the filtering. And I also want, so we use the end operator, that the value of uh, the element, the length, to be less than five. Now, if I print this, so if I add here a print line, but uh, first let's also let's also use the uh, filter not. So I'm gonna type here val. So val filtered not, and I'm gonna type equals numbers dot filter not curly braces, and we type here it dot length, so the value of the element to be less than equal to three. Now, if we output those two in the console, so if I add here print line, and I'm gonna output um, filter index, this should be filter index, so let's refactor this. So let's type here in the in the I type it wrong. So let's type here edx actually. It will make more sense. But I have edx, so why? Anyway, so I'm gonna output that first. Then I'm gonna add here a print line, and I'm gonna type filtered not. And filter not, as I said, is gonna return a list of the elements for which the predicate yields false. Now, if you run those two, look what you're gonna have on the output. So this is the output for our uh, first, for this print line and for this print line. So let's think about what we have here. First, we have two and four. And um, we define the filter here first the index should not be equal to zero so the one is first excluded and we also want to that to the value that length to be less than five so the only ones which are for which the value is less than five is the two and four because the length of the three is uh, bigger than five because it has a length of zero one two three four and uh, the length is five, but I want the length to be less than five, not less than equal than five. So this is why this is not included and you only have two and four. Next, uh, now use the filter not and it's gonna, as I said, it's gonna return a list of elements for which the predicate, for which this expression is gonna yield false. So it's gonna go through all of uh, our elements and it's gonna return the elements for which this is false. So uh, we get three and four because those are the only ones which are uh, not less than equal to three. They are greater than equal to three. So this is why we have here three and four because this returns if returns the elements if the uh, the the length of the element is less than or equal to three. So this is why we get here three and four. And there are also functions that narrow the element type by filtering elements of a given type. So there is a function called filter is instance, which returns a collection of elements of a given type being called. Uh, so let's see how you can use that. But first, let's create a val mixed Let's call it mixed list. I'm gonna put equals and I'm gonna type list of. And I'm gonna define some mixed elements here. So I'm gonna type here, let's say um, one, 
two, three, then some chars like A, B, C. Now some strings, let's type here. Hello world, another string, Alex, and uh, let's also type uh, a boolean. So let's type here, let's say false. Now, there is a function, as I said, which, which uh, narrows the element type by filtering the elements of a given type. So we can use this function called filter is instance. So what you can do here is we can we can type mixed list dot filter is instance. So we choose, uh, I think, this uh, one, not this one. Filter is instance is instance. So why? So mixed list dot filter is instance and here we uh, inside the angle brackets we define the generic type for which this list is going to be filtered so let's first choose the char char then i'm going to put dot for each so i'm going to use the for each loop and i'm going to add print line and i'm going to type it here so i'm going to type the parameter which is the it char. So now if I run this, we will get only the chars being displayed here because it is filtering by using the instance of chars. So you get the chars. If I change this to to int, now I'll get the integers from our mixed list. So if I run this, now get the integers one, two, three that we have defined here. And uh, if I change this to, let's say, uh, string, I will get the strings inside our mixed list because filter is instance. It's going to take the specific type that we type here and then it's going to loop through all of the types which are of this type in this list. So if I run this, I'm going to see hello world and Alex. So we get hello world and Alex. Also, I can uh, filter for boolean values. So if I type here boolean, it's gonna it's gonna output in the cursor the one boolean value that we have here, which is false. So if I run this, I get false. So this is how you can use the filter is instant function on uh, types to filter the mixed uh, list. And you can also uh, put that because this returns the list, this entire thing a filter list you can put that for each to call the the, the this the for this for each lambda function and then we output them in the console uh, the next thing that you can look and that we are gonna look at is called partition so i'm gonna add a comment here but i'm gonna hide the console first so i'm gonna put here a comment and i'm gonna type here partition par t t1 so partition and this is an alter another filtering function called partition and it filters a collection by a predicate and it keeps the elements that don't match in a separate list so you have a pair of list as a return value the first list is containing the elements that match the predicate the predicate and the second one is uh, containing everything else from the original collection so we're going to take again our uh, numbers that we have defined above. So I'm going to type here uh, file and to, to get this partition we put we put parentheses and here we type match. So this is going to be the values which are going to be uh, matched by the predicate and uh, I'm going to type here rest and here we're going to be stored the rest of the value which, which don't match the expression, the predicate that is going to be defined. And I put here equals numbers dot partition and we type here it dot length 
greater than 3. Now, if I add the print line here, I can print first the match. Let's press Ctrl D and now I can uh, print the rest of the elements which don't match this, this condition, this expression that is defined here. So if I run this code, you will see first all the elements which are greater than 3 and then we're going to see the rest of the elements which are not greater than 3. But uh, let's add a space here to make things more clear. So I'm going to add here a print line, quotation marks, forward slash n. So let's run this again. So we get 3 and 4. So those are the elements which are, are coming from our uh, match uh, list, which is defined here, uh, which is uh, which satisfy this condition, which is greater than 3. So we have 3 and 4. So the length is greater than 3. And then we have 1 and 2. So those are the rest of the elements which are not satisfying this condition that is defined here. So we have 1 and 2. So this is how you can use the partition function to, to, to get, uh, basically to get a pair in which the return value, the first, is list, the first is the list containing the elements that match the predicate and the same code is the one containing everything else from the original collection. So this is how you can use the, the partition function. So now I'm going to end the video and see you in the next video. Now it's time to look at testing predicates. And uh, those are functions that simply test a predicate against the collection elements. And we have three functions, any, which returns true if at least one of the element matches the given predicate. We then we have none, which returns true if none of the elements match the given predicate. And then we have all, which returns true if all of the elements match the given predicate. So let's test all of them. So I'm going to type here print line, numbers dot, let's start with any. So we put any. So here we type it dot ends with, and let's put, let's say, e. Then add another print line numbers dot none it should be curly braces it that ends with let's say w and print line numbers dot all let's say it dot length so if, if if the length of all the elements is greater than one so now if you run this all, all of those are gonna return either true or false so we get true true and true this is because first we're testing any and this, this returns true if at least one of the elements matches the given predicate so it is true we have uh, two elements which ends with uh, E, we have three and uh, one. So this is why it returned true there. Then we check to see if uh, none all of the elements ends with W. So we check to see if none of the elements uh, in our uh, numbers ends with W. And it's true, none of our elements with ends with W. So we have true in the output. Then we check numbers that all. So we check into if all the elements, the, the length of all the elements, the element strings that we have here, one, two, and three, are greater than one. And it's true, all of them are greater than one. So this why I have true, true, and true. So this is how you can use the test predicates uh, on your uh, collections. Now it's time to look at the plus and minus operators. So in Kotlin, plus and minus operators are defined for collections. They take a collection as the first operand and the second operand can be either an element or another collection. The return value is a new read-only collection. And let's look at an example with this. I'm going to type here val numbers. I'm going to put equals to. So and now I'm going to type here multiple list of. So multiple list, a list to, with, with, to which you can add and remove elements. And I'm going to type here one two, 
3 and 4. Now if you want to add an element to this list you need to type here numbers that add and here you need to specify let's say 5 and now this new element is going to be added to the list. But with the plus and minus operator we can do, do, we can do this in a, another way. So you can type here uh, but I'm going to put this in another list. So you can type here val plus list. So we put equals to and we type numbers plus and we type 5. And now this element is going to be added to our list that we have here. It's going to be added to the, the, the string 5 and it's going to be stored in this plus list. Now let's look at the minus operator. So you type here val. I'm going to call this minus list and I'll put equals to and I'm going to type numbers. So now I'm going to use the minus operator. So I put minus and we type minus multiple list of and we put here, let's say um, three and four. So we type here three and four. I have an underline. Let's see what it says. Now, anyway, let's uh, run our code to see what we get in the output. But we need to add some print lines to get something that. So I'm gonna add here a print line plus list. And another print line minus list. Now if I run this again, we get 1, 2, 3, 4 and our uh, 5 element added to our numbers list from our plus list which is outputted here. And then we get 1 and 2 because 3 and 4 were removed using the minus operator. So this is how you can use the minus and plus operators with uh, collections. So this is our discussion about the plus and minus operators and I'm going to look at, we're going to uh, move to the next section. So I'm going to close the console and I'm going to end the video. Now it's time to start a discussion about grouping. So the Kotlin standard library provides extension functions for grouping collection elements. The basic function group by takes a lambda function and returns the map. In this map, each key is the lambda result, so the result of that expression inside the lambda function. And the corresponding values is the list of elements on which this result is returned. This function can be used, for example, to group a list of strings by their first letter. It can also call group by with a second lambda argument, a value transformation function. In the result map of group by with two lambdas, the keys produced by key produced by key selector function are mapped to the result of the value transformation function instead of their original elements. So let's see what uh, all of this means by looking at an example. So if I type here val val numbers and I'm going to put list of again one Two, three, four, and five. Now we, I can add here a print line. I can type numbers and I can type here that group by and I'm going to group it by it that first so the first letter in uh, in one uh, of our elements that uppercase and now we're going to look at the next uh, the next group by with the key selector and uh, with the uh, transformation function so i'm going to type here print line numbers dot group by So we have this one key selector. So we type here key selector equals, and here we put uh, 
curly braces and we type it that first so the first letter you know, in our element so first it should be here we put uh, a comma and we type value so the how the value of uh, the, the value of this list is going are going to be transformed and here we also put curly braces and we put it that upper case so put it curly braces it should be it that upper case let's press ctrl alt l to format the code and now let's run our code to see what we get in the output so we get for the first one number that numbers that group by for uh, and we have this lambda it that first that upper case it takes the first letter in upper cases so you get wo so then you get one we get t we get two we get f, f we get four we get uh, then we, we use this one which on which we 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 uh, you we group uh, elements with a second lambda argument with a value transformation function and the result uh, map of group by with two lambdas are the keys produced by the key selector and the function are uh, the function are mapped to the result of the value transformation function so the results are mapped to th th this transformation that is defined here so this this is what creates the keys this is what creates the keys this uh, lambda function and this is what creates the the the, the values so we get o because we get it that first so the first letter and we get one because we, this is the value so the value is uppercase we get one so we get one here then we get uh, again it that first for the for our element so we get t then we get two and i get uppercase then we get f lowercase f and we get four and uh, and uh, five so this is our discussion about grouping and uh, my suggestion for you is to play with the code try different values for the key selector for the value transform for uh, try to group the elements by uh, different expressions and just uh, play with the code until you get uh, get uh, until you get uh, comfortable with the code now it's time to start a discussion about retrieving collection parts and the kotlin standard library contains the extension functions for retrieving parts of a collection these functions provide a variety of ways to select elements for the result collection listing their position explicitly specifying the result size and others and we're going to start with the first function called slice which returns a list of collection elements with given indices. The indices may be based either as a range or as a collection of integer values. So I'm going to create first the main function. I'm going to type val numbers. I'm going to create a list of. And I'm going to type here 1, 2, 3, 4, five and six now to use the slice function we simply add here a print line and we'll type here numbers dot slice and we create here a range so we type one dot dot three and uh, next we're gonna add another print line and we're gonna type numbers that slice and we're gonna put here now zero dot dot four and we're gonna type step two Right, so it should be slice, not sublist. So slice here. Slice. And I'm gonna add another print line here. Numbers dot slice. And I'm gonna add now a set here. So I'm gonna type set of and I'm gonna type three five 
and uh, zero. So let's press Control Alt to format the code. Now, if you run this code, look at the output. So you first get the first three elements, we get uh, two, three, and four, because uh, we start in from the index one, so we get two, three, and four. Then uh, we get from zero to four, so we get one, but we don't get the two because we have this step two, which steps the second element, and then we have three and five, because uh, it's stepping for the four. So this is what step two is doing here. And uh, next we have a number slice and we get four, six, and uh, one. But we get them as the string representation. We don't get them as uh, as uh, in, uh, integers. So, uh, all right. Now, let's look at the next functions and those are the take and drop. And to get the specified numbers of elements starting from the first, we can use the take function. For getting the last elements, use the take last. When, call, when, when called with a number larger than the collection size, both functions return the whole collection. To take all the elements except a given number of uh, first or last elements, call the drop or the, and the drop last function respectively. So I'm gonna Add some print lines here. I'm gonna add print line, and I'm gonna type numbers that take three. Another print line numbers that take last. also three, then another print line, numbers that drop one, and another print line, numbers that drop last five. Now, if you run this code, Look what we get in the output. But let's add a space here. So I'm gonna add a print line. Quotation marks for OCSN. Now let's run this code again. So we get uh, for, you get numbers take three, and this function basically takes only three. Uh, three elements from our list. Then numbers take last three is gonna take the last three elements from our list. So we have four, five, and six. Then we have uh, print, uh, print line numbers drop one. So we have two, three, four, five, and six, and the first element is dropped. So this, this is what this function is doing. Next, we have numbers that drop last five, and this function is basically dropping all the uh, five, the last uh, five uh, elements, and we have only the one. So this is what those functions are doing. You can also use predicates to define the number of elements for taking or dropping, and there are four functions similar to the ones described above, and those are take while, take last while drop while and drop drop last while and let's look at all of them but i'm gonna put a space between uh, our code that we have here so i'm gonna add the print line here quotation marks for all session and i'm gonna add here a print line so i'm gonna type here numbers that take while And here we define the predicate. I'm gonna type not it that starts with 
f in quotation marks. Now another print line, numbers that take last while and we define here the predicate it not equal to 3 not equal to 3 another print line we type numbers dot drop while and we define the expression the predicate which is going to be applied for our drop last while so it should be drop while here and we type it dot length equals equals to 3 and we add another print line numbers dot drop last while and we type here it contains it dot contains quotation marks i now if you run this code we first get uh, 1, 2 and 3 so because here we're checking we're uh, because we're using the logical not operated we, get, we want all the elements which don't start with F so we don't have 4 and 5 we have only 1, 2 and 3 next we have numbers that take last while and we define the expression for which is going to be uh, returned the elements by it not equal to 3 so you have only have 4 5 and 6 and uh, the 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 3 the 3 is, is missing and we don't have one because take last while only takes the uh, last elements so this is why we have only Four, five, four, five, uh, and six, so you, and you don't have three, so it, it doesn't care about the f first element or uh, about uh, the second element. Next, we have uh, numbers drop while it that length equals to three, and here we have uh, we have uh, so it that length equals to three, and we have three, four, five, and six, so this condition is satisfied so it, it basically it uh, drops all the elements which are equal to 3 so we have 3 4 5 and 6 and all of those are bigger than 3 and the ones which are uh, equal to 3 respectively 1 uh, 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 2 and uh, let's see and 6 actually 6 is appearing here so 1 2 I don't know why 6 is appearing but this is basically saying that uh, it should drop while it that length equals uh, to 3 so it basically drops all the elements which are uh, equal to uh, with the length 3 so we have this why we have here uh, three four five and six six should not be but i don't know why it's here now the next that we have here is numbers drop last while so again this is uh, focus uh, specifically about the last element so it contains i so we get uh, uh, one two three and four so because this drop last while is basically basically dropping all the elements or the last elements which contain uh, which uh, contains i so we have uh, 6 5 so we have uh, drop last while so we have it that contains i so 
so it drops all the element which contains size so sorry for what i said previously so this is why i have here one two three and four and uh, the five and the six are missing because it, it basically drops the, la the all the elements which contains the letter i so this is how you can use the take and drop the next function that you can uh, use is called chunked and um, if you want to break a collection into parts of a given size, then you can use the chunked function. Chunks take a single argument, the size of the chunk, and returns a list of uh, list of uh, the given size. The first chunk starts from the first element and contains the size of the elements, and the second chunk holds the next size elements, and so on. The last chunk may be, may have a similar size. So, if I have here, uh, let's change this to numbers, strings, and uh, let's type here uh, val numbers. While I was changing that, I should use refactor. So, let's use a refactor, rename numbers strings so it will be changed in all the places where we're using that and here we have numbers and uh, i'm gonna put equals and i'll put uh, parentheses zero dot dot 13 and i'm gonna put that to list to convert this to a list and we add a print line to see how this chunk function is working so we add a print line let's close the console and to type here numbers that that chunked and would put three so it's gonna chunk our elements into three into into um, basically elements of three so we have zero one two three four five six seven eight and they are both on on uh, chunks of three elements so this is what this chunks is doing so this is why i have here this result and um, the next function that we're going to look at is called windowed and um, and we, we can also use a transformation on our chunked element so i can add here a print line we type numbers that chunked chunked which we also choose the size uh, three then you put curly braces and here we're going to define how our chunked elements are going to be transformed so we put it that sum so it's going to sum the chunked elements so if I press Control Alt L to format the code, and now if I run this, look what we're gonna see in the output. So we get uh, you get first the chunked elements here in in three in three elements, and then we have uh, our chunked elements, but they are summed up. So we have uh, first three because zero plus one plus two is three. Then we have 3, 4, 5 because that is 12, then we have 7, 8, uh, 7, uh, 6, 7, 8, and we have 21, then we have uh, uh, 10, 11, and 9, and we have uh, 30, and so on. So this is uh, how uh, you can use uh, the chunked function to chunk the elements together by a given size, and you can also use the transformation function to do a transformation on them, like adding them. So as you can see, with the, we have added them here. Next, we're going to look at the next function function that we can use, and that is called the windowed function. And we can retrieve all possible ranges of the collection elements of a given size with the window function. The function of getting them is called windowed. It returns a list of element ranges that you would see if you were looking at the collection through a slightly window of, of the given size. Unlike chunked, window returns element ranges, windows, starting from each collection element. All the, all the windows are returned as an element of a single list. So if I have here, uh, 
the let's create another uh, variable here let's call it uh, val numbers string 2 and we're gonna type here uh, let's say uh, or I can assign uh, I can assign the number strings here so I'm gonna type here number strings now what I can do here I, I can add a print line and I, I can type numbers strings to dot windowed and we choose let's say three and let's see what we have on the output so now if you run this code I should have added here a space so let's add a print line here backslash for slash n So we have one, two, three, then we have two, three, four, we have three, four, five, and four, five, six. So this is similar to chunks, but windowed provides more flexibility because uh, you can uh, specify a step which defines a distance between the first element and, and two uh, DHN windows. By default, the value is one, so the result contains windows starting from all elements. If you increase the step to two, you'll receive only windows starting from the add element, first, third, and so on. And finally, you can apply transformation to the return ranges right away. To do this, you provide the transformation as a lambda function when calling uh, windowed. So it's similar to chunked. And um, so with this, I think uh, we end our discussion about retrieving collection parts and see you in the next video. And if you find this uh, confusing, don't worry because it's so confusing for uh, for me, for me and for probably other people uh, because uh, it takes time to to get used to this. And my suggestion for you just play with the code, change the the parameters, play with the functions, try different. Uh, values and so on so see you in the next video now we're gonna look at some functions with which you can retrieve single elements from our collections and uh, the first one is one which retrieves uh, an element by its position so i'm gonna create uh, val numbers again numbers equals to list of and uh, we type here 1, 2, 3, and 4, and also 5. And let's say that I want to get the element at position 3. To do that, just add here a print line, and uh, we type numbers. dot element at and here you specify the position 3 so 0 1 2 3 so we're going to get 4 output it in the console so we get in the output as expected 4 now there are also, there are also two functions for retrieving the first and last element and to do that just add another print line here and to type numbers dot first so this is going to retrieve the first element and control D numbers dot last. So this is going to retrieve the first element one and last is going to retrieve the last element five. So if you run this, we get first four from our uh, this print line, then we get first one and we get the last five. And we can also retrieve uh, elements by condition. So we, I can type here, uh, I can type down here, or uh, or I will type it here. Actually, I'm gonna type it down here. So I'll add here a print line, numbers, let's say, dot first. And now I'm gonna retrieve by a condition. So I'll type first, I'm gonna choose this one with curly braces. And the condition is that I want to retrieve the first element for which the length is greater than 3. So I'm going to type here it dot length 
greater than 3 and I'm gonna add uh, I'm gonna press ctrl D because I'm gonna do the same thing for the last so I'm gonna retrieve all stuff by condition so I'm gonna type here numbers that last but I'm gonna change the condition I'm gonna change it to it that starts with uh, it that starts with the letter F so now we're retrieving the first element which is greater than 3 and next we're retrieving the last element which starts with the letter F so now if you run this we get 3 and 5 because 3 is the first element which is uh, has a length greater than 3 and can get 5 because this is the one the last element which uh, starts with uh, the letter uh, F and if you can add up space here if you want to make things more clear so we're gonna add the print line quotation marks backslash n actually forward slash n so if you run this we get 3 and 5 output in the console and we can also retrieve a random element from our uh, numbers so I can type here print line numbers dot random and this is gonna return a random number from our list of numbers so if I run this we get one and if I run this again get four so every time you run this you'll get uh, a random number and you can also check if the list is empty so we can type here print line numbers that is empty then that is going to return uh, true if the list is empty uh, and if the list is not empty it's going to return false so if you run this we get false so this is our discussion about how to retrieve single elements. See you in the next video. Now it's time to start a discussion about aggregate operations. So Kotlin collections contains functions for commonly used aggregate operations. And those are operations that return a single value based on the collection content. Most of them are well known and work in the same way as they do in other programming languages. And we have min or null and max or null, which return the smallest and the largest element respectively, and on empty collections they return null. Then we have average, which returns the average value of elements in the collection, then we have sum, which returns the sum of elements in the collection of numbers, and we have count, which returns the number of elements uh, in a collection. So let's declare a list, numbers, list of Let's put so let's put some numbers here like let's say six, six, ten, fourteen, four, um, let's say one hundred. Now let's press Control Alt to format the code and let's add the print line here. Let's put quotation marks and let's type the sum is dollar sign. and to type here uh, numbers dot sum numbers dot sum all right and uh, I, I'll add another print line and now this is gonna say the count is again dollar sign numbers that count another print line the average is again dollar sign numbers that average another print line and now I'm gonna say the max value is again dollar sign numbers dot max numbers dot max 
or null and I'll print line the mean value is dollar sign numbers that mean or null. Now, if you run this code, you're going to see in the output the corresponding uh, values for those expressions that we have here. So again, yeah, the sum is 134, the count is 5 because we have 5 elements here, the average is 26.8, the maximum value is 100, and the minimum value is 4. So this is how you can use those uh, aggregate operations and, 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 and those uh, aggregate uh, functions. And beside the, the regular sum, there is an advanced summas summation function called sum of that takes a selected function and returns the sum, sum of its application to all collection elements. And let me show you how this works. So you just type here. Uh, so we type here print line. The sum is dollar sign numbers that sum of we select this one and here you type it times two now if you run this what it's gonna do is it's gonna sum all the numbers like the first function that we have here so it's gonna sum 134 and it's multi it's gonna multiply that uh, that number by two so if you run this we get 268, which is 132 times, uh, 134 times 2. So this is how you can use the sum of with uh, this uh, transformation, which is going to basically multiply the list with a uh, number, with uh, the sum of the list with a number. So this is our discussion about aggregate operations, and see you in the next video. Now it's time to start a discussion about ordering, and in this video we're going to look at comparable and at comparator interfaces. So first I'm going to create uh, a list of numbers and uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to create a multiple list, so multiple list of, and I'm going to define some numbers here, not in a specific order. So we type two, let's say five, one, let's say 40, 20, 100 let's say 60 now what if i want uh, to order the num the numbers that i have in inside our uh, list numbers to do that you just need to, you type numbers dot and there is a function called sorted so if i type numbers dot sorted now our number our numbers are going to be sorted so if you type here for each print line it so now if you run this even though we didn't uh, type our numbers in uh, ascending order they're going to be sorted and as you can see they are sorted we have 1 2 5 20 40 60 and uh, 100 so they are sorted uh, by this function called sorted and why this is working this is working because if you click on this uh, sorted function or uh, actually if you type here uh, let's say let's say that I put a type here int and if I click on the type this type this type integer this, this class is implementing this thing called comparable and this comparable has a function called compare to so when we actually type when numbers that sorted what the, uh, what internally was happening is that the integer class was using the compare to function which is uh, which is uh, a function uh, which you want to which you need to implement if you implement the comparable interface to compare if uh, uh, to compare our numbers and to uh, based on that to uh, to swap them to to sort them and now let's say that uh, I have or let's say that I have a data class called laptop and it's gonna have a variable called brand gonna be of type string 
another variable called year this could be the the year when when this specific uh, uh, version was released on int ram so val ram also on int and the val let's say uh, price also an integer right now if i create here a, a list of laptops so if i type here var laptops equals to multiple list of and i type here laptop let's say uh, that i type here dell and uh, i put the year let's say 2021 the ram let's say that is four gigabytes ram and the price let's say that is six hundred dollars okay comma i'm gonna create another laptop here so another object i'm gonna type here let's call it acer it's gonna be let's say the year um, let's put 20 2020 the price let's say uh, the ram let's say that is eight gigabytes ram and uh, the price let's say that it's 100 dollars comma and let's create another laptop object so we type laptop and we create a, an apple laptop which is which you're gonna for which you're gonna choose the the year uh, let's say um, 20 2020 2022 and uh, for the ram let's say that it's 16 gigabytes ram and one thousand dollars for the price now if i type here laptops that sorted let's say that i want to sort the laptops as you can see while i'm typing the intellij is not giving me any hints to have this function sorted uh, uh, as uh, to fill in that function because that function is not uh, working on our uh, laptops list and why why is happening that that is happening because the IntelliJ doesn't know how we want to sort this laptop list that we have here because you want you can sort it in many ways you can sort it by the name you can sort it by the year you can sort it by the ram you can sort it by the price so when you say laptops are sorted the uh, IntelliJ is not uh, it's not uh, knowing what do you mean because previously it was working with our uh, integers or and with our integer class because the integer class if you type if you put the type here uh, back integer the integer class or the int class what it was doing actually it was inheriting from this comparable uh, interface and it was implementing the compare to function which is used when uh, you call the sorted uh, function and in, inside the uh, compare to function it has uh, defined its own logic for uh, comparing integers for comparing no whole numbers and what we need to do in order to be able to sort our list of laptops is we need to implement the comparable interface and we need to define our own logic uh, which is going to determine uh, how our list is going to be ordered by by which uh, uh, property by the year by the ram by the price so this is what you need to do and to do that you just put here a colon and we implement the interface comparable so we type here comparable and we have a suggestion we choose this one we put angle brackets and here we, we type laptop because we want to implement this we want to compare laptops so lap, laptops so this is why we put laptop there then we put curly braces and now we need to implement the function so click on that it says implement members you have the compare to function now here we need to define our logic which is gonna determine what makes uh, uh, here we're gonna define a logic which is gonna determine how our element is gonna be ordered by what criteria and I'm gonna order the the laptops first by the price, and to do that, to do that, you just type if, and to type this, and we typing this because this is gonna be called on, a, on an inst an instance of our laptop laptop class. It's gonna call the compare to function, and it's gonna compare with uh, another uh, argument. So if this that price we say here is greater than other 
that price, we, we return a positive number. So we type return one. And a positive value plus, uh, simply shows that the receiver object, so the object, this object is greater than the, the, uh, the object uh, which was passed. So this is what this means, this one. Else, else if, if the receiver object is not, uh, so if this that price is less than other that price, let's say, then we're going to return minus one, a negative number. So I'm going to put here minus one. And what this basically logic is going to do is going to swap them. So it's going to swap the elements based on this logic. Else, we're going to return zero, and that is going to mean that they are equal. So we type here return zero. And if you click here, it says that you can uh, write this in a different way. So if you click on this, and let's add the print line to see that our uh, if ifs uh, are called. So if I type here print line, I'm going to say in if statement dollar sign actually let's type swapping dollar sign this dot brand name with dollar sign other than brand so let's add this print line also in our else if and I'm not gonna add in, inside the S because our uh, we don't have elements which are equal, but you can uh, add that if you want. Now, if I type laptops that sorted, now I have a suggestion, and if I type for each, print line, it, so print the element. Now, if you run this, look, you're gonna see the elements sorted in uh, ascending order by their uh, their price so you see that we have first the brand the brand name Dell and we have uh, price six hundred dollars then we have the uh, price uh, we have laptop Acer and we have uh, eight hundred dollars then we have laptop uh, Apple the brand and you have the price one thousand dollars so they are so now they are sorted using our own logic which was defined inside this comparable interf interface and uh, which was defined uh, inside the which was defined by this comparable interface and which was defined inside this function compared to that we've uh, overrided inside our class and uh, as you can see if uh, you look you see here that it says if in if statement swapping acer with Dell. so yeah, the elements are swapped based on our roger in if statements it says swapping apple with uh, acer so they are uh, they are swapped based uh, on our logic so this is how you can use the comparable uh, interface but what if i want now to compare by the let's say uh, ram what can i do i can't uh, implement the comparable interface again here and i can't uh, uh, i i i can I can add the, that property here, but that is going to conflict with my logic with, for the price. So what can we do? And here comes into action comparator. With comparator, you can compare your uh, your list. You can uh, you can uh, you can order. Actually, I should say you can sort your uh, list using multiple properties. So you can order it by the uh, brand name you can order by the year you can order by the ram you can order by the price and uh, with compare uh, with the comparable interface you can do that just only by uh, one uh, property and uh, that is pretty uh, inflexible and is uh, not what we want and how uh, how to use uh, this uh, comparator to use the comparator we just type here class we're gonna call it comparator let's say uh, ram and is gonna extend from comparator so type comparator and you have the type and for the type here you want to compare laptop so you type laptop here angle brackets curly braces and press enter and now we need to override the compare function inside our class. So you override that function. And here again, let's change those to laptop one. 
So now we, now we have laptop one and laptop two, and we define um, the same logic. So we type here uh, return if because we need to return an integer if this dot ram actually not this dot ram laptop laptop one dot ram is greater than laptop two dot ram and we need to delete this nullables because you need to have some errors there and put curly braces return one else if else if laptop one dot ram is less than laptop two Lap laptop two dot ram then we're gonna return we're gonna put curly braces we're gonna type return minus one else we're gonna return zero now if I want to now to compare our uh, let's add a space here and I, I want to sort our elements based on the RAM I'm gonna add a print line here to add a space so I'm gonna have the back for session also here one so copy this paste it here should be print and now what we can do is we type laptops dot and we type here sorted with and which is we choose this one which has the parameter define a comparator and you're going to pass our comparator that we define here with the compare to function so i'm going to pass i'm going to type sorted with and we type comparator operator ram our class and create an instance and then we type that for each not this one for each print line it so now if you run this you're gonna see them sorted by their uh, by their RAM so if you run this as you can see uh, if you look at uh, if you look at the first, they are, they are first sorted by their price. So you have six hundred eight hundred one thousand dollars, and then we have them sorted by their RAM. So we have four uh, first the four, which is the Dell, and then we have the Acer, which is uh, eight uh, gigabytes RAM, and we have the Apple, which is sixteen. And uh, if you look, uh, actually they are in this order in the list. So let's change this to to let's say to sixteen. And this to to wait to to make it more clear. So let's run this again. So as you can see, they are still sorted. So we have first the Dell, which has four gigabytes of RAM. Then we have the Apple, which is eight. Then we have the Acer, which is sixteen. So this is why. So now it's sorting our list. This sorted with using comparator RAM that uh, we defined, we created, and then we loop through all our, our elements because that returns a list. So this is how you can use comparator. And if you want to, uh, to, to sort, let's say now the list by the year, you just create another comparator. So you type class, comparator, let's say year, and it's also gonna extend comparator, comparator, it's gonna have uh, for the type laptops, because gonna source laptops, curly braces. We implement the function compare, and we define the logic for comparing elements using uh, using the year. So let's delete these nullables. Let's type here laptop one, and here laptop two. And I'm gonna copy this code. I'm gonna paste it here. But I'm gonna change this from RAM to year. So year, year, also year. Year again, and we have a, an error here missing. So let's add a curly brace here. 
all right so now if i want to, to have the element sorted by the year we just type here let's put a space also print line quotation marks for us let's run and if i found the laptops to be sorted by the by the by the year i just type laptops that sorted weight and this expects a comparator so i'm gonna call our comparator that we created comparator year comparator year an instance of that then for each now this one again for each print line it so if you run this now we're gonna see the last element sorted by their year and have as you can see you have uh, we have them sorted by the ram so this is from uh, this one and now it's using comparator year so we're sorting them by this we have 2020 2021 and 2022 so this is not like the order that they are defined in, uh, in the list so this is how you can use comparable and comparator but if you think about there is a lot of code here to just uh, have uh, to have uh, our uh, our list sorted you have to if you want to uh, you have to you, you can use the compare the comparable and with the comparable you can uh, use it with just one property and if you want to use it with another property you have to create those comparators which gives you some flexibility but still you have a lot of code and uh, we can remove all of this code and use lambda uh, functions so i can delete all of this all of this comparable that we have here and instead of uh, using those comparators and all of this stuff, what I can do is I can delete all of this. I can delete all, all this also. Now, what I can do is I can add here laptops that sorted with, and here, so we choose this one sorted with, which uh, has this parameter comparator, press enter, and here we type compare by and here we type as uh, and this line of code that we have here we, uh, it what it actually is doing is creating a comparator but it's creating a comparator using a lambda expression so here you can type it dot it dot let's say uh, price right and then for each print line it so this is equivalent to creating that uh, uh, comparator here and uh, inheriting from the comparator interface and um, defining the logic for uh, 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 or, or ordering for sorting them so now if you if you run this this will have the same effect like the comparator uh, price that we have implemented previous as you can see they are ordered now by the price and i can do now another line of code so, so that laptops that sorted weight and we type here compare by we type it that uh, let's say uh, uh, ram dot for each print line and it now if you run this you're gonna have the same output let's add the space between them print line So let's add a space to see them to see the code more clearly and now as the as you can see the first they are sorted by their price and then they are sorted by their uh, their uh, ram memory so this code is equivalent to creating what we had previously with the comparator and implementing the that interface and the function and actually there is a shorter way even to do this we can delete this let's say so, so this sorted with and compare by, compa compare by and we can just type here sort by so this this will create internally the same thing that we had previously so if i type it that ram and i can do the same thing here i can delete all of this and i just could type here so laptop that sort by it that price now this will have the same effect like all the code that we had previously but now it's extremely concise and uh, easier to read you could just say laptops sorted by sorted them by their price sort the laptops by the ram so if you run this code 
you'll see the exact uh, output in the console because what this uh, function uh, is doing uh, actually we should uh, loop through them so let's add the print line here print line 8 so let's put here for each print line 8 so now if you run this you'll see the exact same uh, output with just this simple line of code so as you can see, you have the same output, you have them sorted by their price first and then they are sorted um, by their uh, RAM memory. And if you uh, hold control on the sorted by uh, function, as you can see, this actually internally calls the sorted width, which receives the comparator and it's calling the, comp the compare by. So this is like uh, a syntactical sugar for us which uh, makes the code uh, more concise, but internally it's using, it's using that uh, sorted width. And uh, if you want to use the sorted width, one advance uh, for using the sorted width, let's say that I type here another print line to add a space. Let's put for us less n, should be in quotation marks, for us less n. One uh, uh, good thing about uh, the sorted width, so let's type laptops that uh, sorted width and here we type uh, compare by let's say it that uh, year one thing that you can do with uh, the sorted width if you call it specifically sorted width function you can put that and then by so it will sort by year and then by um, I don't know let's say uh, it that uh, price so this is what we can, with, with what we can do with uh, sorted with you can sort it by year first and then by uh, by the price so if you run this as you can see they are sorted first by the year so and then by their uh, their price so this way we get this in the output now I'm gonna end this video and uh, you should uh, you should use this uh, this one always because it's concise, more readable, uh, very easy to 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 read and to and to type. It's in, uh, in contrast with what we had previously with uh, uh, creating that uh, comparators and implementing the comparator interface or the comparable. This is a lot a lot more concise and easier to read. So this is our discussion about the comparable and comparator interface. So this line of code, I repeat, this line of code that we have here, this sorted by it that RAM is creating internally that comparator that we talked about. Now we're just using this lambda function. So I'm gonna end the video now and see you in the next video. So there is one mistake that I did previously. So if I press Control Z to have this code, uh, when I run this code, uh, you, you didn't show the output the, uh, the list sorted by the year and then by the price. And that is because I forgot to add a for each to loop through our elements. So if I add a for each, and now if I run this, now you're going to see them uh, sorted first by the year and then by the price. Because previously it wasn't, so this is why it wasn't. And now if you look, they are sorted by the first by the year. So we have 2020, 2021, and 2020, and then by uh, by their price. So this is why previously uh, you saw this one, this output. And also I saw this output that, but uh, some way I uh, I didn't uh, didn't saw that I I forgot to add the for each here. So the, this is how we, uh, the, you can use the sorted uh, sorted width. You can um, sort it by more elements. You can put here I think another. Uh, then by not here here we can put another so that then by you can put another then by here if you want so it that uh, let's say uh, RAM so you can add uh, more more uh, than by if you want so now I'm gonna end the video see you and see you in the next video now it's time to start a discussion about binary search. But before you look at binary search, you're gonna first look at linear search to see why uh, binary search works better. So I'm gonna type a function here. I'm gonna type private fun. It's gonna be called search element. And here I'm gonna type search element. So this parameter is gonna be the element that we are searching for. And
end is going then another parameter is going to be a list of numbers so it's going to be a multiple list of ints and it's going to re return a number the search element or minus one if you don't find the search element and here we're going to loop through our list so i'm going to type for number in our list of numbers if at uh, a particular iteration our number it's equal to the search element that means that we found the element that we found the number so we're going to return number else if you come down here and uh, after we loop and uh, we did our if checks we didn't return the number that means we didn't find a number we're going to return minus one here now i'm going to add a print line here and i'm going to type uh, search element because this uh, is going to return an element and then we're going to output with the print line that in the console and I'm going to type here uh, 27 and for the next parameter I'm going to define a list of numbers so I'm going to type multiple list of and here I'm going to define a number from uh, 1 to 30 so I'm going to type here the numbers 1 and our last element 30 now, if you run this code, you're going to see in the output uh, 27. So we get, as expected, 27. But let's declare a variable here, i, to number the number of iteration it took, it took to find the element. So I'm going to assign 0 to it. I'm going to increment it every time we loop. So I'm going to type val, uh, I'm going to type i, sorry, plus plus. And uh, I'm gonna add a print line here, and I'm gonna it's gonna say search number colon dollar sign i. So now if you run this, you're gonna see how many iteration it took to find our element. And if you look at the console, as you can see, it took 27, uh, 27. Uh, iteration before we found our element because the way uh, the linear search it's working is it's going through all of the elements it's checking out each iteration if the number at that particular iteration is equal, is equal to the search element if not it's going to loop again and again and again until it reaches 27 then it found that element and it returns the element and you get that element output here in the console so this is what we call a linear search and this is not particularly good because imagine if you have 1 billion elements or 10 billion elements and you need to find, I don't know, maybe the 7th billion element in the in that array. That is going to be very hard and it's going to take uh, time and memory. And because of that, we have another uh, data structure for a uh, searching uh, elements and that is called binary search and i'm going to type the code for binary search here and also you're going to see the number of iteration it took to to find the element and also i'm going to explain how uh, binary search works so i'm going to delete this i'm going to type here var low i'm going to put equals to zero var high equals to numbers that size Minus one. I'm going to explain the code immediately. Here I'm going to type while low is less than or equal to high. Here I'm going to type val mid. So now I'm going to get the middle element. So I'm going to put parentheses low plus high divided by two. And that's going to give us the middle element 15. Then I'm going to type val comparison, so I'm going to type cmp equals to numbers that get the middle element compared to, I'm going to compare the middle element with the search element. Then I'm going to type here if Now I'm going to type if comparison is less than zero, then I'm going to type here low 
equals to mid plus one. Else if, if comparison is not less than zero, so it's greater than zero, we're gonna type here that low is equal to high, sorry, is equal to my, mid minus one. Else, we're gonna type here return numbers that get mid, and that is gonna give us the middle element. Now, if I declare here a variable var i, and if I assign zero to it, and if I increment that i at each iteration, and if I add a print line here, search number, dollar sign i. Now, if you run this, you're gonna see, uh, you're gonna, actually I should return minus one here, because uh, if at the end of our uh, looping and after we checked our uh, all of our list and we didn't find the number, then we return minus one, meaning that we didn't find the element. So now if you run this again, we get search number one, two, three, and then we get 27. And as you can see, this is significantly different from our uh, linear search because now we only took three search and then it found, uh, it found uh, our element. Previously, we had to search through all of our elements, uh, through our elements until uh, the number 27 to, to get the number seven. But now we only get uh, uh, three iteration and we get the number 27 and how is that possible? This is because now we're using what is called the binary search and how this binary search works. I'm going to explain it uh, now. So now let's see how the code works. So first we have a variable declared called low to which assign a value of zero. Then we have another variable called high to which assign numbers the size minus one. So we assign the size of the array to our high. Then we have a variable called i to which we assign zero. Then we have a while loop and we start looping by this condition while low is less than or equal to high. Then we increment our i to keep track of how many iteration it takes before we find our element and we out the, in the console search element and the number at that iteration. Then we have a variable called mid and this is gonna give us the middle element. And to get the middle element, we add the lower, lowest element plus the highest element. So we, get, we add here, 0 plus 30 divided by 2, which is 15. So this is the middle element. Then we declare another variable called comparison, and we type here uh, numbers that get the middle element, which is 15, compared to search element. And if the middle element is less than the search element, that means that the search element is on the right of the numbers which come after the 15. And because of that, this is gonna return because uh, our middle element is less than the search element is gonna return a negative number. So this is gonna be true. Comparison is gonna be less than zero. And then we're gonna assign low equals to mid plus on. So now the low uh, variable has the value 16, all right? Now it will loop again, it will, uh, it will uh, do, it will, have the i increment and it will uh, do the while loop, it will increment the i again and it will output i in the, i in the console. Now, here now the, it will calculate again the middle element and it will, it will uh, add now 16 plus 30 divided by 2 and that is gonna give gave us 23, all right? Now, that is the middle element now. And what we do now here is we again uh, we have our variable comparison and we get numbers that uh, get 23. So we get the 23 element and we compare with our search element, which is 27. And again, because our uh, middle element is less than the search element, this is going to return a negative number. So this if check is going to be true again. Now, what is going to gonna happen is that now low 
is going to be equal to mid plus 1. And the low previously was equal to 23. So now we're going to have 23 plus 1, which is 24. All right? Now, this will loop again. Will loop again. So as you can see, this basically breaks the the list in uh, half at each iteration. And now this will loop again, it will increment the i, it will output the i, and now it will, it will calculate again the middle element. Now the middle element is 24, and the high element is 30. And we have 24 plus 30 divided by 2, and that is 27, the exact uh, number that we are searching for. So this is how binary search works. It will compare the middle element with the search element, if the middle element is less than the search element, that means that your element is on the right side of the element which come after the middle element. So all the elements from the left are going to be excluded and it's going to search only on the, on the right side. Then it will split the list again in half. If uh, the middle element again is less than the search element, it will go to the uh, right again. It will split the list in half and it uh, uh, sooner or later it will find the element to uh, to, to, to the right or to the left. So this is how binary search works and it's very powerful because f for a uh, uh, very big uh, 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 list you can uh, use binary search and it's more effective than uh, the linear search. And uh, this is the code that I type but you don't, you don't need to use this code because uh, I only type this code to show you how the binary search works, but usually you use the binary search function provided by the collection. So you'll just type here return numbers. We're gonna put square brackets, and I'm gonna type binary. I'm gonna type here numbers again, binary dot binary search, because the binary search function provided by the collection only return the returns the index. So if I uh, uh, search for the 27 element, that is going to return the index 26. And the index 26, then it's going to be the number 27 from our numbers list. So now if you run this, you'll see 27 output it in the console. So we get 27. And uh, we did this only with one line of code. You can even uh, remove this and just have a single expression function. So we can put here equals. So just by that, it will do the same thing that we did previously with uh, all the code that I typed. So this is our discussion about binary search and see you in the next video. But before I end the video, I should say that binary search only works with the order collection of elements. So your elements need to be sorted in order to for the binary search to work. And uh, in our case, we look, we used uh, integer numbers and uh, it was uh, easy because we typed elements in a, in a sorted uh, order. But uh, if the elements are not sorted, binary, binary search is not going to work. Also, if you have your own class, so you have your own objects and you search with using binary search, uh, through a list for a, a specific element. In that case, your uh, class has to implement the comparable interface or it has to, to, to use the comparator interface. And I'm going to show you how to do that in the next video. So see you in the next video.